minutes to sit down so that you can start. <laughs> been advised that there is space in the gallery, especially those who will not be making any inputs. Um, can they assist us by moving up to the gallery? Uh, good morning to everybody in the room. Uh, this is a continuation of uh, last week's meeting, which could not proceed for reasons known to all of us. We would like to, to thank everybody who is here. We thank you for your patience and for your willingness to assist this process to get to the bottom of this saga. Uh, we take note of the recent developments regarding the re-arresting of Mr. Bester and his associates, but that does not discharge 
uh, our oversight responsibility as the committee. We still have to get to the bottom of this, what led to this uh, escape. Um, we need to, to ensure that uh, we have a report uh, to the House and also what needs to be done. We must have clear recommendations at the end of this process. We have set aside two days so that we can have sufficient time, but we will make an assessment tomorrow as to whether we still need more time or what will need to be done after tomorrow. Uh, we will make that assessment uh, tomorrow. Uh, today, we will start with G4S, who have been summoned in terms of Section 56A of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, read with Section 14, subsection 2A of the Powers, Privileges, and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislature Act number 44 of 2004. This follows their failure to avail themselves to appear before the committee on the 4th of April, 2023. The committee resolved to summon them to appear before, before it to make presentations on circumstances around Mr. Tabo Pesta's escape, answer questions in respect of the above, and to produce any records in their possession that may assist the committee in conducting its oversight in respect of A and B of the above. Please be aware to all the people who will be making um, presentations or answering questions, please be aware that failure to comply with the summons, especially to DCS, sorry, uh, G4S, is a criminal offense. In terms of Section 17 of the Act, any person who has been duly summoned and fails without sufficient cause to attend at a time and place uh, specified in the summons or to remain in attendance until excused from further attendance by the chairperson, or when called upon to do so, refuse to be sworn in or to make an affirmation as a witness or fail without sufficient cause to answer fully and satisfactorily all questions lawfully put to him or her, or fails to produce any document in his or her possession or custody, or under his or her control, which he or she has been uh, required to produce, commits an offense that may be punished by a fine or imprisonment after 12 months or both. Because GCS, you have been summoned in terms of Section uh, 14 of the Act, Powers and Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislature Act. Section 15 of the Act provides that prior to your examination or asking you to produce documents, the chairperson may call upon and cause an oath to be administered or accept from such a person who has been summoned in terms of Section 14 of the Act. I will now ask the legal advisor to, to administer the oath on G4S. Thank you, Chair. The chairperson has um, given a summary of the oath, however, I will repeat it. You have been summoned or invited subject to the provisions of Section 16 of the Powers, Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act, Act 44 of 2004, to appear before this committee to answer questions in respect of the committee's oversight meeting into the circumstances relating to the escape of Mr. Tabo Besta from the Mangaung Correctional Center and related matters. Please be informed that by law you are required to answer fully and satisfactorily all the questions lawfully put to you, or to produce any document that you are required to produce in connection with the subject matter of the inquiry, notwithstanding the fact that the answer or the document could incriminate you or expose you to a criminal or civil proceedings or damages. You are, however, protected in that evidence given under oath or affirmation before a House or committee may not be used against 
against you in any court or place outside Parliament, except in criminal proceedings concerning a charge of perjury or a charge relating to the evidence or documents required in these proceedings. Please be aware that in terms of Section 17.2 of the Powers, Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Prov Provincial Legislatures Act, a person who willfully furnishes a house or committee with information or makes a statement before it which is false or misleading commits an offence and is liable to a fine or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding two years. I'd like the gentlemen before the committee to please state their full name and designation for the record. This is for G4S. Good morning. My name is Jakobus Johannes Grunewald, and I'm the Regional Commercial Director for G4S Africa. Thank you, Mr. Grunewald. Good morning, Chair, as well as the Portfolio Committee members. My name is Joseph Ngabisile Munyante, and I'm the head of the Correctional Center at Mangawu. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, so, Chair. So, sorry, maybe before you proceed, I think it will be important that uh, witnesses uh, sit there. <laughs> I'm not sure whether those two gentlemen are aspiring witnesses. Uh, I think it's Mr. Krunevold. Yes. Mr. Krunevold. You can sit here because the presentation is with you. Two of, two of you, okay. And then the other person, the third one? At least the uh, third member of the chair is available to answer your questions. Okay. Mm. If you'd like to, I can present from the back. That's You are ready? I have to. Okay, please proceed. My name is Gert Cornelius Beileveld. I'm the Audit and Risk Director at Mangroom Correctional Facility. I will begin with you, Mr. Groenewoud. You are required to take an oath or affirm that the evidence you're about to give is truthful. You may choose to take the oath or affirmation. Which do you prefer? The oath, please. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear that the evidence I shall give. I swear that the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Witnesses sworn, duly sworn in chair. Mr. Munyante. 
You're required to take an oath or affirm that the evidence you're about to give is truthful. You may choose to take an oath or the affirmation. Which do you prefer? The oath. Can put your mic closer so that everybody can hear? The oath. The oath. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Switch on your mic. I swear that the evidence I shall give. I swear that the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. But the truth. So help me God. So help me God. The witness is so duly sworn in. Mr. Bailefeld, you're required to take an oath or affirm that the evidence you're about to give is truthful. You may choose to take the oath or the affirmation. Which do you prefer? The oath. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear that the evidence I shall give. I swear that the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. The witness is duly sworn in, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now give uh, this opportunity to G4S to make its presentations. Thank you, Honorable Chair. But before you proceed, we were expecting this presentation latest yesterday. Uh, up to now, we did not receive the presentation, which is unfortunate because we have to go through the presentation. We have to prepare. And you not giving us the presentation is making our, our work difficult. Uh, and I think it's common sense that uh, um, you, 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 you forward the presentation that you're going to make and give people sufficient time to go through the presentations. And in your correspondence uh, with us, you said that you would like to be someone's after Good Fridays because you, want, you wanted to prepare yourselves. And we thought that part of that pre uh, of preparation is to give us documents on time. That's correct, Chair. I apologize for us submitting the documents late. Uh, we finished our preparation only around midnight uh, last night. Um, we did arrive early this morning to, to try and submit the documents to the committee for, for consumption before this meeting, but we were unable to get the documents to the committee. So I apologize for that, Chair. Um, we, no, we don't really. It does affect uh, um, our oversight responsibility when we are not given time to to go through the documents uh, and prepare. And we're doing this work on behalf of the people of South Africa. So it's really unacceptable. Chair, I accept that. Um, our presentation, I believe, is is brief and concise and we will take the members through the presentation, I believe, within 40, 40 minutes. You can proceed. Thank you. Uh, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members of the Committee, good morning. My name is Kurbis Grunewout. I'm the Director of uh, G4S Care and Justice Services, and I'm also Director of, of BCC. Honourable Chair, before I move through the, to take the members through our presentation. Um, and before I give my colleagues an opportunity to, to introduce themselves formally, um, allow me to thank you for sending us the summons that we, that we asked for and making it possible for us to attend today. Chair, we have the greatest respect for, for this committee and, and for its work. And we sincerely regret the inconvenience that we caused last week and for, our, for us not being available uh, or possible to attend. Chair, had we attended last week, we would have been legally barred, I think for, for known reasons, from acting and participating fully and sharing all information available to us with this committee. Thanks to the summons, we are in that position today where we can participate fully and we can answer all questions that you have. And Chair, we have participated fully from the outset with all investigating authorities. Chair, with your indulgence, I'd like my um, two colleagues um, to present themselves to or introduce themselves to the committee this morning. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Chair, as well as to the Honorable uh, Portfolio Committee members. Like I said, my name is Joseph Mnyante. I'm the head of the Correctional Center at Mangawu. And my responsibilities are... C can you use your mic? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair, um, and good morning to the Honorable members in the committee. My name is Joseph Mnyante, the head of the Correctional Center at Mangawu. My responsibilities at the center is to uh, take care of the well-being of the inmates as well as the well-being of the employees that are employed in the center, um, and as well as taking care of the facility itself. And I've been serving in the corrections environment since uh, 1987. And then in 2000, I joined G4S as one of the unit managers. And then in 2014, I became the director appointed in that center. Thank you, Chair. Morning, Chair. Uh, my name is Gert Bielefeld. I've got 46 years correctional services experience, 24 years in corrections, currently 22 years with uh, uh, G4S. In my uh, time in uh, corrections, I served as the auditor for the Free State uh, Province uh, for a period of just over 10 years, and I'm currently in overseeing the contract at the centre as director, contract uh, director, audit and risks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Honourable Chair, honourable members of the committee, our presentation today is uh, split into a number of sections. Firstly, we have a section dealing with or providing background to the Mangaung Correctional Facility. We also have a section dealing with the events on the 3rd of May 2002, and I'll ask Mr. Monyanti to, to deal with those, with those slides. I'll then take over from Mr. Monyanti, and I'll deal with the three very distinct investigations that followed, conducted by various parties, including MCC. I'll deal with the assistance that MCC gave the various parties. Chair, I'll also make reference to the, um, the, the, the um, document that we received from DCC dated the, uh, the 28th of February 2023, and the notice rather, and then I'll make some conclusion sta concluding statements. That is the body of our, of our presentation today. So, Chair, with your permission, I'd like to call Mr. Munyanti uh, to the stand. Thank you, Chair. Um, like I said, my name is Joseph and the head of the Correctional Center. In that center, there's uh, 504 employees that has been appointed who are working in the center. Um, we, we are having an oversight uh, from the Judicial Inspectorate. Um, according to the annual report that we received, which was covering a period of 2021 and 2022, in this report, we have learned that uh, GIX has uh, evaluated and assessed uh, a number of correctional centers, 39 of them. And out of 39 correctional centers, seven of these correctional centers were rated to be the good ones. And out of the seven, one of them is Mangawung Correctional Center. And I also want to highlight, Chair, that um, in Mangawung Correctional Center, we do have a lot of independent, as well as continuous monitoring by statutory and contractual compliance by the DCS, which are represented by the controller as well as the deputy controller as well as the five staff members of the controller that are based on site on a daily basis. We also want to highlight that at this center we do have two officials from the judicial inspectorate that are visiting the correctional center. Both the deputy, I mean the controller as well as the judicial inspectorate officials they do have access to all the parts of the center. They do have access to all information that is applicable on the center or in the center. Like I've mentioned, we've got also the risk and the audit function at MCC, where the operations 
and, and independency of, the, of, of this audit, Mr. Beilegert, is also applicable to ensure that we do comply with the set contractual standards. And we have also learned on the media about the contrary information that the inmate we are avoiding or preventing the inmates to write. We want to assure the committee that we do allow inmates to write to whoever body that they are allowed to, to write to. And to assist the inmates, we give them what we call the prepaid envelope that they request and then they can write to anybody that they want to, to write to. These bodies will either include the, the Commission for the Human Rights, which is also visiting the centre. And I can also assure the committee, or, or I can also assure you, Chair, that when we do have what we call the family days, where we allow the family members uh, to have an interaction with the inmates, we also invite this body, the human rights representatives. We also invite the JICS uh, representatives to be with the families or to be with the inmates. If there are any concerns, um, then they can, the inmates can have platform or, or family members can have platform um, to raise these concerns. We are also having the visits from the high courts. And Chair, these visits from the high courts, the judges, is normally unannounced. And um, we have been receiving, uh, the last visit that we received, it was on the 12th October 2022. And I will also show you, uh, Chair, on the next slide, uh, one of the remarks that was made by one of the judges that visited the center. It was really, really positive. Also in 2019, the South African Human Rights Commission recognized Mangawung Correctional Center as the center of excellence in ensuring the human dignity of the inmates. The infrastructure talks, talks to this, where inmates can have access to all what they are supposed to have as the human beings. On the second bullet, I want to also present, Chair, that we've got the robust processes that are designed to prevent the escapes that might happen at MCC. In this regard, MCC has been of the most secure correctional centers in South Africa. Why I'm saying that? On the second sub-bullet, on bullet number two, is that on over 22 years period, there has been two escapes incidents from Mangaung. The second one, which includes this one of Tabo Bester. And then the other one is the inmate that escaped from the outside hospital when he went for medical attention. And then uh, the third sub-bullet, um, when we check information that is public uh, knowledge, is that DCS has reported 515 inmates escaped from South African correctional centers in the last 10 years. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And then these are the comments that I referred to, uh, which we received from the, the visit by the, the judges from the high courts. Um, I will really not be going through that, but these were really motivational and they were very impressive and this gave us courage to say whatever that we are doing in the center is still seem to be excellent despite the challenges that we are facing. And then the incident summary. Chair, on the 30th April, which is last year in 2022, we received an application from inmate Bester where he was requesting to be transferred to a single cell. Um, uh, in, in single cells, which we normally call Broadway, in one of the units at MCC. And uh, this request, uh, it was an own request. He was not sent there either for disciplinary hearing or whatever. And procedurally, such applications, we forward them to the office of the controller, uh, who is the representative of DCS, and it was indeed approved accordingly. Yes, so, sorry, sir. There is noise up there, and it's it's affecting uh, us down here. Please proceed. Okay, on the 30th April 2022, we received an application from uh, inmate Bester where he was applying um, to be kept in a single cell for his own safety, for his own safety of which we uh, handled accordingly, and it was approved by the DCS control on site, and inmate uh, Bester was placed in cell 35. And then on the 2nd May 2022, at half past seven in the evening, 
Uh, after we have done the roll count, because we are doing four, uh, four roll counts per day, the last one, which is half past seven in the evening, we can confirm that all the cells were locked for the night, as well as the cell of inmate Bester. Because the locking and the checking of the locking system, it is an, a standard operating procedure at MCC. At the same time, the security system technician, he went to the central control and then to check whether it's all electronic system operational, which he confirmed it to be operational and functioning. In the central control room, we do have two control officers or central control officers which were on duty and their function or their main function is to monitor camera footages, to open doors and to manage the system. The next day, which was the 3rd May 2022, at four o'clock, early hours of the morning, fire was discovered in cell, or fire was discovered from cell 35, and it was extinguished by the MCC trained personnel. After they have distinguished this fire, that cell was cordoned off. And then from there, what we have picked up is that MCC as well as DCS managed the, 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 the management they were called because procedurally, we need to report these things or whoever that is on duty during the night needs to report to the senior management of MCC as well as to the controller that is on site. 26 minutes after four o'clock, the nurse arrived and this nurse is working for a an independent contractor on site, which is called Lai Faranani, um, to, to come and, and, and see what best can they do there. And then three minutes before five o'clock, as we could pick up from the recordings, the DCS controller arrives. One minute past five, um, the MCC operations director arrived. 10 minutes later, doctor, who's also serving for uh, Lai Faranani, also arrived and he examined the body and then he certified inmate Bester to be dead. The next slide. On the 3rd May, 6 o'clock, early hours of the morning, we also picked up the, the arrival of the area commissioner um, as well as the duty director. Five minutes before 7 o'clock, the SAP has arrived and then half past 10 during the day, the SAPS forensic team arrives. The SAPS completed its examination and they took photos of the incident. The SAPS forensic team removes the body to the state mortuary for the post-mortem. Once the SAPS has completed its examination, they gave us a go ahead that we can either clean the cell or get the cell to be used again. And then after the body was removed, the MCC retrieved the deceased position for safekeeping in the administration uh, building stores. Among the items that were found, it was a laptop which was authorized, as well as the cell phone which was not authorized to be in the possession of the inmate. That morning, th that evening, half past seven, a final road check, when the, the final road check was done, we can confirm that all the 2,928 inmates they were accounted for. The next day, which was the 4th May 2022, um, we received a not notice of death for inmate Besta where um, the pathologist has certified the inmate, which we received from the Department of Health. On the same date, uh, Chairperson, MCC administration staff raises concerns um, for a smell that they picked up from the deceased position that was removed from the cell. And then the MCC operations director then informed the SAPS about this unusual smell that we picked up of a petrol from the from inmate Bester's uh, position uh, um, belongings. On the 5th May 2022, based on the MCC concerns, SAPS returns to MCC to inspect the deceased position as we have reported that we picked up a smell of an unusual smell. On the 6th May, the Department of Home Affairs then issued a death certificate for inmate Bester. Two days later, which was the 8th May, the SAPS forensics returns to MCC to collect the belongings recovered from th cell 35, including the laptop as well as the cell phone. 
And Chair, I will then hand over to uh, Mr. Khrunovot to continue with the presentation. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, Mr. Munyanti has taken the committee through uh, some background regarding Mangong Correctional Centre, which has been in operation now for almost 22 years, uh, and has also taken you through the events of the 3rd of May 2022 and the days immediately thereafter. I'd now like to turn to the three very separate investigations that followed the incident of the 3rd of May. There was a, a criminal investigation launched by the South African Police Services. I think it's important to point out that in the early days, this investigation took the form of a, of a suicide. And then from the 25th of May last year, the police changed this uh, into a murder investigation. There was also an independent investigation into the unnatural cause. This is a standard procedure conducted by, by JIX. And then we as MCC conducted the third and very independent investigation, which is a, a compliance investigation. And our compliance investigation commenced on that morning of the 3rd of, of May last year. Turning to the, the first investigation, the SAPS criminal investigation, Honourable Chair, I'd like to say from the outset that MCC cooperated fully with the SAPS um, fr from the word go. On the 3rd of May, as you heard, SAPS attended the scene to investigate what was then assumed to be a suicide. It was MCC who called the, the SAPS and made them aware of a chemical smell, a petrol smell, coming from the personal belongings of inmate Bester that had been moved, as you heard, for safekeeping to the administrative block. This was done on the 4th of May. We also assisted SAPS on the 17th of May. Um, what we requested, rather, on the 17th of May from SAPS in writing a copy of the post-mortem report. This was never provided to us, and, and that request was, was declined. Yeah. On the 25th of May, SAPS informed us that they have now officially converted the investigation uh, from a suicide into a homicide, or rather into a murder following the state autopsy report. On the 2nd of June 2022, we provided SAPS with additional information that they had cr created. And on the 14th of January 2023, this year, Honourable Chair, we understand that SAPS opened an investigation into an escape. It's important to note that prior to this date, we received no formal communication from SAPS that they had now trans, uh, moved to, a, um, to an investigation into escape. This formed part of the, the SAPS documents that were produced for purposes of this committee on the 4th of April 2023. Moving to the second investigation, this is the independent in investigation into uh, the unnatural death. Uh, again, uh, Honourable Chair, I'd like to say that MCC uh, cooperated with JIX uh, throughout the process. We notified JIX on the 9th of May 2002 of the death. On, Thursd on the 3rd of August, we pr produced uh, to JIX our prelim preliminary investigation report into the matter. On the 19th of October, we shared with JIX available video footage. Um, and on the 2nd of February this year, we provided to JIX a final investigation report, the MCC final investigation report. This report was handed over during a meeting between MCC and, and JIX. And Honourable Chairs, at this meeting that we, MCC, was informed of a suspicion around the escape of inmate Bester. This is also the meeting at which MCC was shown the, the DNA report for the first time. 
Moving to the third investigation uh, conducted by MCC, and as I, as I said, uh, Honourable Chair, we commenced this investigation on the 3rd of May 2002. I want to point out that we do not, as MCC, have the authority nor the skills to conduct a criminal or a forensic investigation. This is the purview of, of um, the other parties uh, represented in the room today. We started this investigation, as I said, on the 3rd of May 2002. This was initiated by G4S Care and Justice Services. And as I said, this is a compliance investigation. We had to analyze the actions of our, of our staff, of our staff, leading up to the events of the 3rd of May, uh, through that night and in the days that followed. And we had to ensure and test our actions against the Correctional Services Act, our obligations in terms of that act, in terms of the contract that we have with BCC, and BCC in turn has with the Department of Correctional Services. And thirdly, we had to check the conduct against the very stringent policies and procedures that we have governing the, the management of the correctional facility. <coughs> Consistent with best practice, the Audit and Risk Director, Mr. Bailefeld, who is independent of the Centre Director, Mr. Monyante, was assigned by us to lead the investigation. In conducting the investigation, we included interviews with staff members, and we considered, risk regi considered registers, documents, and CCTV footage. DCS, through the members present on a daily basis at the, at, at the um, correctional center, had full access to this evidence. And as you heard earlier on, we also shared this evidence with the South African Police Service. Evidence and reports, as you heard, were also shared with chicks. <coughs> Honorable Chair, we made a number of notable findings uh, through our investigation. The first finding was that the CCTV system was fully operational, except for the cameras covering the Broadway unit where inmate Bester was held and the administrative building. The video cameras for these two buildings function off the same power circuit. And it came to our attention that power to that circuit had failed during the period 1938 on the evening of 2 May and 04 1100 hours on the morning of, of 3 May. Other than this failure, there were no other power interruptions uh, recorded at MCC during this time. Two central control room officials failed to uh, follow clearly established MCC policies and procedures, and they did not monitor or report events in a timely mat mat manner. That was another notable finding. A further notable finding was that the on-site night duty su supervisor who was on duty from the evening of the 2nd of May to the morning of the 3rd of May, also failed to follow clear and well-established MCC policies and procedures. This person failed to complete his inspection rounds according to policy. This individual failed to attend to incidents on time. This, in, this individual directed staff to insignificant tasks. He ignored a call to attend a, a report of smoke in Broadway, cell 35, where inmate Bester was housed. And he failed to properly account for his movements and actions on the night of 2 May and the morning of 3 May. The last notable finding that we made, Honorable Chair, was that there is video footage, distant video footage, of two individuals running towards the administrative building in the early hours of that morning. The footage is distant because the cameras that I believe were better placed to record that movement were near the administrative building and the Broadway unit, and they were not working. 
we were unable to identify whether these two individuals are G4S staff members, Mongong uh, prison officials, or whether they were inmates. We were unable to, to achieve, to, to de determine that. Uh, honourable committee members, we shared uh, information as it became available to us. Video footage and information was shared with the DCS, SAPS and JICS. And this information was shared from as early as May, as May 2022 through to October 2022 to support them in their various investigations. I highlighted earlier on that there were a number of concurrent investigations running. Following the MCC investigation, we took, three, we took three actions. Three employees were suspended shortly after the incident. I believe the first suspension was as early as the 6th of May, and ultimately led to the dismissal of Mr. Senoi Motswara on the 29th of September 2022. Mr. Motswara was the the on-site night duty supervisor on the evening of the 2nd of May, morning of the 3rd of May, on that, that night shift. He was also arrested last week by, by the SAPs. We also reinforced controls, this is physical access controls to the, di to the digital video recorder room where the recordings of these various cameras um, was to have been uh, um, collated. And we will be in improving the latest smart lock technology to act to, to control, monitor, and audit access to this room. In addition, we've installed tamper-proof cameras following this event. Honorable Chair, I'd now like to move to the cooperation that MCC provided to to SAPS, followed by JICS, and then finally the, the, the DCS um, in, in that order. On the 3rd of May, MCC, upon discovering the fire uh, and what then appeared to be uh, an attempted suicide, we called SAPS to the scene immediately. They arrived just before 7 o'clock in the morning. The forensic team from SAPS arrived around 10.30. SAPS took control of the scene. They completed their investigation. They took the necessary photographs. And once they, were, once they had completed their investigation, they handed the cell back to us. SAPS gave no indication on that morning that anything other than a suicide appeared to be at play. As I mentioned before, the next morning on the 4th of May, staff in our administrative block noticed a smell of petrol, some accelerant coming from the personal belongings of inmate Bester that had been, been placed in that, in that block for safekeeping to later be, be handed to his next of kin. And we immediately advised SAPS of this issue. They attended the MCC uh, through, via their forensic unit the next day on the 5th, and they concurred with us that there was traces of an accelerant present. On the 8th of May, SAPS returned to MCC, and they collected all the deceased possessions, and they also again confirmed the, the presence of this accelerant. On the 9th of May, our MCC administrative staff handed to SAPS the state mortuary notification of death form that was dated the 6th of May, 2022. Honorable members, on the 22nd of June, uh, upon a formal request by SAPS, we provided the following information uh, to them. Firstly, particulars and the duty list of all members who were on duty from 7.30 the evening of 2 May until 7.30 on the morning of the 3rd of May. We provided to them all available footage. 
we provided to them records of all visits to inmate Bester. We also provided details of inmate Bester's belongings that we handed over to the next of kin. Details of the individuals who reported inmate Bester's death to the next of kin was also handed over to the, to, to the SAPs. And finally, we gave them the MCC incident report of what transpired between 2 May and 3 May. We, we gave our cooperation to JICS uh, in the following manner. On the 9th of May 2022, we sent to the inspecting judge a notification of death form uh, to the office of the inspecting judge. On the 3rd of August, we shared with JICS the preliminary investigation report and supporting documentation. On the 19th of October, available footage was also shared with JICS. Then there was the meeting of the 2nd of February 2023 that I referred to earlier. This was the meeting between MCC and JICS at which JICS mentioned to MCC that they have suspicions that inmate Bester had escaped. JICS also at this meeting showed us a copy of the post-mortem report and the DNA analysis. This is the DNA analysis report that was issued on the 1st of July 2022. We were given access to that report on the 2nd of February 2023. And then at this, at this meeting, we also shared with JICS our final investigation report. On the 7th of February, there was a follow-up meeting between MCC and JICS at the Bloemfontein offices at JICS at which the SAPS was not, was not present. And then on the 8th of March, we received the JICS interim report. Lastly, honorable committee members, uh, cooperation with, with the DCS. And, and a reminder here that, that there is permanently stationed at the Mangong Correctional Facility <coughs> a controller, a deputy controller, and five DCS staff members. We informed the DCS of the fire just after five minutes past four in the morning. As I mentioned before, the DCS controller arrived at 0457, and the, the area commissioner arrived at six o'clock in the morning. We handled the incident, and we reported the incident in accordance with contractually stipulated procedures. Relevant documentation was completed in terms of legislation and contractual requirements. Two days later, on the 5th of May, all additional documents requested by the DCS controller were provided to the controller by MCC. And in the months that followed, there was regular interaction between DCS via the controller and MCC. And this culminated in MCC delivering its final investigation report to the DCS on the 30th of March. Honorable Chair, uh, allow me just to speak on the, on the observation notice that we received from the DCS on the 28th of February of this year before I, before I conclude. And maybe just for the benefit of everyone, an observation notice is the official process through which the DCS escalates any perceived incidence of non-compliance to MCC. The observation notice that we received stated that 10 months prior to the date of the observation notice, a vehicle had passed through the Sally Port, which is a vehicle gate that you pass from outside the secure part of the facility to the secure part of the facility without a gate pass. This incident happened on the 29th of April, 2022. As I mentioned, we received the notification from the DCS on the 28th of February, 2022. This observation notice was based by the DCS on a sworn affidavit it had received from a G4S staff member uh, around 
I believe it was mid-November of 2022. We immediately launched an investigation into the events cited in this observation notice. As I said, we were only made aware of this observation notice recently, and for that reason our investigation is still ongoing. And we will provide our response and our conclusions from our investigation to the DCS within the time frames agreed with the DCS. Honourable Chair, I, I draw attention to this observation notice simply because the date of the incident is the, sec is the 29th of February 2022, which predates uh, the, uh, the, the fire at Mangong Correctional Centre by a few days. Honourable Chair, um, allow me to conclude. MCC immediately notified the SAPS on the 4th of May 2022 regarding concerns relating to the petrol smell. This is something of concern to us. We felt that this is not something normally associated with the suicide and we immediately drew the attention of SAPS to this fact. From the outset and throughout, MCC and G4S have cooperated fully with the authorities. M uh, MCC and G4S also ensured that the authorities had full access to information. G4S acted immediately to investigate the incident. As I mentioned before, our investigation started on the morning of the incident, 3rd of May 2022, and we moved quickly to suspend the employees who had not followed our very clear policies and procedures. And the first suspension started three days, uh, correction, on, on the 6th of June, 2022. On that same day, we notified the DCS of the, the suspension. We also notified JICS of the suspension on the 3rd of August, 2022. Neither G4S nor MCC have made any findings or statements regarding the identity of the body as this is the sole responsibility of the authorities. On the 2nd of February, 2023, G4S was, form, was informed by Jix of a possible escape. And as I mentioned, this was the first time that we were shown the DNA report, a report that was dated mid-2022. G4S and MCC welcome the opportunity to present to this committee today. Honourable Chair, without a summons, as I mentioned at the start, we would have broken the law by sharing this information with you today. As uh, Mr. Munyanti said during his pre presentation, MCC has been one of the most secure correctional centres in South Africa over the past 20, 20, 22 years. 1st of July this year is the 22nd anniversary of the facility. It continues to be a well-run correctional centre, as is reflected in the JICS reports and the other reports that have flowed from oversight entities. It operates under the daily uh, control, I don't want to say control, but the daily presence of DCS and JICS officials present at the facility. Lastly, I'd like to say, Honourable Chair and Honourable Committee Members, we take this opportunity to express our deepest sympathy with the victims of Tabu Besta and with their families. Honourable Chair, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentations. Uh, Honourable Members, as we have agreed, we are going to give each member 30 minutes to interact with the presentations. Uh, if you have not concluded within 30 minutes um, and one member of your party still has time for you, that can be credited to your time. Um, can I note the following members, Honorable Ramulubin, Honorable uh, okay. Two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, in that order. Or eight. <laughs> no. <laughs> he comes. When he comes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Honorable Ramulu Beng, 30 minutes. Thanks, Chair. Uh, good morning to colleagues present, honorable members. And we let me also welcome the G4S, um, who would have expected them in the last meeting uh, without forcing them to be here. Chair, I, I understand um, when they made a presentation, they make an indication that um, they would have acted against the law for sharing this information that we've been presented with right now. So they needed to be someone so that they are protected or given immunity of that information. Uh, I don't quite agree with that. You needed the immunity for something else, not for sharing the information that you just did. The information that you have given us, actually it's public knowledge by now. We did an unannounced visit last week. All that you have given us, we have gotten it at that unannounced visit. In actual fact, some of the things that you would have spoken to, they contradict one another. The times don't speak to each other. For me, it's pure lie. And I, we have a legal rep here whom there are consequences for lying to us. Chair, the report for me is a whitewash. It's, they exonerate themselves, G4S, in this report. There are a number of standard operational procedures that the center must do that were not followed, hence led to the escape. There are a number of security lapses in the process that are glaring and uncounted for in the report given to us. There seem to be no management oversight on the whole operations of the center because of the report does not speak. Since the process, the, the, the escape or the attempts or all those things, what is the, that the management has done? And what has been the oversight of that management throughout the process? For me, he keeps on saying we've done a lot. We've provided authorities with information we've given. There's no accountability to say here we've had. Here it's our mistake that led to this. Um, so hence I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm actually becoming. Honorable Ramulu Beng, sorry to interrupt. Uh, maybe you should ask questions and make observations when you are done with questions. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to put it there so that when I raise questions, they are able to, to be backed up where they're coming from. Because if I don't want to make this baseless um, remarks that are not informed by questions. And I, I'm saying this because, Chair, <clears throat> I went to, 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 to Mangawung. And the good part of it is that that was my second visit to the center. And the center manager took us through on an official oversight. I know your bed space of 2928. Um, <clears throat> when we were there, Chair, there was also an indication that there were three escapes that they were mentioned when we asked if previously had the center had any escapes. Outside the Bester issue, there was an issue mentioned that there were three escapes. And then one was the one that was never traced or brought back. My question is, um, what, who are those people that have escaped? Because of it seems there is a trend of escapes, including the one currently in December um, of someone that escaped from the hospital um, who was then brought back. My reasoning for this is that it might be that the best issue would have gone out of hand because of it's a high profile case. And then there's other ones because of they're not high profile. We never um, got to know about them. Were these escapes outside Bester um, reported, especially to the DCS or to the DCS controller who is based in Mangawu? That's my first question, Chair. 
Thank you. Answer? Uh, Honourable Chair, I'll ask Mr. Beiderfeld to, to provide the Honourable Member with, with details. Uh, there was an escape in 2003. Then there was the inmate best, uh, what we now to be, know to be an inmate best escape in May 2022. And then there was also an incident from a health facility where a inmate was temporarily held for medical care in December 2022. But uh, Mr. Beilefeld can give the Honourable Member further details. Thank you, Honourable Member. I can just report that these, as requested, was reported to the Central Services Controller on site. It was investigated. The case of 2003, um, we were found guilty by the Supervisory Committee and a fine was posted on the contractor for that incident. And the other two incidents are currently still, still pending. The one of the escape from the uh, hospital outside and then the best one that came on the uh, record now. Was the DCS controller based in Mangaung informed or the DCS in total of the two escapes? The DCS controller was informed because he is the representative of the National Commis Commissioner at the Centre, Honourable Member. Thank you. Chair, they make mention that the fire broke at 4 o'clock in the morning. And based on our visit when we went there and the footage that we saw, it says the fire broke at 2.30 a.m. And then 2.59, it was reported that the fire broke. Which is which? Four o'clock, that gets to be reported. The CCTV footage that we have seen with honorable members that were present on the site on the day says 2.30, the fire broke. 2.59, it was reported. And 2.30 exactly, the two gentlemen uh, who you spoke of were seen running towards that main block. So how do two people run when the fire, it shows on the CCTV that it has broke, but it gets to be reported at four o'clock. Which one is it? Thanks, Chair. Honourable Member, if I can answer you to that, there was two reports that night, a report at three o'clock um, that reported uh, there was a fire. It was investigated by the uh, supervisor, Senoy. Uh, it formed part of the reason why he was suspended and uh, found guilty and dismissed as he did not investigate uh, that properly. The reason why the four o'clock is, is the, this is when the official incident happened, what uh, led to the investigation. So uh, that's why uh, there is four o'clock on the document. There was an incident of three o'clock, I confirm that. And uh, it's in the same time that the two officials that we referred to, or two persons, was viewed on the camera for a few seconds on the video footage that was shown to the committee. Why are you telling us that 2.30, 2.59 the fire broke? It was then reported at four o'clock. Why are you giving us four o'clock at the fire broke? Because that's the official time that the fire broke, your honourable member, that, that led to not, the incident. That is not. The, f the CCTV footage says 2.59, it was reported from your controller room. 2.30, fire broke. You are saying here 4 o'clock fire broke. Why are you not saying to, to us that at 4 o'clock in terms of your documentation and your administrational processes, that's when it was recorded? You are confirming that three o'clock indeed it broke, but you are writing to us here in black and white that it's four o'clock. Honourable Member, I can only uh, ask, uh, say, uh, I'm sorry that uh, that uh, three o'clock is not included in the document that was, however, included in our investigation. It was looked at and, as I've uh, indicated, that gave the reasons why we acted against the employees. Okay, what happened to the two guys that were running across the building at 259 who were spotted? Where do you assume they ended up? And what, what, what happened afterwards? Did you try to, to trace them and see who are those possible two people? And can you, not in essence assuring us, give an indication that perhaps one of them might have been Bester running across? Honorable Member, I cannot conclude that one of them was not Bester. It was indicated that it was impossible as a result of the video footage that only showed that few seconds to determine who the two people was. The video footage is very blurry and for a few seconds, and that's why we indicated that it's unknown, and we've reported that to SAPS to include in the investigation um, that has been reported to them. 
There were two controllers, operators who were controlling the control room on the night of the fire or on the night of the incident. Um, what happened to them? What was happening to them when the fire broke? Because of that, the ones who were controlling the whole center. Honorable member, they were both investigated, found to be not in line with policies and procedures. Both of them were suspended and then afterwards dismissed. Uh, so they're not in the employ of the company anymore. When was this? The dismissal, the investigation, when did they start? The investigation start on the 3rd of May. The suspension start on the, on the 6th of June. And um, the one was dismissed on the 6th of uh, December and the other one on the 31st of January 2023. So the investigation started on the 3rd and, and 6th of May. Am I correct? The investigation started with affidavits ta being taken on the 3rd of May already, at the day of the incident. Yes, Honorable. And then the first suspension was when? 6th of June. The six of, so when you started investigation, 6th of June, also getting the, the autopsy report from SAPS, you had an indication, you, you might have been aware that this was an escape. In actual fact, the body that bent in the cell was not entirely of Bester. Honourable Member, I can confirm that we never received the autopsy report. Uh, the first time we received it was with a meeting with Chicks, as indicated in the presentation by my colleague. Okay. Um, I want to ask this. Based on your contract with TCS or with the state, are you are you not in breach of it, especially with this escapes? Or in somehow holding the information? Because from my from my records and the unannounced visit we did, from these investigations that you have carried out or you have done, they make a recollection that says around June, when you started dismissing or suspending employees or officials that they're working on the said day, you had an idea that this was an escape and you did not even inform authorities or the DCS in that matter. So hence you would have seeked, you wanted to be summoned to this meeting so that you are protected with what you are going to say here so that it's not used against you outside. Are you, are you, is this why you wanted to be summoned in this meeting? Not the legal issue of being on the, uh, don't bring that rhetoric, please. Honorable Chair, we were, we did not want to be summoned to seek immunity for fear of, of what we will what we will say to, to this committee. In terms of the directional the, the um, Correctional Services Act and in terms of the contract that we have with BCC and the contract BCC in turn has with the Department of Correctional Services, we are legally restricted from talking to any third party regarding the operations of the Mangong facility. All information that we have regarding that facility has to go to the outside world, for lack of a better word, through the DCS. And that is the sole reason why we sought a summons, because the summons allows us to to, to, to say to this committee what we cannot say to anyone other but the DCS. We did not seek immunity for fear of saying something today that would incriminate ourselves. Okay, can I put it this blindly? Do you agree this is a breach of contract between the two, between DCS and G4S, with this escapes? Honourable Member, I, I don't know if it's a breach or not. I think one will need to look at the, at the contract. I, I think it's clear, as Mr. Uh, Bailefeld has said, or Mr. Munyante has said, that in 22 years of operations, we have had three incidences of escape. Now, no incidents of escape should be condoned. These are serious matters. Chair? But, He's not answering me. I'll pass on that, because this is a breach. Uh, how you put it in jargons, it's still a breach of contract between G4S and DCS. Um, 
The night that the night that Tabo Bester applied for isolation for his own safety. That's what we're told. That he applied for his own safety on the basis that he feared that he did not pay for the protection fee on whatever, then he needed to be taken away um, to isolation, which in terms of segregation. This was done on the 15th of April, 2022, two weeks before, um, uh, what do you call it, the actual day of the fire. He was in South 16th Street, two walls unit, um, before he moved to segregation. Um, and upon moving to segregation, whilst his paperwork was still pending approval for, to guarantee him to be in segregation, he was automatically moved to South 35. And when he was taken to South 35, there was an inmate already in that South 35 who was moved for Tabo to be taken in. Who was in charge of that process of approval? And why did we move Bester to 35 whilst he was supposed to be at holding cells, waiting approval to be taken in? Who, appro who, who deals with that approval? Honourable and why did we take that decision of taking him pending the approval? Honourable Member, I'll ask Mr. Bainefelt to, to answer that question in terms of the, the process that was applied. I just want to correct one date that you mentioned. Inmate Bester applied to be moved to Broadway on the 30th of April and, and not, as you suggested, on the 15th of April. Then it means you, you, you officials of GFS, G4S and management are not speaking. Mr. Dondolo, who took us to an unannounced visit last week on Wednesday, where in Bloemfontein in Mangawu, indicated that Tabo Bester applied on the 15th of April. But he, he was moved to isolation and we were taken through that process. You see, I speak on authority because of hours there. I'm able to detect, and, and whilst I was we were there, I was taking notes. I normally use my phone for taking notes. So, Mr. Ndondolo, it's unfortunate you did not bring him here. And we did ask him last week that would like G4S to bring Dondolo here so that what we say here and what he would have said to us there, they're able to tolerate. He makes mention, my colleagues are with me here, that 15th of April, Tabo Bester applied for isolation in fear of his life. Apologies, uh, Honourable mem Member. I thought that you mentioned that on 15th of April, Mr. Bester was moved to Broadway. So my apologies for that. You were referring to the date he was he applied to be moved. Yes, he applied on the 15th, even pending when you were, even when you moved him to segregation. His 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 papers were pending approval. He was not approved, okay. but he was moved already. Okay. Why was he put in isolation while his papers were pending approval? Okay, I will who authorised for that? Okay, I will hand over to Mr. Mr. Baderfeld, who can can give you all the information. Honourable Member, I can possibly um, give a little bit of light on that. There was two times that uh, Mr. Bester requested to be removed uh, to Broadway segregation. The first time was on 15th of April, as mentioned by you correctly. But after two days, he cancelled his uh, own uh, safety application and went back to the unit. And then on the 30th, he applied again to go back to Broadway. Was this planned? Because of, from a sense we got when we got there is that normally cell 35 is not being used because of it's in the blind spot. Cameras or the video footage do not cover. So in any case, we even did that walk. You can come into isolation, walk, take the stairs to cell 35, and the camera will not capture you because of it's in the blind spot. Even when you go out, only a person that knows that that is cell 35 will be able to identify it on the CCTV. Who authorized for him to be put in that blind spot? And why did an inmate that was in there removed for him to go in? Wouldn't it was possible for him to be allocated in a cell that was empty? Because already Don Dollar made an indication that there was an inmate in 35, meaning they took that inmate to another cell to put Tabo Bester. So there was an orchestration of a plan for him to escape. Honourable Member, Mr. Beiderfeld can, can, can answer your question, but 
I want to state that there was a, uh, an inmate in cell 35 on the morning of the 2nd of May. That inmate applied to be sent back to, to the normal part, uh, the multi-accommodation um, part of the prison. That inmate applied on that day, and according with his wishes, he was reallocated. That inmate was not moved to make, uh, to, to accommodate inmate Bester in that area or in that cell. That, that, in, that cell happened to become available on that day. So you're saying the cell was empty when Bester was moved in? An inmate was moved, to my knowledge, from that cell. I'm saying, was the cell empty when Bester was moved in? Yes. So there was no one. The person that had applied to be moved was already moved. Yes. Honorable. This contradict what your officials were saying. A person was moved on the actual day that Bester was brought in. So what we are saying, it's a total contradiction. I, no, it's not a contradiction, uh, honourable member. The question was, was the cell empty when inmate Bester was moved into the cell. And I can confirm it is because it's a single cell. Only one inmate can be housed there. What I added, honorable member, is that that morning, the person who was in that cell on the night of the 1st of May into the 2nd of May applied to be moved back, out, to, move, to be moved out of Broadway. That inmate was moved. And that made cell 35 temporarily vacant on the day of the 22nd. The day that Bester was moved in? Yes. Coincidentally? I, I cannot comment on, on the coincidence. Um, no, it's fine. Member. Chair, we, we equally find out that um, the server or the switchboard for cameras, which you are able to tamper with, switch off and switch on, the report makes an indication from that um, 1939, the camera or CCTV footage ceased to operate. And they resumed operating at four, 10 past four in the morning. The incident started to happen at 2.30, uh, subsequently to 2.59 or 2.3 uh, two, o'clock in the morning. It was not captured because of the system was not working. Whilst we were there, there was an official from Intergriton who operates your machines, was able to take us through that you are able to tamper with the system not to work. You are able to tamper with the system not to work. And in that sense, for the unit where Bester was in isolation and you can tamper with it, there is, there is where that controller is there. And there was a person, uh, when you read reports, that was asked by officials to switch off. From your view, from your point of view as G4S, after conducting the investigation, can you say that that system was tempered with for us to be able to lose 19.38 p.m. up until 10 past 4 early in the morning, for us not to have a footage at all? Honourable Member, um, on that question, I can only indicate that we're not um, technology specialists. Therefore, we requested Integritron to give us a proper report. That's the people that's responsible for the system. In according to the report that they gave us, there was a power failure due to the batteries of the UPS system that was not functional properly. Um, and if somebody... Um, uh, they tempered with that, um, that they couldn't uh, uh, supply us with, so we had to work with the document that was submitted by the specialists on this. Chair, there was an inmate that wrote a letter to the president and the minister um, seeking audience on the event of the escape in detail. And we have an email coming from G4S officials that it makes an indication that that letter must not be entertained. In essence, no complaint must be, must be entertained to, to official. Why was the letter of that inmate held? Mm -hmm. And this inmate, I don't want to mention the, the inmate's name. Why was it held and where is the inmate? Honorable member, maybe I can uh, respond to that question. If one reads on that email um, that was sent regarding this letter, the lady who has responded to that, she was redirecting that complaint to say, 
If that is the complaint, the inmate needs to use the prepaid envelope system to can send that complaint to the relevant party. She was not necessarily saying that letter must not go out. Thank you, Honorable Mayor. Why didn't she reroute that letter, seeing that the inmate did not use those prescribed standards for, for him to send that letter? Because of that letter contains, it's, a, it's, a, it's someone who's willing to come forth with evidence that this is not um, suicide or anything, it's an escape. Why did we hold the letter? Because of whoever has seen that letter, obviously has read the contents. Why did we keep it? Honourable Member, according to what we have learned regarding this letter, the letter had uh, nothing to do with this matter of uh, Bester. The content of the letter, according to uh, the information we received, it was an inmate who was requesting to be provided with the footage of the use of planned force that was applied on him. And then that request was denied. But the sending of the letter was redirected to say, don't use the means that you are using. Rather, use your prepaid envelope, which will be administered <coughs> at the inmate information system office. That will then be sent to the relevant office. When did you learn of the escape? Honorable member, you have five minutes. When did you learn of the escape? When did you realize this was actually an escape? Honorable member, during the JICS meeting that I referred to on the 2nd of February of this year, JICS mentioned to us that they suspect that uh, inmate Pesta had, had escaped. And it's only in reading the, the SAPS papers prepared for purposes of this committee uh, dated the 4th of April, it's only in those papers that we saw that SAPS had I believe on the 14th of January, my date might be wrong, but it was somewhere mid-January, opened a case of escape relating to inmate Bester. Why are we not making sure that all the units are covered with CCTVs and video? Why did we leave the cell 35 in the blind spot and we left it at that, especially the cells at the back? Honourable member, just to can respond on that, according to um, our knowledge, uh, the design of the prison, is it, it, it has been um, designed and specified like that from the inception before it was even built. Thank you. I'll take my colleagues' time, Chair. I'll rephrase my questions. Um, whoever from my colleagues who did not finish, I'll come in. Thank you. I'm trying to reroute my questions correctly now, which ones they've answered so that I come back with the follow-ups. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable I will leave her some, some time so that she can get that back when I speak. Okay. You have been credited with some time by <laughs> Honorable Janche, but Thank second you. round. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, Chair, I would plead with G4S not to answer my questions with apologies, because I won't, I won't forgive them. One, Every report points out that the incident broke out at 3 a.m. You come here, you speak about 4 a.m. How would you react to a statement that says, you are a private company in private public partnership with the state that is dishonest, that came and deliberately misled the people's parliament? What would be your reaction to that? Honourable Chair, uh, committee member, I would disagree with that, with that statement. We have tabled to the committee all the facts available to us. I can ask Mr. Bailefeld to, to fill you in on the events of the fire because he investigated this. He is much better briefed than what I am. But what I can say to you is when there were reports of smoke, they were ignored. And to our knowledge, the fire was detected at 4 o'clock that, that morning. The individuals who were manning the So you still room, maintain that fire was detected at 4 o'clock? There was smoke detected at 3 o'clock. That was not 
So Basically. fire started at half past two, but your smoke detectors detect that fire at 4 a.m. Is that what you're saying? Honourable Member, I have no knowledge and I don't know what the source is that suggests that the fire started and the fire is an emergency. So whatever system you put as an emergency system reports an emergency immediately. So you say fire breaks out at half past 2 a.m. but your detector has detected at 4 a.m. Is that honesty? Is that the kind of honesty you want to bring to this parliament and the people of South Africa? Honourable Member, as I, as I said before, I have no knowledge and I have no proof that the fire started at 2.30. Okay, fine. Was Bester moved to cell 35 on the 28th of April or on the 30th? Uh, he was, well, I'll get Mr. Bailefeld to answer that question. He was moved on the 30th, um, Honourable Member. Okay, not a problem. The incident happens at uh, 3 a.m. Reported to police at 11 minutes past 6 a.m. What were you doing with the cops, with these cops in between this time? Are you a forensic pathologist? Honorable member, the, and again, Mr. Bailefeld can take you through the events of that morning, but yeah. allow me to say that our first response was to extinguish the fire. Once the fire had been ex extinguished and the door had to be opened to extinguish the fire fully, the cell was cordoned off and no one entered that cell, to my knowledge, other than the nurse and the doctor who had to attend to the person until the police arrived. The scene, to my knowledge, was not contaminated until the police arrived. But I can say to you the police were called. So you mean you have no obligation of reporting to police a life-threatening emergency while it still happens? You wait until it, uh, it comes down, then you can report it. Is that what you are saying on record? N not at all. The, the fire was detected. The fire personnel were immediately dispatched to the cell and the fire was put out. That was our immediate emergency, was to put the fire out. The second emergency was, it was to attend to the person in that cell. That was the second emergency. What were you doing? What do you mean attend? To see whether the person was still alive and could be saved. Those two matters, in our view, took precedence. And only then was it important to call the police services. And perhaps Mr. Bailefeld can confirm whether some of these actions took, you know, took place concurrently. But, but honorable member, our first priority was to put out the fire for fear that it could spread. And the second priority was to attend to the person in that, in that cell. Sorry, um, honorable um, Ola. I think you raise an important point and I don't want us to pass without clarity on that particular point. Honorable Ngola says uh, the fire broke out at half past two and your system by four o'clock had not picked up yes. that. Would you say, would you to conclude that that would be at least a gross incompetency? Uh, Honorable Chair, I'll ask Mr. Monyanti to answer that question and, and perhaps he should start by informing the committee of the fire system, if any, that we have in the facility. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Member, um, I would like to highlight that in the whole entire center, we don't have any smoke detectors. We are heavily relying on the human beings when they pick up unusual behaviors to can report. Thank you. So what does he mean when he say the smoke was detected at 4 a.m. if you have no smoke detectors? Honorable member, what we are trying to say is based on the video recording that we have, seen the time slots that are appearing on the screen, that's where the, time, the times are quoted from. Not necessarily to say we've got a fire detector in all the sections. We don't have such in that present. Fine, Chair. We'll attend to TCS to check if such a kind of facilities to qualify to be in the PPP uh, without a smoke detector. 
the, 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 the second question Chair, is around uh, the issue of what your uh, your 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 security solutions expert says that a man enters uh, the server of some kind at almost 20 to 8 p.m. on the 2nd of April 2022. Now, DVRs are not working until 11 minutes past 4 in the morning after you have actually detected the, the smoke. But that it, it further says, when there is a malfunction in the DVRs, it automatically reports to the control room operators. Was it report? Who was working at the control room during that night of the incident? Has this reported to the control rooms? If the answer is not in the affirmative, why did the DVRs not report a malfunction to the control room operators? Uh, Honourable Member, um, Mr. Beiderfeld can tell you who was um, in the control room that evening. What I can say to you is of the three members that we suspended very soon after the incident, and of the three members that we dismissed for not following policies and procedures, two of them operated the, uh, the control room that, that night. Mr. Bailefeld can give you the names of those individuals. The one was a lady, uh, a lady um, Natasha Janssen. The other person was Franz Makotza. Those were the two people that was working in there. And then, just on clarification, honorable member, the system do not give you a report that the recordings are not working. Um, I can confirm that, um, and you can determine that as well uh, by asking the question to Integriton, who will be available to you. Um, because as far as my knowledge concerned and in the investigation, that does not appear on the screen if the recordings are not working. That's fine. Let's pass. Did you do a forensic investigation on what actually caused the fire? If the answer is in the affirmative, what are the findings of that uh, forensic investigation, what actually caused the fire inside the prison cell? Honourable Member, no, we did not do a forensic investigation. As I, as I so you don't know what caused the fire in the prison cell? No, we don't. Okay. As I no, leave it like that. You don't know what caused the fire in the prison cell. You are operating. We, we suspected the accelerant. No, we are not going to operate on suspicions. I am saying you do not know what caused the fire in a prison cell. You are operating. Honourable Member, I'm trying to answer your question. No, you said you did not do any forensic investigation and, and you don't know what caused the fire. What are you answering now? I want to explain why we didn't do a forensic investigation. Okay. As Two I seconds. Said, my time is running. As I said during my, investiga uh, during my presentation, there were three very clear investigations that followed. I mentioned that MCC, it's not within our remit and it's not within our skill set to perform uh, a forensic investigation or a path pathological investigation of anything of that kind. Okay. We, are, we, we are not, we, we don't have a Thank criminal you. I think investigation. You have the question. Thank you very much. Okay. I want to, to ask you a very, very unpopular or popular question. And I want to plead with you to answer honestly. Tabo Pesta gets convicted by a court of law. Uh, amongst those things that is uh, convicted of is the robbery with aggravating circumstances and other economic crimes. Are you a cash in transit company? Uh, Honourable Member, I am here to answer truthfully. Um, to your question... You know, just answer this one. Are you a cash in transit company? G4S is a multinational group. Including cash in and transit. Within, within that group, and particularly in South Africa, we do have a cash in transit 
uh, in a cash processing business. Tabo Pesta is convicted, sentenced for robbery with aggravating circumstances. Chair uh, is taken to a prison cell in a facility that is run by a cash in transit company and later is there is an orchestration of a faked death in the same facility. I will submit my views about it in the committee deliberations chair, not now. Let's, let's, let's go down. Uh, you say part of the things you have found in the prison cell were the alleged offender died is the cell phone and the laptop. Uh, and you say the laptop was authorized. And reports across the world say Tabo Besta was running a multi-billion company with, inside a prison cell. What was the laptop authorized to do in a cell, of a, in, a, in a prison cell? What was the purpose for the authorization of a laptop inside a prison cell? What was the intention? Honorable member, I will answer and then I'll ask uh, um, uh, my colleague to give you further information. Inmates who study, uh, who have a study formal, who are registered students have the right, and I believe it's in terms of uh, court cases that the DCS lost in 2015 and 2018. They have the right, if they are registered with a, with a formal institution of learning, to have access to a laptop. And for that reason, inmate Bester had access so, to that laptop. Okay. That's fine. Let's, 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 let's pass there. Maybe Honorable Mwala, uh, with which institution was he registered? He was registered with, uh, with Damlin. Was, was, was the laptop belong to him or to TCS or to G4S? I'll ask, uh, I'll ask my colleague. To when did the laptop belong? Honorable member, the laptop belonged to, to him. To him? That's correct. Do, do our correctional centers provide personal laptop to offenders who are studying within pause. We must understand that we talk from a point where we have crisscrossed the country going to correctional centers. What we find there is a laptops that are organized by DCS for their own students. Why was Tabo Pesta with his personal laptop? How did it end at the prison facility? Uh, Honourable Member, I'll ask Mr. Munyanti to, to explain to you the controls that are put in place when a laptop is brought into the facility for use by an inmate to ensure that that laptop is used exclusively for study purposes. Honourable but, Member. But, but before you go there, I think the question was why, before you move to the security features, l let's start with the first question. Let's start answering the first question. Honourable Member, can I request you to repeat the first question? The qu first question was that you authorised an inmate to have a laptop inside a prison cell. What were the reasons behind that? And your honourable colleague speaks about uh, something related to education. And we're trying to t talk to him that we have visited prison cells where student inmates do not use their personal laptops, but those of DCS uh, or whoever is running the prison facility. Why was he specially given his personal laptop, which you may not know if he actually used that laptop to commit those crimes? Honorable member, I can confirm that um, not only Bester uh, was allowed to... No, let's talk about Baxter. Let's leave other inmates. Let's talk about Baxter. Why was he allowed to have his personal laptop when you ran a risk of giving him a tool he used to commit the crimes? Why? I remember, the reasons are he qualified. What based are the qualifications? On, based, based on the criteria that we have set to say before we can allocate a laptop to an inmate, there needs to be evidence that he has registered with an institution and the qualification in which he is studying, we are able to take note of that in, 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 in our prison. Therefore, those are the reasons that prompted us to allow Bester um, to be in position of the laptop. 
That's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you took the inmate wherever he was uh, serving his sentence, whatever cell it is. Because the only popular cell now is cell 35 uh, minister. It's very popular. It's known by everyone that there in Mangawu they cell 35. I think we need uh, to. <laughs> You took him on the basis of whatever reason. We're going to go to those reasons as well. You take him and isolate him from other prisoners, take him alone, segregate him. So is the solitary confinement and segregation of inmates legal? Um, Honourable Member, uh, Section 30 of the Correctional Services Act stipulates that an inmate can apply for own safety reasons to be kept in a single cell, and in our case that needs to be approved by the Department of Correctional Services person on site, and that was the case in best this situation. Was that single cell not segregation or solitary confinement? No, it was Do you not call it what, what you did there? Do you not call it a solitary confinement no. or a segregation? No, honourable member, it's been called own, fine, safe, own safety. Let's, fine, let's go to the reasons. Part of the reasons you actually mention is that uh, Tabo Bester could not uh, pay his uh, protection fee to a 26 gang, which is something completely illegal within prison cells. But you approve it. You approve an application on the basis of illegal operations with, inside correctional centers. Is that not a way of you approving the gangsterism that is happening in those uh, prison cells? Honorable Member, I'll ask uh, Mr. Monyanti to, to, to answer that. I just want to clarify, I did not make the statement regarding... You did not what? I did not make the statement regarding uh, the, the 26 gang uh, during okay. the session this morning. Honourable Member, um, it's not to say we are promoting gangsterism. The reasons that are provided to us by inmates, even if we've got a view that this reason is not so legitimate, but we cannot a a take a risk and deny that inmate that opportunity because if the inmate is of the view that his life is in, is in danger, we need to be cautious, we really need to take an urgent step. And by, for the inmate to apply to be kept in single cell, it is a formal process that we need to follow. There was nothing wrong with the administration and the placement of the inmate in the single cell. So you, you chose to isolate the inmate under threat and not deal with those who are threatening him? Honorable member, at that moment we were dealing with the application and the application from the applicant was that his life is in danger and therefore the Correctional Services Act gave us a direction to say how much we deal with such applications. That's why we then went to section 30 and followed what the direction. What did you do to those who are alleged to be the 26 gang inside the prison cell? Did you do anything? Honorable member, according to my knowledge... Those who threatened Tabo Pesta, did you do anything with them? At this moment, I don't have that information. You did, you did nothing. The, the last issue Chair, I want to cover is the last issue, and I'm sure I'm still fine in terms of time. You, you, you take Mr. Bester to cell 35. Firstly, do you agree that cell 35 is a blind spot from cameras? Do you agree? It's not a blind spot, um, honourable member, but it's purely it, it's purely seen on TV because the camera is um, a little bit far from that point. But you can see. What is a blind it. spot? What do we defi how do we define a blind spot? A blind spot. Own understanding. A blind spot is where you can see nothing, sir. Okay. Do you agree that cell 35 is next to an emergency exit? Do you agree? Agree, your um, honourable member. Okay. Why did you put Besta next to an emergency exit? As though that you anticipated that there is going to be an emergency. Why? 
On the placement of uh, inmate Bester at that point, there was no information available that indicated that a possible incident may happen. And it's a proved cell that is developed by and built as in accordance with the specifications as received from um, government on how the, system, the center must be built. It was approved by government in that situation, and therefore the cell was used because it was available. The question is, is it not coincidence that you took Tabo Pesta to next to an emergency exit and immediately a day after there was an emergency and he exited until he was caught in, in Tanzania. Is it not coincidence? In hindsight, um, honorable member, it could like coincidence, but as informed, during uh, the incarceration, during the movement of Imad Bista, there was no information available that led to anybody thinking that uh, Putting him in that cell will rise to uh, the incident that happened on the uh, 2nd and 3rd of May. Okay. Uh, Chair, I will submit to the committee that Tabot Pesta was deliberately taken to next to an exit because the, the, the escape was thoroughly planned. But I'll do that when the committee deliberates for us to take the report to the National Assembly. Tabo Besta makes an application on the 15th of April. On the 16th of April, Tabo Besta receives a secret visit. Who is this person who visited Besta on the 16th of April? Name The person who visited Besta on the 16th of April 2022, who is that? You don't know. Perhaps, I, perhaps, Honourable Chair, I can ask my colleagues, do you have knowledge of a visit, regardless of the person on that day, to inmate Bester? I can confirm that his visit record proved no visit on that specific day. Chair, I will submit to the committee deliberations that Bester had a secret visitor on the 16th of April, 2022. And MG4S is dishonest. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Um, on the issue of the computer, what measures have you put in place to ensure that people who are using their pro uh, private computers, uh, those computers cannot be used for any other uh, unlawful activity? Honorable Chair, according to the direction of this ruling from the court, it says um, those laptops that are provided to inmates must not have a modem. So um, the measures that we have put in place is that we need to have a proof that indeed has registered with the institution, um, which we can also confirm. And then after that, we do provide the laptop to, to the learner. How many times do you check the laptop? Honorable member, we, we don't physically check the laptop, but from our IT system office, they've got a screen where they monitor the use of these laptops if the students are using their laptops in the school. Thank you very much. Honorable Breitenbach. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I'd like to start off with a comment uh, to G4S. Honorable Breitenbach, can you move closer to the mic? We can't move these chairs, unfortunately. So you've provided us with a 21-page report, because on page 22 you say thank you. So 21-page report um, <clears throat> that is largely uh, exculpatory. In fact, it's completely exculpatory. It acknowledges no uh, responsibility for this incident. You tell us how you have followed uh, the correct processes that you should follow and how you've cooperated ex post facto with 
a variety of institutions which are, which are questioned, but nevertheless, and, and that's what you tell us. You don't tell us what happened, how this happened, what you've done about what happened. There's, there's absolutely no indication in this report that G4S accepts any responsibility for the fact that until yesterday, there was a serial murderer and rapist on the run. Can you tell me why that is? Honourable Member, uh, as I mentioned, when it comes to the investigation of what happened that night, we could only investigate what happened under our control, what happened at the MCC that night. And I believe that investigation we have done. We have, we have determined who the people under our control are who did not comply with policies and procedures that evening. That may have contributed to the escape. We suspended them and we dismissed them. Incidentally, they have taken their suspensions to the CCMA for review. So they, they disagree with the decisions that we arrived at. But as far as the initial investigation around a suicide is concerned, and we need to remind ourselves that was the initial facts that we had to deal with. And then later the murder investigation, as far as that's, in, that's concerned, those are criminal and forensic matters that we do not have the skills, nor I guess the permission to investigate. Our obligation is to investigate internally, to deal with those individuals, and to pass that information to the police services so that they can take that information and, uh, and assist them with their, with their investigations. Um, I, I think, Honourable Member, with respect, it's, it's, harsh, it's harsh to say that we did nothing. Oh, harsh, not harsh, uh, be that as it may, it's my view. <coughs> You can like it, you can lump it, don't really care. <clears throat> so you're saying we complied with protocols and procedures and, and that's it, we stand back and we have no further obligation here. So your job is merely to incarcerate people, make sure that your uh, bed count is full and uh, come what may. Is that, is that your, what you're telling me? No, that's not what I'm telling you. But it appears to be what you're telling me. No. We investigated the actions of those under our control. We suspended them and we dismissed them. I see. You are aware of the fact that uh, there's a view at DCS that you in fact suspended and fired and transferred a whole bunch of people so that DCS couldn't get hold of them to in fact do their own investigation. Have you got a comment on that? I'm not aware of those. Uh, perhaps my colleagues uh, have knowledge of, of transfers. Well, perhaps you or one of your colleagues can tell me who was investigated, who was suspended, who was fired, and who was transferred, and why? Mr. Mr. Baderfeld can, can And I would have expected to find those details in this report, not this uh, whitewash, quite frankly. So I'd like to hear from you then, Mr. Baderfeld. Can you help me? Honourable member, um, firstly, the night supervisor in charge, Mr. Sinoy, um, Matsuara um, was suspended and fired, oh, sorry, dismissed, using the wrong word. Then um, the Natasha Janssen, the operator in the control room, was suspended and uh, dismissed. Tix Makotsa, the person in the control room with Natasha that night, was suspended and dismissed. Um, no employees of us is being transferred. Yes, we did indeed suspend these employees. But um, information can be made available to the committee where the controller requested to see these people. Uh, he's given the times to us and we've arranged with those people to come back to the center to see the controller on site for his investigation. Do you do lifestyle audits on your employees? I don't know, pick a straw, whichever one of you is gonna answer. Honorable member, we don't do any life audit. Why not? 
we, we really don't have any reason to do the lifestyle audit on our employees. I beg your pardon? Do you want to repeat that? Yes, we don't see any reason to do the lifestyle audits on our employees. You employ people to look after a hardened criminals. Your facility looks after, it's a maximum security facility, right? So we're not looking at shoplifters. And you don't think it's necessary to do lifestyle audits on your staff? On a you are, I'm busy. Sorry. And when I'm done, you'll have an opportunity. And don't make the mistake of interrupting me again. And you don't think it's necessary to do lifestyle audits on people who look after criminals like that, who have access to money, who are, are known for bribery and corruption. Are you saying your staff is above that? And if you are saying so, on what basis? Because strong. Honourable Member, I can answer that when employees are being um, appointed at the centre, there's a full po police investigation or a police a report being done on them, a vetting report has been done. That vetting report with other documentation is being sent to the Department of Correctional Services who uh, look at the documentation, we conduct training on these employees and then they approved to operate within the Correctional Services Act as custodial officials. Sorry, Honorable Breitenbach, uh, uh, but even a security clearance or a vetting, it has got a time frame. You do it every five years. So if I did that vetting 20 years ago, uh, would it still apply now? Because that is what you are saying to the question asked by Honorable Breitenbach. Honourable Member, I cannot speculate on that. Uh, the people from our HR department that's directly dealing with the employees are unfortunately not available. So I will have to write it down and come back with an answer to Honourable uh, Breitenbach on that one. I presume the answer will be no. So in this report or this document, I'm, I hesitate to call it a report, so in this document, that you've provided, uh, that took you so long to prepare, uh, that says nothing that's not in the public domain, took you so long to prepare that we could only get it this morning, because you only finished it around midnight last night. Uh, just incidentally, what were you doing for the previous year, if this is what you prepared until 12 o'clock last night? All of this information must have been available on a computer somewhere, and all you had to do was print it. So what, what took so long? I mean, just tell me that first. Uh, Honourable Member, we had to collate all the information. It was not all available on a single laptop. We had to collate it from various sources. Uh, we had to analyse okay. it and put the presentation together. We also wanted it independently vetted to ensure that everything contained in this, in this report uh, is factually correct. I see. You think you succeeded? Yes, I, th I think we have. Wow. So uh, I put it to you, uh, my view is that you're evading responsibility here. You're ducking all the institutional, the systemic issues that, that point to your own culpability in this matter. And the only things that you've included in this report are exculpatory. I take it you don't agree. Honourable Member, apologies, English is my second language. Can you please explain I can the word tell that you it? I can put it to you in Afrikaans if you like. Please. Hier is dokumentie wat jullie als een verslag voorlee. Het is rechtig niet papierwerk waarop het geschreven is nie. Al wat jullie doen is, jullie proberen verantwoordelijkheid voor mij. Jullie spreek geen aansprekelijkheid aan voor jullie rol in hier jullie gemors. Jullie spreek geen, jullie spreek geen aansprekelijkheid aan oor die verloop van die jaar, waar daar niks gebeur het nie, en hierdie moordenaar uh, uh, die lekker leven geleid het. Terwyl, allemaal geweet het, jylle 
dalk uh, correctieve dienste verseker die staat en zeg joh, je weet het hierdie man loop rond en jullie is niks gedoen nie, jullie is van niemand gesê nie en die, die ergste daarvan is, jullie het nooit vir enige van sy slagoffers laat weet nie en jullie aanvaar geen aansprekelijkheid nie wil je graag iets sê daarover? Um, honorable member, thank you for, for clarifying. Um, I mean, the statement is made that we're not accepting any, any responsibility. I, I cannot agree with that statement. We have, we have disclosed that we have dismissed three members and we've made that information available to the police. The police, in the last few days, arrested one of them. And I, I would like to think that is based on the contribution that we've made. It's not for us to link those individuals to the ultimate crime. That is for the police services to do. So I think, I think it's incorrect to say that we did nothing um, and, and that we, we, we do not feel that we are culpable uh, in, in this. Regarding your, your comment about us not warning the police, uh, correction, uh, warning the South African public. Again, we dealt initially, until the 25th of May, we dealt with the suicide. The 25th of May, a murder investigation was, was opened, still pertaining to the individual who we found in that, in, in that cell. The identity at that stage as far as we were concerned and based on knowledge available to us was still that of Tabu Besta. And that remained the theme and the facts available certainly to us until the, 22nd, until the 2nd of February of this year when Jig said, we investigating a possible escape and until we became, it became known to us that in the very early months of this year SAPS had opened an investigation into escape. Until then, the facts that are now are available to us with hindsight, uh, you know, that's available with hindsight to judge our actions, were not available to us uh, at, at the time. Well, I'm, I'm glad you went there. Are you finished? Sorry. And because of that, honorable member, and because of our contract with the DCS, we were not allowed to talk to the public and inform the public of a possible escape. We were not aware of an escape and we did not have the right to talk to third parties about the activities of, of, of the correctional centre. Okay, so because I only have uh, you know, a very short space of 30 minutes and I could quite honestly be here for the next four or five days, um, I'd like it if you could keep your answers brief, please. Thank you. So I'm glad you went uh, to, to this issue of you know, not knowing that it was an escape. Uh, until very recently, I think until uh, just during the course of this month still, G4S was insisting that the body that was found in that cell was in fact Tabu Besta. That was your view. And it was articulated again to us on, your, on our visit last week. That that's still your view, regardless of the inconsistencies in the post-mortem report and regardless of the practically irrefutable DNA evidence. g has clung to this version that the body was that of Tabu Bester. Why was that? Honourable <coughs> Chair, that's based on the information that was that was available to us. I, I was not at the at the briefing last week, so I don't know what what was said. We we were only we asked for the pathology report mid last year. We were not handed that report. It's only on the second of May, oh, correction, second of April, of February this year, that we were given <coughs> a copy of the pathology report and the DNA report. Until then, at that stage, we had no evidence other than rumors that there had been an escape or that it was not Tabu Besta who had died in that, in that cell. No, I'm sorry, let me, please let me interrupt you because I already told you I don't have time. 
So keep your answers brief, answer the question, please, nothing more. A discussion we can maybe have when we both got more time. Why did G4S cling to the version that it was Tabo Bester's body in that cell, even after it was very clear to everybody else in South Africa that it wasn't? Just answer me that question. Because we were not the primary investigation, uh, investigating authority and we did not have access to the prime evidence, honorable member. And that's your answer? Yes. Wow, I wish we were in court. Um, so you have investigated and f dismissed uh, three people. Are you honestly sitting here this morning telling us that this escape of Hollywood proportions, and no doubt some smart journalist is going to write a book and make a lot of money, was done with the assistance of three people. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm not suggesting that, Honourable Member. I'm saying that those are the individuals who did not follow policy and procedure. But that's just simply not possible. It had to have been so many more. A simple walkthrough of your facility revealed that it had to be so many more. How, how can you honestly sit there this morning and tell not, not me, not the people in this room, you're talking, I hope you understand, to the South African public who have an absolute direct interest in this matter. They have an interest in not having serial rapists and murderers running around the streets. And your job was to make sure that didn't happen, a job you failed at miserably. Do you honestly want to tell people that you think or that you're satisfied or that the ambit of your investigation was satisfied after three people were suspended and fired? Really? That's what we are able to say at this stage, Honourable Member. Good Lord. You'll agree with me that, just tell me, how would, how would uh, this propellant, this, this petrol, let's assume it was petrol, have gotten into the cell? Honourable Member, we, we don't know. You don't know. We, de we detected that and we alerted the police to that. And where would the matches, the lighter, the whatever it is that sets the light come from? I don't know. You don't know. Member. And you've done nothing to find out? Cell 35 has been traversed quite thoroughly by my colleagues. But you'll agree with me that it's a, a massive confluence of coincidences that Bester was moved there on that particular date to that particular cell. Right in the corner where unless you're really paying attention, you will not see somebody walking up and down there. Because we looked, we did an experiment. Unless, and we saw the person because we were watching him. If the controller is not paying 100% attention, maybe blowing her nose or whatever, you wouldn't have seen it. Because it's the only cell that's so far away that you can't see. And not to put too fine a point on it, and no pun intended, it's right next to the fire escape. Can you tell me that that's a coincidence? Are you suggesting that that's a coincidence? I have no information, Honourable Member, other than to, to regard that as a coincidence. Yeah. What I'm not ruling out <coughs> is that certain members, together with Mr. Bester, carefully planned this event. I'm not ruling that out. But I have nothing <laughs> tangible to present to you to say that this is anything other than a coincidence. You've been investigating for a year. You've had the benefit of the JICS report, which is most, an excellent one. You've had the benefit of your interaction with D DCS. You've had the benefit of the interaction with the South African police. And you're telling me that a year and a bit later, the best you can say is you don't rule out the possibility that this was a, a well-planned, monumentally logistical operation. I mean, I have a German Shepherd puppy that can come to that conclusion. There's the arson, the setting a lot of whoever the poor individual was in that cell. There's the corpse substitution. Who is that person in the cell? Where did they come from? Did they come from inside the prison? Because then your head count wouldn't have matched. Did they come in from the outside? How? Did they walk in? Were they murdered in the prison? Did they come in dead? 
You can't answer any of these questions. We, we don't know. On, you uh, don't know. On a year and a bit later, you don't know. We have provided all information pertaining to the movement of our personnel that evening to the SAPs, and it's for them to investigate I see. based on our information. You have no responsibilities. I'm not saying we have no responsibilities. I'm well, saying that we have investigated this matter so. to the extent possible. You appear to be saying you have no responsibilities. You've done what you could. Given bits of paper to other people and that's it. Wash your hands. Not at all. Well, that's the impression you create. And I want to tell you it's not good enough. It's impossible to believe that this whole operation could have taken place without uh, the greasing of many palms. Where would that money have come from? Whose palms were greased? Which of your officials are living above their means? You don't know because you don't do lifestyle audits. No, we don't. You don't think you should? We need to take that recommendation to heart, honorable member. How many uh, G4S employees were on duty at that facility that night? Uh, I'll ask my colleagues to answer that. Good. It was uh, 23, um, honorable member, that was on duty. 23 people had to look the other way. Honorable member, the investigation proved that the three people that was involved, that was suspended, were, were there. There was two people that was moved by the supervisor in charge that formed part of his disciplinary offence. Um, in hindsight, we can now uh, do realize that they were moved um, to be out of sight. Um, and. Um, then the other people were inside units, which will make the viewing to that specific unit very limited. Uh, and just days prior to this incident, a vehicle made an unauthorized entry into the prison facility, correct? That's correct. How come? Why? That's currently being investigated. We've been um, notified by the notice that my colleague has referred to during the presentation, which we received on the 28th of February this year. What precisely did, uh, forgive me, but what, precisely what did you investigate for the past year, if you didn't know that until February? I mean, what form did your investigation take? Honourable Mem Member, if I may, um, I think the timelines here should not be overlooked. The, the incident, as you pointed out, happened on the 29th of April last year. It became known to the DCS through an affidavit complete, uh, filed by one of our employees in mid-November. This incident was raised for the first time. The DCS made that information available us, to us for the first time, I believe it was three and a half months later, on the 28th of February. And it's then that we started to investigate this matter. So even though the, the incident happened 10 months ago, we've only had knowledge of this matter for a few weeks. And it's not that we've done <coughs> nothing. We have, we have commenced this investigation. And these investigations are very sensitive if you want to conduct them properly. Very sensitive you want to conduct them properly. I know a thing or two about investigations. Se secondly, the incident book where it was recorded that the vehicle had entered and eight minutes later had left the facility suggests nothing untoward with that entry. So by any independent party looking at that uh, log, they would not have detected anything untoward um, as far as that vehicle's entry and exit so, is concerned. So your system is deficient, doesn't pick up, there's no checks and balances, doesn't pick up this kind of thing can go undetected for a year. There could have been many more such uh, entries and exits. Who would know? So clearly your system is not foolproof. <coughs> your staff uh, didn't report it for some odd reason. How many people are on duty at the gate? One. Uh, I'll ask my colleagues to, I don't know what that answer is. It was one on duty, um, honourable member, yes, correct. And how did the vehicle get in without authorisation? Um, the process will, uh, will, will still reveal it, but currently I can confirm that we've got seven people that suspended pending this investigation on the involvement in, on that specific incident. 
He had six weeks. So how far have you got with your investigation? Tell us, that's what you're here to do. Uh, we've taken most of the affidavits. There was one affidavit that um, was still pending uh, on an employee that wasn't available. Um, the in investigator will uh, deal with that. And then unfortunately the investigator that's uh, investigating that had the operation and was out of contact for a week. Thank you. <coughs> so the vehicle came in, it was uh, bringing in a, what, a kissed box, a quasi coffin. You agree with me? I presume your investigation has at least revealed that. Yes, it was a TV stand cabinet that came in. A TV stand cabinet, okay. And where did that TV stand cabinet go to? It went into the skills development area. Um, and according to the people that are currently being in interv investigated, this stand was bring in by uh, the supervisor that um, is currently suspended, ach, and not suspended, being dismissed, and um, that that came in for uh, rectification purposes. To be repaired. Was it repaired, do you know? No, it was not repaired. I see, and that didn't raise a red flag with anybody. A large wooden box comes into the prison in contravention of all the protocols for repair and doesn't get repaired. Didn't bother anyone? I cannot answer on that at this stage. As I said, um, I will be able to answer that when the investigation has been finalized. I see. <coughs> Could a corpse have fitted into that uh, TV stand? I think so, yeah. Mm. And it wasn't searched. It wasn't inspected. That's one of the reasons why the employee that was working there has been suspended currently. He mm. didn't pro uh, do his, prop his work properly. Yeah, yeah, but it's a year later. A bit sad, that. So your Sally Port has got all these fancy mirrors and lights and cameras and whatever. Nobody, nobody noticed on any of the cameras that the thing had come in and wasn't uh, inspected? Honourable Member, um, once again, uh, the investigation is currently pending, uh, but the people that's working in the CCR room that had to monitor this is also currently being suspended because they did not report it. <coughs> so the list of those whose palms are greased is getting longer. It's not just three people. We're standing now around 10, is that right? We're currently there, but remember, we're currently still busy with the investigation. And I've got no doubt the numbers it, it will may, increase. It may be that from the seven, uh, some of them uh, can come back to work because you, you suspend um, to ensure that you can conduct, con conduct a proper investigation without interference of people. Mm. Honorable Bretenbach, you are left with four minutes. Unless Unless you can speak nicely to Honorable Ngola. Oh, okay. <laughs> Horn is still struggling with his car's flat battery, so I'll take his 30 minutes. I've told him so, it's fine. Mm. Um, so the list is growing and it will continue to grow. Oh, here he is now to claim his 30 minutes. I've, I've just said I'm taking your 30 minutes, so there, you can come and settle down. Um, so it comes into the, the, the room for the inspection that's known as the Sally Port. Come sit here. Now I want you here, I want to talk to you. Um, no inspection takes place, all these fancy mirrors, cameras, wonderful stuff, to no avail, because it's not foolproof. And there's no backup, there's no way to check. Again, the system fails, you agree? Pick a straw, guys. Honorable Chair, the camera would not have detected whether the vehicle passed without a gate pass. Um, that, that the camera would not have, have detected. The camera would have, and the question is very simple. 
The camera would have detected that it wasn't inspected. Correct. But that wasn't detected. It was detected by by people in the video um, in in the, the what's that room called uh, in the control room. It was not reported on, and uh. for that reason, those individuals have been suspended <coughs> pending the investigation. So again, the system failed. You can say so. A system is only as good as the segregation of well, duties. Well, the system is only as good as the people who run it. I agree with you. But if you're running a maximum security prison and you're uh, under contract to keep the South African uh, public safe, then I expect you to have a backup. And I expect it to work better than it did, because it didn't work, and you'll agree with me. That's fair comment, Honourable Member. And what about this fight that broke out elsewhere in the prison that the people were called away to so that only one person had to authorise the passing of this vehicle? Uh, I'll ask um, my colleague to answer that. The information is correct, uh, Honourable Member. Honourable Pretenbach, you are now on Mr. Horn's time. That's fine, he's donated it to me, it's all good. That inf uh, information is correct, and as it says, it's uh, currently part of our investigation um, to ensure that uh, all possible steps are being taken to rectify uh, if policies and procedures were breached and to take action in that regard. Mr. Bellafield, I don't understand how this information could only be available now. This happened a year ago, over a year ago. And now, all of a sudden, these last six weeks, there's this big flurry of investigations. This can't be news to you. G4S could not have lived in blissful ignorance of all these systemic failures until February this year. I just, I, could, I don't believe you. Or is that what you're telling me? That you operated in blissful ignorance, failure after failure after failure, as long as you've handed over your forms to everybody and, and you've washed your hands off this matter, everything's just fine. I cannot agree. Um, we, we run a very good prison. Uh. We've, we've run a very good facility uh, with security. Um, over the years, our track record uh, explains for itself. Um, this unfortunate incident um, is a result of non-reporting and because it was not reported and misused, we're currently <coughs> investigating and taking actions uh, to get um, this right and to sort it out. Thank you. So the, the little box comes in, it's perfectly capable of containing a corpse and it stays there until, uh, until after the escape. When did the box leave the facility? I had it removed during the investigation to a secure place, ma'am. For when? I can't exactly tell the date now. It was a few days after the um, notice. notice of the controller was received informing us of the incident. <coughs> <coughs> so that would have been in February sometime? No, early March, because we only received the document on the 28th of February from the controller's office. So that box has been standing at the prison for a year, no repair work done, no questions asked, and now you've had it removed to a safe place. Is that correct? That's correct. And has the box been examined? Has it been forensically examined? We've reported to the SAPS, and um, <coughs> that's what we did because they're doing the criminal investigation on it. I accept that you have no facility to do forensic examinations, but has the box been forensically examined? Have the police come and examine the box? It's an important piece of evidence. They came over the weekend. On Saturday, <coughs> they were at the centre... Um, to have a, a view of the box and to take the box away. They've taken the box away? That was how I, I was informed. Unfortunately, I wasn't on site at that point. Very, very. So one can only hope that the police are doing some sort of forensic investigation of the box without contaminating it. Similar to the forensic investigation of the house vacated by Bester a year later. Sure, sure. So 
So you say you have no record of uh, Bester being visited on the 16th? The record that was presented to me in the investigation <coughs> on our um, information, inmate information system doesn't provide a record that he was visited on the 16th. Is it possible that the system is incorrect? I cannot, I cannot guess on that. I see. Well, bearing in mind that the system is being incorrect on so many other things, I suppose it could be. Uh, is it possible to get uh, a visit that's not recorded? A straw, time's Hon ticking. Honorable member, um, for, for the data to be captured on the system, we are heavily relying on human beings. Therefore, there is also a possibility that if that visit happened, we were relying on our employees to capture that data. So if the visit happened and the data is not captured, um, it can't be a system problem. It should be a human being error or intentions not to capture that data. Honorable member, member if I may, just to, to complete the explanation, we keep footage for only seven days, video footage for only seven days, so it's not possible for us to go back hmm. to the date that you mentioned to, to do further I, investigation. I understand that system, um, but I assume that uh, and when something happens, like a fire in a cell, you keep that video footage? Correct. Unfortunately, in this case, there was none. Coincidentally. Of, of, those, of those cameras on that circuit, yes. that is correct. Just for that short period of time. And it works until the evening, they started working again later in the morning. Just that little slot, and it didn't work. You'll agree with me that that's not a coincidence? Yes, that coincidence is, uh, is, is strange. It must stretch even your imagination. <laughs> uh. It does. Yes, yeah. quite. So now, the, assuming the body came in in the box, and uh, now transferred to the cell. How would it get transferred to the cell, un un unnoticed, undetected? Anybody? If the uh, body was moved, it's currently not clear to us how the body was moved. moved um, and that will form part <coughs> of the criminal investigation by SAPS. Um, as we indicated before, we did a proper investigation on all the policies and procedures that had to be followed. Mm. Where these were not followed, we've taken action um, mm. to ensure that people that's responsible to, to follow these are being liable. See, there's the problem, Mr. Badenfeld. Every time you semi-answer a question, then you tack that bit on at the end about how it's not really your responsibility. Nothing here is your responsibility. Every time there's this little exculpatory phrase about we've done this, we've done that, we've reported, we've, it's not us. Who sir, me sir, no sir. Anybody else sir, but not me sir. It's a little bit, it's wearing a bit thin. You maybe want to not do that. So you say if the body was moved, well it must have been moved because it got into the cell. Or you're suggesting that somebody walked in there, was murdered in the cell and then said a lot. No, honourable member, I'm suggesting not, no such thing. I've indicated what's uh, available to my information mm. and answered it to the best of my ability to the committee. Okay, and then how did Besta get out? <laughs> I mean, assuming that you agree with me now that Besta got out, because until a few days ago it was your position that it was him in that cell. So let's assume you agree with me now that Besta got out. How did he get out? With will, all those checks and balances, all that security, how did he get out? I will preempting that's part of the SAP investigation. <laughs> Currently, to say how he got out, um, I don't think that's my purpose now. The, the SAP will, who's doing the criminal investigation, and I know you said I keep on saying and passing the buck. Unfortunately, that's how it operates. The SAP are conducting the criminal investigation, and we do a due diligence invest investigation into the operations. You in don't the think that is part of your responsibility to determine how a murder and a serial rape has walked out of your prison. That's somebody else's responsibility. Get real. You honestly, that's the answer to the question. It's not your responsibility. Our responsibility is to assist the SAP in every single way that we can, providing all information, providing everything that we have to the SAP to assist them to do a proper 
criminal investigation into the situation. Honorable. It appears to me that the things that you do have are not terribly helpful. And it's the things that you don't have that are the issue here. But I'll leave that be. You say that Bester had a laptop and no control is exercised over the use thereof. Honourable Member, I responded that when that question was asked to say our IT uh, office on site, they've got a screen where they have linked um, these computers of the inmates when they plug that because these inmates cannot send the documents um, to anywhere if they don't make use of our uh, computer center. Because our understanding is that those laptops does not have the modems. So once that laptop is plugged, uh, to have access uh, to can send document to the institution. It reflects on the screen of the, our IT mm -hmm. office and then they can pick up that this particular inmate is now using the system and then they can trace to say on which website did the inmate went. I see, and do they check what they do? Honorable member, I can confirm because it was quite interesting for me to learn that they do spot checks um, as to what the inmates are doing there. And you've read the reports about Besser running a, a business from his prison cell and appearing on all types of uh, fancy glitzy shows? And this was not picked up in any of your spot checks? Honourable member, I can say I have seen those media mm. uh, reports, but from what I have learned from the investigation, we did not pick up that to say we, we can confirm that all what the media was saying it is true, it happened at MCC. I cannot commit myself to that. Mm. A lot of things you can't commit to. <clears throat> when the laptop comes in, do you check it? Is it inspected? And if so, by whom? Honourable member, the laptop is being checked, although it is not being opened, because these laptops, most of them are coming brand new. They still have got the warranty and the like. So you don't really check it? No, they, they are being checked. What do you do? But you look to, at it? But, but to, to what extent I think the IT office will have said well, the right not, language? Do you not know that? I mean, is it not something that you should know? No, I know, Honorable Member, to say they are being checked. Yeah, but you don't know how. So a, look at it. There's a box. There's a laptop. So have a look. There's a laptop. All right, off you go. That's it. Is that how it's checked? Honorable Member, they are being checked. But really, I'm not... If they don't open it, how do they check it? Honourable Member, I'm, I'm, I'm really unable to you explain exactly how I don't know. I see. Okay. Mr. Horn, would you like some of your time back? Honourable huh? no, are you done? No, Mr. Horn wants to use some of his own time. Mm. Number nine, who was the last one? Okay, it's fine. Whatever I haven't uh, used of his is his. Um, uh, Honourable Engelbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, gentlemen, in your report and through the interactions that we had up to now, um, you stated that firstly you um, cooperated with DCS, SAPS, JICS fully, and it also became clear that you said that you only found out on the 2nd of February 2023 that the body in the cell was in fact not that of Bester. So I just want to know, um, in a report that we received from Jix, it is stated there that on the 11th of August 2022, um, the body found in the cell does not appear to be that of inmate Bester. So that was 11 August 2022. Now, do you want to tell me, or just provide clarity, that from the 11th of August 2022 until the 2nd of February this year, in all your interactions that you had with JICS and DCS and SAPS, 
that you were not made aware or that information was not shared with you up until the 2nd of February, that the person that passed away in Bester's cell was in fact not Bester. Uh, Honourable Member, no, we did not say that we were not aware. There was a lot of s speculation going around at the time as to the identity of, of the body that was found uh, in the cell. Wh what we did say is that it's only on the 2nd of February 2023 that we were given evidence by way of the DNA report and the pathology report to confirm these rumours. So just a short follow-up on that one. So what you're saying is that um, even if the inspecting judge or his representative or someone from the Department of Correctional Services or the South African Police Service spoke to you and told you that we believe that that person that died there is not, in fact, based there, uh, it means nothing to you until you receive a DNA report and then and only then you will act upon such information. Uh, Honourable Member, it wasn't up to, uh, up to us to act. We waited for this proof as confirmation of the fact that the person in that cell was not, uh, was not inmate Vesta. We acted prior to that by doing our internal investigation and exhausting all information, reviewing and exhausting all information available to us to arrive at a conclusion as to what happened that evening. As far as the criminal investigation is concerned, other than provide the information available to us, we were not able to continue with, with a criminal investigation. Thank you. Um, about this uh, missing video footage. Now, in your report that you sent to us, you say that these camera systems were working. I can find the page for you if you missed that. Um, uh, incident summary, 2nd of May, 2022, 1930. Security systems, technician confirmed security system is operational, All right? So then, and it's not about, I'm not asking a question about the security system, I, it's just a lead on. Um, so in between the 11th of August and the 2nd of February, when you became aware or that someone mentioned to you that we don't believe that uh, dead body belongs to Bester, and with everything that transpired with the cameras that was turned away, uh, certain cameras that were switched off and not working, footage that was not available, um, the very suspicious uh, uh, way that a vehicle entered the facility, um, the fire, which is a very serious incident. Um, don't you think that it was probably the correct thing from your company side to do, to check due diligence and whether all your systems are operational. Um, and, you know, because uh, it is very clear that a crime has been committed on a facility managed by yourself where none other than people employed by you were involved. It is clear, undisputable. So, and in your answering up to this point, you stated that yes, well, we handed it to the to SAPS and we told Jigs about it and we told the DCS about it. Was there nothing done from your side? Because obviously there is a big problem with your system and the security at that facility. And because my question, as a and I, I'm sure a member of public, if this could have happened at Mangalung G4S, what else could have happened there? And we need to acknowledge the good journalist from ground up, because I'm sure if he didn't break the story, none of us sitting on this side would have been 
wiser about any any the wiser about what what transpired here. And only after the story broke, everything seemed to start happening now. From your side as well, if I look at your timeline, things started happening after the story broke. So let's not go into that. I just want to know, did you do a diligence check? Did you investigate, not in terms of covering your backsides, in terms of the contract that you might lose, but in terms of doing your job, making sure that prisoners that's incarcerated in your facility is in act actual fact not able to escape from that facility. Uh, Honourable Member, the security system is managed by Integriton. Uh, I believe that there was a last, uh, a last minute summons to them to, to come and report what they found to this committee. I can say that it, uh, at 19.30 on the evening of the 2nd of May, in terms of standard protocol, Integriton reported to us that the cameras were in, uh, in, a, in a working condition. Subsequent to that, and I believe Mr. Bailefeld can help me here, but I believe it was on the 4th of May, we immediately contacted Integriton to find out why the system failed during the hours mentioned uh, in, in, in our report. We acted on that the very next day. As to your comment around the vehicle, again, I must emphasize the timelines here. We were made available only on the 28th of February 2023 by the DCS of this incident. So when BESTA was moved to a single cell, in terms of the system, only a controller which is a DCS official can allow that to happen. And by law, when an inmate is moved, from a cell block to isolation, you have to inform chicks about that move. Was that, in fact, done when Bester was moved to Broadway? I will ask um, Mr. Bailefeld to answer that, and, and if you would, would like, Honorable Member, he can also answer you on the procedures taken regarding the security system on the 4th of May. Uh, Honourable Member, on the um, security system, uh, yes, the security system that indeed not provide us the video footage. Um, we've investigated and found that the person from integrity, in according to our pro uh, processes, did follow up on if the systems were working or not. And on the 3rd of May, when we wanted to view the video footage of the incident and that was not available, they were immediately contacted and requested to assist us in a report on why, what happened, and the reasons for this. Um, that was with regard to, uh, to the report. Then with regard to, sorry, can you just uh, um, ask the second question again, please? I don't want to answer the wrong thing. Uh. Oh, sorry, um, I realized it, it was the question if G Jigs was informed. Yes. This incident happened on the Friday night. It was over a long weekend. So the incident happened, oh, started on the Friday night with his removal. Um, approval was received from the controller um, at, uh, later that after, late that afternoon to move the inmate into the cell. And the documentation uh, informing Jigs is being sent by the controller's office. Uh, because they are the uh, reliable people on the site, uh, our corresp correspondence to the JICS um, information. And the incident occurred before they could have been informed of this uh, removal um, of the inmate over the weekend. Thank you. Then let's, let's come to the um, computer that was uh, mentioned um, previously. Um, you do know that if you have a laptop and you have a cell phone, you don't need any other connection. You can connect to the internet. Because look, to pull off an operation like this, you need extensive planning to happen. And obviously, um, if you know that you are being monitored, you are not going to make use of the facilities internet. Um, so when did you realize that there was a cell phone in business position. 
cell phone was uh, found after the SAP um, gave the, uh, the cell back uh, or released the cell to us um, uh, after the body of the person that was in the cell was removed to the mortuary. It was then when the items in the cell was um, taken uh, and to be put in a box and into a black bag that um, the cell phone was found in between these. Sorry, when you are moved from a one cell block to isolation, all your personal belongings need to be moved with. Are those personal belongings checked before you enter into your isolation cell? You need to be searched, uh, Honorable Member, yes. Uh, the employee that did not do that searching um, was charged and received a 12 months written warning uh, on, this, uh, on this case for not searching the inmate when he moved from one cell to another cell. Yes, sir. Uh, I must um, note that a lot of things seem to not have happened the way that they should have happened, uh, particularly when it comes to this inmate. Um, from the time that he was incarcerated, uh, secret uh, uh, visitor received, and everything up to the time that he walked out of your facility without being noticed for months. Um, when a serious incident occurs, there must be a, a head count must be done. And this is a very specific way that a head count is done. And it's not that call a name and you stick up your hand. There's a, a piece of paper with your photograph on and you do a thumbprint to check. Um, after this incident, a head count was done, apparently, and everyone was accounted for. Was that procedure followed where you checked the thumbprint with the document of each inmate in that facility? Honourable Member, I can confirm it was not done the way the Honourable Member is explaining it to be done. Uh, was it not supposed to be done, or has the regulations changed in the meantime? Honourable Member, the procedure that we are doing to account for the inmates, since they are kept in about eight sections in that uh, facility, the six units, the one unit in the hospital, and the one unit which we call this Broadway, where the incident took place. Individually, those departments are sending their roll count, physical roll count, to central control room, which will make the whole um, uh, calculation. And then if, 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 if the numbers tally, which is supposed to be 2928, we take it for that all the inmates have been accounted for. Okay. I want to know, we, we did send a request last week <clears throat> for information, but we unfortunately have not received it, so I have to, because I really don't want to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it in any case now, since we did not receive the information. Can you please tell me, from all the people that you have in your employment at Mangahoon, how many of your employees are either children or direct family members of Department of Correctional Services officials? Uh, if you know the answer, who are they? And uh, to which DCS officials are they related? Honourable Member, I can confirm that we do have employees that are related to some of the DCS officials. Although some of the DCS officials that I think of are no more in the service of DCS. Yes, it would have been nice if we could have received that information when we requested that. Uh, um, Honourable, then, uh, Honourable Engelblatt, do you think that it will still be important that that information be submitted? Yes, yes, of course. I would like to see that very much, um, Mr. Chair. Um, maybe we should give you seven days to submit that information. Honourable Chair, we took note of that and we are committing that we will submit such information. 
Um, also, the other information that we requested, every single program that you offer at the facility, uh, who's the contractors, who's involved, and what exactly do they do? How long does it take? What does it cost? Um, lastly, um, I saw on social media that a journalist named Ruth Hopkins investigated, did a investigated uh, journalistic piece on the Mangaung facility. Now she claims that um, there were seven escapes that took place in that facility, of which uh, four was not reported. It's claimed by her. So um, has this ever been looked into, um, or uh, are you not aware of um, Ms. Hopkins' um, expose on G4S Mongo? Honorable member, maybe I can, I can ask that question and then specific to the escapes, my, my colleagues can, can, can address you on that. We are aware of all the allegations made by, by Ruth Hopkins. Um, they were investigated, to my knowledge, by Jix and by the DCS at the time. And no matters were brought to our attention that raised any concern. To my knowledge, also, we received no observation notices in respect of the allegations that, that she had raised. Um, I cannot comment on recent social media posts because I'm, I'm not aware of those. As far as the additional escapes is concerned, other than those that we've, that we've um, informed this committee on, uh, I, I need to defer to my colleagues. I've got one more question, Mr. Chair. Um, it entails the entering of the vehicle from outside the facility um, and the sally port. Nobody knows what happened there because apparently, you know, the footage does not exist. No. But apparently this body had to be taken to a holding area which was a workshop, or still is a workshop. When I was there last week, when you exit the sally port, it is to your right, and then there is a workshop right there. Now, according to the regulations, EST officials are not allowed to enter the workshop. There's also no cameras installed within the workshop. Now, if you think about a box or a wooden casket or something that contains a body, it, it's, it's quite heavy. Um, and in our visit last week, I was told that the EST officials that worked on the day right there assisted to get to offload this box into the workshop. And then from there, obviously, um, nobody knows how that body was then transported or taken up the stairs into C35 and set a light. But that's another issue that I think was dealt with. I just want to know, have any investigation been done about the EST officials that was doing on duty on that particular day because they must have assisted offloading the dead body in a wooden box from the vehicle that entered the facility illegally to get the body into the holding area, which was the workshop that is not so very far away from Broadway, South Block, as I can remember. Honourable Member, yes, I can confirm that these two EST uh, persons currently at the centre being investigated pending this investigation because of the involvement on that specific day. Honourable, Honourable Engelbrecht, I regret your time is up. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. The last uh, questions will come from Honorable Masako Chele before we adjourn for lunch. And then after lunch, it will be Honorable Janji, Honorable Iago, and then Honorable Swart. Chair, the last one order. Will be order, Honorable, uh, Chair, no, order. On. Because I was number five on the list, if you remember. Yes, so yes. I'm next to speak now. So after okay. him, it is myself. Okay. 
Um, so I will ask Honorable Maseko Jele to kindly allow me to the space to speak. Honorable Jele, you, you agree? Oh, oh okay. My, my apologies, Honorable Yako. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, no desaula because I have to fight right now for my space to speak. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, I think um, what I wanted to, to, to speak to is the fact that I think that Mr. Hulivot, um Mr. Munyate, and uh, Mr. Bellefeld did caucus before coming here with Chief of Ace. And they caucused prior, when everything started blowing up, they caucused, and they decided that
Can we come back at 20 past one?
and I hereby revoke. Am I right? You indicate to the unit um, person in charge that he wants to revoke his uh, section one one uh, his section thirty incarceration in the cell. Yes. I think the reason we're asking these questions is to see if there's a timeline that is specific in terms of black and white. Do they write a specific report saying, I, Yoli Swayako, hereby feel now that I am safe and I sign? Yes, Honourable Member, it's correct. They do write on the complaint and request indicating that they want to cancel their and own can safe. Can we be furnished with that, please? I will make sure that I do get those reports. On Thank you. Member. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, um, I'm looking at the timeline now. Um, the issue of the possessions that were um, taken from the deceased were an unauthorized, an authorized laptop, which I have an issue with, because in any correctional centre, I would think when there is a time to study and a laptop is allocated to a prisoner, they are given that laptop during the time of study. And we have it on record that Mr. Bester was doing other things with that laptop besides studying at Dumlin. Um Secondly, did G4S investigate the issue of the unauthorized cell phone? Because I think if there's contraband coming into your correctional center, you would then have to investigate how did that contraband come into his cell? Uh, Honourable Chair, I'll ask Mr. Bailefeld to, to answer the first view of the first question. As to the second question uh, pertaining to the cell phone, um, we were unable to determine exactly how that cell phone entered the facility. I think it's a known fact that not with, notwithstanding all steps that are taken by, by prisons, be they public or private, cell phones is contraband that is often smuggled into the uh, into the prisons. It's then our task to systematically and on a, freak, on a regular basis work through the prisons to detect those and to remove those. Obviously you'd have to investigate how did that come into his cell. Yes. Was that investigation done? Uh, I, I think Mr. Bailefeld can talk more about the actual movement of inmate Bester from the, his previous cell to cell 35. Okay, my next question is um, on the notice of the death of the inmate, um, who was then the next of kin who was supposed to come and claim the body? Um, in, in accordance with the investigation, Honourable Member, the um, person that was at that point in time registered as his um, next of kin was an uncle that could not be um, get hold of on the information that was supplied by Bester. So the next person was, that was informed was uh, the doctor in Deepa, which was on his co contact list as a contact to inform her of the death. But was not registered as a next of kin. So in that case, when a, a prisoner dies in your cells and you cannot locate the next of kin, do you just take any contact from, or any listed contact from the prisoner? No, you don't do, do any, you don't just take any contact, Honourable Member, you investigate. That's the person that um, did visit the inmate over the past few years. Uh, that was the person that you then contacted to determine if there's any other in, in next of kin. And she informed us that the inmate is the alone. He don't have other, any other next of kin except she, and she's currently customary married to him. Did you then seek any kind of documentation? Sorry, did you have any kind of documentation? Because I can't just claim a body if there's no black and white that says I am married to this person via customary marriage. Was there any kind of paperwork that you as U4S did or you do on a systematic basis when there is a person who dies in your premises? There is paperwork and we will submit it with other document that was requested by the committee. Thank you. I'm moving with the, the report that was given to us, Chair. And um, again, Mr. Kronovold, you speak a lot about the timeline and how that timeline exonerates you from lack of action and how that timeline speaks to how much action you conducted. But looking at this timeline that you have, um, an investigation was only opened in January 2023 by SAPS. And do you know why that is? No, I don't, Honourable Chair. The, um, the SAPS investigation, being a criminal investigation, was not our remit. 
So it was not within you to inform SAPS um, to do an investigation on the suspected abscondment of Mr. Bester? No, we dealt with a suicide. Um, that was later amended to a murder by, by the police services on the 25th of May. Uh, and, and that was to our knowledge the, the facts until um, there was news of a possible escape. Chair, I'm not answered. Can you please repeat that? Uh, Honorable Member, I, s I said that we, uh, we did not inform, I think your question was, did we inform the, the police on the 25th of, uh, in January? And my answer is we did not inform them. We were dealing initially with a suicide based on what the police had identified having viewed the cell. On the 25th of May, the police changed that to a murder investigation. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's only during February, 20, uh, February of this year that evidence was made available, uh, available to us, suggesting through the autopsy report in the DNA that the individual removed from the cell on the morning of the 3rd of May was not, not that of Tabu Bester. A year later. Yes, but I think the timelines you are quoting, um, Honourable Member, those timelines are in control of the SAPs, not in control of our investigation, which was an internal investigation that we launched on the 3rd of May. Okay, with that internal investigation, do you not liaise with the police to say that we have, an in, as intelligence within the prison, do you not liaise with the police to say we suspect that this person was is not, in fact, Mr. Tabapes, which means there's a dead body that we cannot account for in our prison system, <coughs> knowing that the DNA has revealed that that person is not, in fact, Tabapes, is not related to anyone who's connected to Tabapes. We were made aware, or we were given the DNA evidence only on the 2nd of, De of February 2023. Prior to that, we had no evidence available to us to suggest factually that the body in the, in, in the prison was not that of Tabu Besta. We had no evidence. We did assist the police by making the information available that was available to us available to the police to assist them in their investigation. I don't know, through you, Chair, I put it to you that, uh, Mr. Khrunvot, you're not being honest with us because it cannot be that there is a murder or a death um, and you're not accounting for it, you don't investigate it, firstly, um, that you don't know there's something that happened. I think that you are merely, you are merely reacting to an explosion that was about to come onto your doorstep, and that is why you then sent it to the ACPS. Otherwise, I think that is, as it looks right now, G4S would have kept quiet, and Tabo Besta would have lived his best life and raped more people and murdered more people if he could, had this not blown up the way it did. Not at all, Honourable Member. I think you will hear when the SAPS give their testimony that there was a very close and early cooperation between uh, members of the MCC and members of the SAPS. Uh, as I said in my presentation this morning, as early as the 26th of June, we furnished the SAPS with all the information that they had requested to assist them in the criminal investigation. Prior to that, we conducted our internal investigation, which was an investigation against policies and procedures. That was our remit. The criminal investigation was the, was, was the remit and, and also fitted the skill sets of the SAPs. Okay, um, I'm looking at your, your timeline presentation on page 12, um, which says MCC compliance investigation. Um, firstly, it says that MCC does not have the authority to conduct a criminal or forensic investigation, but do you not request one? Isn't the onus for you to request um, a criminal of an investi an investi um, a forensic investigation? Honourable Chair, that was not necessary because the police were involved from as early as 6 o'clock on the morning of the 3rd of May and remained involved right up to today. So they were conducting, uh, they were conducting their obligation. There was no reason for us to formally um, request them to engage. We that speaks against what you're saying in that you did your own internal investigation. So that internal investigation would then have revealed that that person was not in fact Tabo Besta. 
And, and I think perhaps, our, uh, Honourable Member, that's why we, where we are missing each other. Our investigation was not and could not have been a criminal investigation. We did not have the pathology report available. We would, did not have the DNA available. We requested on the 1st of July, if, if memory serves, the pathology report from SAPS to see if we could gain something from it. SAPS declined to give that information to us. So we, we tried to engage by getting access to some of these source documents. So but you're saying that SAPS did in fact not cooperate with you? No, SAPS did cooperate with us. They felt that there was no need for us to see the pathology report on the 1st of June or July. For, forget me, I have many num uh, days to remember. But I think it was the 1st of July that we requested the pathology report and they declined to give it to us. Other than that, I think you will hear through these proceedings that there were very good cooperation between the two parties. I don't think that's true. Um, I don't think that's true. I'm not convinced by your reply to me because you're saying you did an internal investigation. You're saying that SAPS did not then want to turn over the, the forensic results of that body that was found in the cell. The, the pathology. You. The pathology, yes. Yeah. Are you saying that's what happened? The pathology report was not turned over to us when requested mid-2022. The DNA report was made available to us at the end, it was on the 2nd of February 2023 by Jix. It's the DNA report that links that body to the lady who purported to be Tabu Bester's mother at the time. Okay. The pathology report, honorable member, dealt with the cause of death. Okay. Um, I'm looking again at the page, at page 12 dealing with your timelines again um, because it seems to me that there's a lack of I don't know if your trigonometry is not trigonometry or what is happening however there's no linear way in which you dealt with this um, in as much as you've got dates you're talking of July you're talking of February um, there doesn't seem to be any timelines in the bullets that you've put here you said it was consistent with the best practices an investigation included staff interviews where are those reports of the staff interviews that you conducted um, documents of CCTV footage, what, where is that? Um, DCS had full access to evidence. So you had full, full access to evidence, but now you're saying that you had, you had pretty much, you didn't have all the evidence on you. Um, the evidence was shared with SAPS, but no data aligned with that. Um, evidence and reports were shared with Jix, but there's no dates that are telling us that you were proactive in dealing with the situation that you found yourself in, because Let's just say that it had been Tabo Besto who had burnt himself alive. Would that not have triggered uh, an alert, a dread alert with you as G4S to say we're a maximum prison? Firstly, there's no accelerator that should have come into our prisons without anyone being involved at high level. Firstly, a person could never have allocated himself to a, a cell and then burnt himself alive. Secondly, that there's no footage of anyone going in and out for a certain time there. Would that not have been your first priority? Let's just say that it had been him who had burnt himself alive in that cell. Why did that not happen? Uh, why did what not happen? On why did you not, you didn't do an investigation? No, we did. We, we, we called the SAPS to the scene immediately. We launched an invest, uh, internal investigation. I think I've made it clear that it's not our role to launch a forensic investigation. Keep in mind that in a very, very early stages in the very few in, in uh, the day of the 3rd of May and the days that followed that right up to the 25th of May we were dealing with an apparent suicide and we had a death notice for Tabu Besta those were the facts available to us and those were the facts that were made available to the police services that they were investigating the report no Che I think Mr um, I keep forgetting so Mr Hrivot is not understanding my line of questioning. I'm asking, because you're here to account for your part in this whole debacle, yes. and your part in this whole debacle was to investigate what happened, how did an accelerant come in? So in this report, you should have outlined directly what your responsibility was, which was to 
investigate. Give us dates. How far did you go with that investigation? What was your liaison with the SAPS? What was the involvement of SAPS through you? We understand that you could not conduct a criminal investigation. We get that. However, as G4S, whose, whose tasks, who's tasked with keeping prisoners at that caliber, of that caliber within, how did that happen? Why did you not investigate? Because there's no, there's no sign of investigation with what you're giving us. You keep shifting dates, and that is the, the issue that we have, is that it feels like you're not seeing the seriousness of mm. this matter. Had it been, had it been Tabo Besser, because now it's not him, it's even worse. Honourable Member, I'm not shifting dates. I think that the dates that are in the report are clear, and I stand by those dates. We launched an investigation on the 3rd of May 2022, the morning of the incident, that investigation was to assess the actions of members at the MCC to see to what extent they breached policies and procedures so that we could link, potentially link those breaches of policies and procedures to what happened at the facility on the night of the 2nd and the morning of the 3rd of May. That investigation <coughs> we launched immediately as you heard from Mr. Bailefeld uh, earlier today, we suspended, we started suspending staff on the 6th of June in order for the, the investigation to proceed. Moving to those suspensions, did you, are you still paying those that are, are suspended now? Uh, I don't know, Mr. Bailefeld. Uh, they, <coughs> they were suspended with salary, yes, but they are in the meantime, all three been dismissed. The, the supervisor was dismissed on the 29th of September, one of the CCR employees on the 6th of December, and the other one on the 31st of January 2023. So the entire time they were being paid before they were dismissed? That's correct, Honourable Member. I'm going to move back to your investigation. Um, can you confirm or deny that um, Mr. Sohore um, left your prison he went out and then came back just 10 minutes before the, the CCTV footage kicked back in. Honorable Chair, I'll ask um, Mr. Bailefeld as the investigator to, to report to you on that. It can be reported that Mr. Suari didn't only went out once, uh, found in the investigation, and he went out a few times in investigation, and that, that's for, that it did form part of his disciplinary process and form part of the reason why he was dismissed. Okay. I'm moving with this, um, this, this report. Um, you are left with 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes, okay. Chair. Um, Mr. Hruvat is not being honest because there is a timeline here on the 16th of, of um, on page 16, sorry, which says that on the 3rd of May, um, SAPS gave no indication that a suicide is suspected. And I want to know, bef before this, had there any, ever been any suicides in G4S? Honorable Chair, I'll ask, um my colleagues to uh, to comment on that. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that you are misreading that page. We say on the 3rd of May, the final bullet point, that the, the SAPS Did gives not, no yeah. indication yeah. I read it to correctly. Im that anything other than a suicide is suspected. Other than a suicide. Anything other than a suicide. This means that at that stage, we were dealing with a suicide. The SAPS concurred that that is what we were dealing with. I'll hand over to Mr. Bailefeld. I think hence I'm asking, had there been any suicides before? I can answer you that, um, Honourable uh, Member. Yes, there was a uh, suicides before. And what was your process of, of investigation for a suicide? The same to determine whether policies and procedures were followed to ensure that um, everything is in order in line with your operational procedures. Okay. Um, my next question is, um, Belongings of Mr. Bester were given to the next of kin. You put here, they were given to the next of kin. Was that the uncle or the now uh, wife? Uh, Honorable Member, I'll ask Mr. Bailefeld to confirm that. I just, want to, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there were two sets of um, personal belongings for, 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 for inmate Bester. The one set 
was what was removed from cell 35 on the morning of the 3rd of May. This was the set that was held in the administrative building, and it's with this set that we detected a petrol smell, or you know, generally referred to as the accelerant, that the police later investigated and removed from our premises on the 8th of May. There's another set of personal belongings that was given to the next of kin, and this is the belongings that um, inmate Bester handed over the day he entered the prison before he was taken to his cell on the very first date. Those were another set of of, of uh, evidence. So I almost want to say that. So you're saying that the cell phone and the laptop were given to someone else, and then the, the rest of his clothes were given to the next of no, kin. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. What, what I'm saying that? is on the date inmate Bester originally was incarcerated at Mangung Correctional Facilities. His personal belongings were taken from him and they so were those held. The ones you those were the ones that were sent to the next of kin. The uh, belongings. No, I think my question is who was the next of kin? Was it the wife or was it um, the, the uncle? No, it was Dr. Ndipo. Okay. Nandipo. <coughs> yeah. Um, I think my last question, what, Chair, I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm not entirely covered by the answers of G4S. I don't think you came to a card. I don't think you came to answer. Um, we're going to oscillate around the same questions, basically, and we're not going to get any accountability. Um, because looking at the timeline, you said MCC meets with Jix on the, th on the 2nd of February and informs, Jix informs MCC of their suspicions that inmate Bester had escaped. So before that, you had no, no one had come to you as, um, as Mangawong Correctional Center to say that we suspect you had to wait for Jix to come to you to say that we suspect that this was um, a suicide. Not to me personally, uh, Honorable Member. So what was your final input after your investigation was done? What was your final report to say, we believe as G4S, this is what happened on that day, um, that there was a suicide in our, in our cell? At, at the time that our final report was finalized, the forensic, in, the criminal investigation had moved on from a suicide to that of murder. Our report, being an invest, uh, internal investigation, concluded that th the three individuals we've been referring to today cannot account for their actions in, a, in line with their operational duties for that day. These are the three individuals that were suspended and then eventually dismissed. One of those is the member who was arrested by the police over, uh, this past, over the past few days. That was the conclusion of our report. So the, uh, the, outcome, the outcome of your report was not to say this is basically what happened. These are the measures that we didn't take in order for this suicide and murder to take place in our correctional facility. Was that not the outcome of your report to say, we cannot account for why there was an accelerant in the, in the, in the, in the correctional center, which means that our facilities were tempered with. Therefore, we recommend this and this to take place. Would these people have been arrested before everything blew up, according to your investigation? Would you have asked SAPS to arrest them? Because clearly, there was a lot going on in that prison. I, th I think our findings, Honourable uh, Member, was shared with the with with SAPS on an ongoing basis. SAPS was aware that these individuals were being questioned by us and were, had been suspended and were going through a disciplinary hearing. They, they knew that. They had the information available. Um, I can't confirm, perhaps my, my colleagues can, whether SAPS in the intervening period uh, interviewed those individuals. I, I, I don't know. I need to defer to my colleagues. I cannot uh, confirm that um, the SAPS did investigate or had uh, contact with those people. All I can inform is, is that the SAPS had continuously engaged with us up until last week on the uh, circumstances of the incident. No, Chair, I think um, they did call because they, they cannot confirm anything at the moment. and. I don't know. I think, I don't know, Chair. <laughs> they, 
there's definitely um, something going on and I think as a committee we do need to take strict you recommendations after this and debate after but you thank you very much you, you can take it up uh, during deliberation sure. thank you very much honorable Yako honorable Chele thank you very much chairperson and also chair is is good afternoon to the members and our visitors our you minister closer to the our mic. ministers uh, chair good afternoon i just want to make follow up questions chair that i don't want to repeat but maybe i didn't get it clear uh, from Mr. Kubas and the team. I think the, the first one, Chair, we are being reported that when the CCTVs fail, um, there are personnel that are on site to also, not, not exactly um, if they might not be aware because the people who would be aware maybe are those who are on the control room. But you are saying to us, there are people who are always there to back up when such a situation happened. So on that day of the incident, were there officials uh, who were used as a backup and what happened to them, uh, or did, uh, yes, what happened to them? Because I think those officials should have given you information, or are these officials part of those that has been suspended? That is a follow-up question I have for now. Thank you, uh, Honourable Member. With regard to the people on site, um, Integritron, the service provider, provides people on a daily basis on site to oversee the security system. And that's why in our presentation you would have seen that the person that left that evening um, to sign off duty, just before he signed off duty at 19.30, visited the control room uh, ensured on the document in the control room indicating that all systems were in order, there was no problem with the systems. He then left um, and then if at night time there's a problem as uh, correctly identified by you by the members in uh, the control room, they will inform these people who's on standby who will immediately react and uh, come back to the center to rectify the problem. Thank you, Chair. Can I get the name of that person? His name is Tebojo. Um, I'm not 100% sure about how you pronounce this uh, uh, surname. Lipojo or something like that, ma'am. Mm. Okay. Chair? I'll come back to that one. The other question, follow-up question, how many single cells uh, do you have? Single ce cells, single. Yeah, on our member, um, we've got 17 cells, single cells. There's this uh, 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 inmate that was removed from cell 35. Uh, Chair, the, the question was, uh, is that why was he not taken to, in fact, the, the prisoner who was in cell 35, when did he request to be moved back to the normal cells? Honourable Member, I don't have the exact date, but I think the, the former Honourable Member has requested that we submit 
uh, uh, that document that is proving that he did oh. apply. I think from that document it can be deduced as to when did he apply. Okay. Immediately remove. Uh Your mic is off. Your mic is off. Was that application immediately uh, approved, as you indicated earlier? Issue of approval. Honourable Member, the, the request to be sent back to a normal unit, I don't have that information to say whether was it approved immediately or not, but my, my response in terms of immediate approval, I was responding to a question when Tabo Bester was initially applying. Okay, thank you, Shay. My apology, Shay. I keep on switching off this thing and it really disturbed me. I will never do it again. But <laughs> let me go back to uh, my own questions that I prepared for today. Uh, Chair, one is noting the report of the external comments regarding the MCC. Uh, indeed, good reports. A, a good report according to the quote that we have on page six of your, of your report. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, the judge of the Constitutional Court uh, extract that is quoted here, if maybe they knew about some of the information that is within this uh, center, they would have commented in, 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 in maybe differently in terms of this prison, even if it's beautiful, yes, we saw it and we appreciate that. It's beautiful and, 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 and there are lots of things that one really appreciate within the, that prison. We agree with that one. But what is happening inside, it is the one that worries us so much. So from uh, uh, that point, Chair, I'm going to say from here today, today from here, Chair, I'm going to take home with uh, one quote uh, by Mr. Hart Bailefeld. His quote, Chair, I quote, he says, a track report speaks. It is this unfortunate, this one in unfortunate incident. But Chair, I don't believe, I'm just going to take that quote for myself and remember it each time when I think about this situation and the report that we received today. I want to say that Chairperson, because uh, we are being reported, Chair, uh, that there are human errors. And I also believe that, Chair, even the, the, the day when those CCTV uh, happened not to be working, there was a human error, or there was a person who was working with those CCTVs. I'm not sure what uh, is going to be a comment on that one, but I want to pass to the question, Chair. We are being reported that uh, <laughs> Mr. Bester, Bester is coming back. <coughs> Chair, uh, all those arrangements are being done. We are hearing that from the Minister of Police and our, min our Minister that arrangements to make sure that Mr. Bester is coming back home. I just want to find out from uh, G4S team, what arrangements <laughs> uh, or the plans that you have now, currently, knowing very well that you are dealing with this intelligent, manipulative, a corny, uh, and a dangerous man preying on women, not just ordinary women, but the ones we as a country pride on and the ones that, without undermining others, that we think that are the cream of this country. What are your plans? Honorable member, at this stage, we did not receive any formal indication from uh, DCS to say 
uh, inmate best that will be coming back to our facility. Because as, as G4S, we don't have a say as to who or which inmate must come to the center or which inmate must leave the center. It is solely the, the, the mandate of the controller on site to decide which inmates must come in and which inmates must go out. Okay, thank Therefore, you. Therefore, we don't have a plan um, to, to accommodate best there. If it happens that he comes, they decide, the department decide that he comes back to his cell, what are you going to do? And it happens tomorrow. Honorable Bema, uh, based on the information that we will have received, th there's lots of processes that we can follow. It's either we will have to put an intelligence on him and try to monitor him very, very close as we do have resources and watch his movements around the center. Do we have to believe that which you are saying? Because it, 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 I should think that that's, that was your plan even before, knowing that you, the, we brought such a person in that center. Do we have to believe you what you are saying? Honorable member, please do believe me. There's lots of inmates okay, there with you. a very high profile thank that we are keeping much. in the center. It's 2,928. Very high profile inmates. Thank you very much. Chair, um, I just want to find out, Chair, uh, we have Mr. Kobas, who is a national director. We have two uh, directors who their works are very, very, your work is very important. Like, uh, let's take, for example, Mr. Munyani. You are responsible for uh, the facility, you are a center director. I believe that you are every day there. You're supposed to be there every day, or maybe you'll tell us if you're not there every day, both of you. Because uh, the other one, Mr. Hert, you are responsible for risk, uh, within risk, risk man management within the center. And I'm sure you understand the work that you are doing. Um, there's, 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 there's a somewhere where I'm going with this question. I want to know, do you are, you, are you always based in the center? Honorable member, no, because I do take vacation leave. I do experience some life challenges, uh, health challenges. I, I do take a vacation leave, and um, I don't work during the night shift. And uh, I do take the weekend off. Thank um, you. Depending Thank you very on much. the challenges that are coming, then I will not find myself I at the it. center. I, I, I get the idea. When you are not there, who is there on your behalf? I do have the deputy director, uh, Ms. Derek Dittlerk. Where was Mr. Derek Dittlerk on the day of the uh, incident? Both of you, one of you was, was, was present on. Yes, Honorable Chair, you will have realized on the slide when I have done the presentation is one of the people that has arrived at the scene, those early hours of the morning. No, I'm saying that time, at that time, who was the manager supposed to be the on-site operational manager? Or you don't have something like that? Honorable member, unless I don't understand the question, but how it works, during the night there is a senior official on duty whom we call the, uh, the night duty operations supervisor. Who's that one, the name? In, in, the case, in this case, it was Senue Matswara. Oh, the one that you talked about. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like to believe that you have a system of reporting, Mr. Kobas and your team, can, can you fashion this uh, or, or tell us today or how your, your, your reporting system goes? Uh, Honorable Chair, the, uh, my two colleagues who are intimately involved with the operations of, of the facility um, report uh, in the G4S line of command to uh, the director who's in charge of our Southern Africa operations. So these are operations across South Africa and Southern Africa countries, um, with the Mangung facility then being one of those um, 
one of those facilities or, or businesses that, that operate uh, or report into him. Um, sorry, sorry, Chair, can, can he raise the voice? I, I can't hear properly. Am I a bit soft? Yes, you're a bit okay. going down. Shall I start again? No, some of it I did hear. Okay. Some yes. Yeah, you can continue. So, so, so the, the facility reports to the, the, we refer to it as a cluster director. This is a person, a senior person within G4S who's responsible for the activities in, in Southern Africa. Obviously, South Africa, one of those countries, and the Mangung facility being one of those businesses um, accountable to him. That information flows on a continuous basis, and there's a lot of cooperation between colleagues in the Mangong facility uh, and, and, and that individual. If you ask specifically about me, I'm, I'm the commercial director for, for Africa, so I have a, a, an Africa remit um, dealing with commercial matters um, but pertaining to G4S's activities. Um, as I said this morning in my introduction, I'm also a director of G4S Care and Justice, which is one of the entities related to the the Mangung facility. So my apology, I'm, 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 I don't want to be rude. I think I got that one early in the morning. So I just wanted to find out exactly how do you get a report particularly from this team. But I, th I think I got that one. So uh, can I go, can I, can I get from, from them now? Because my time is short and the absolutely. person is going to kill me. With me. Can I find out their reports? I just want to hear the content, the deep in, uh, 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 issues of the report as to daily, do you report daily, hourly, monthly, quarterly, because I'm getting somewhere. Yes or no? Honourable member, um, in terms of the inmate behaviours, let's say there's an unusual behaviour that is happening in the centre. We are obliged by the contract to report to the controller on site one hour after the incident has happened. No, 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 no. I don't want the incident. I'm saying the reports in terms of the activities of, of the facility, because if, if there is something wrong within the facility, if the reports if are, are being done or are, uh, reporting is taking place, something will be, you'll find something along the way. Somebody who is going to report, uh, receive those reports will find something. So I want to know, do you report uh, do your officials, because if I'm saying report, not specifying exactly your report from the ground up to your level, to the level of the national, I want that system. Honourable Member, uh, possibly I can answer that. The reporting line is directly to the controller who's on site. Uh, there's daily reports being submitted to the controller on all activities at the centre on a daily basis. Uh, the controller in his case reporting to the national commissioner via the contract management office in Pretoria. So those, uh, uh, it means they, they do re receive those reports early, ev every day? Yes, there's a contractual obligation that if we're not supplying those reports, we will receive a notice and it will follow into a penalty if we've been found guilty on that. So it means within your reports, there must be a risk, some risk that you've noticed in terms of what is happening within the, the facility, especially from your site. The risk is not in, in, in the report. We've got a risk register that we manage in the centre, which is containing all the company risks that is, that is involved in that, and the operational risk, if it's like that. In this case, I can confirm that the investigation proved that up until this incident, there was no confirmation of misbehaviour on the side of Bester, there was no disciplinary offences registered against uh, Bester up until that point, and there was no information that was shared with us uh, prior to this incident from okay, Bester. Okay, but let me say about other reports within the centre. Did you report, did you get any reports in terms of how the, the, especially the, the, the I'm, I'm driving to the point of uh, the issues, complaints of the, the, the inmates and, and 
everything that is happening here in terms of how they are treated, how they are being, because I'm saying this because there's a report that I'm, I've read about that I want to know if the national office has received the report of 2013 about the beatings that are happening within the facilities, about the, I'm just, I'm passing, because about the, 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 the also the issue of the, the inmates being injected and all, I just want you to give us a small, I want to see if these reports, they do go to the places where they're supposed to go, so that you are able to mitigate some of the problems that we are facing today about these dangerous uh, 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 inmates. Do you get the report of the wrongdoings uh, within the, the facility as you're supposed to be receiving, Mr. Kobas? Because uh, I can see that from yes. that side, I can't get one. Let, let me answer that question, uh, Honorable Member. Information filters <coughs> through the organization like any other organization. The ma more material matters are raised to senior levels. So, for example, the report that you're referring to in 2013 is before my time, but that report would have gone to senior levels. There was a um, uh, uh, mention made earlier this morning about a, a Ruth Hopkins report. That report, being a, a, a controversial report and an important report, would have, would have gone through the channels. Where I sit on the VCC board, on a quarterly basis, I get informed of the material matters pertaining to, to um, to, to the facility, and, and I can assure you that when, when the incident was converted from the police from a, uh, a suicide to a murder, that information would have gone way beyond my level and would have gone to the international head office because that is a material development. Do you know if something was done about these things, those that were reported? You have 10 minutes. Honourable Member, I can. I want to know how do you deal with the whistleblowers within the centre. Mic is off. Off, oh. Sorry. In fact, this, these questions are taking me to the point of how do you deal with the whistleblowers? Because these people, they come and get this information of Pesta. You know it from you know some some of the wrongdoings there they might have been reported, because there are so many things that has been reported that you have never attended to. So how do you deal with the issue of the whistleblowers, people who are giving information as to the wrongs that are happening within the, 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 the facility? Honorable Member, what we are normally doing if we do get information from uh, inmates, we, we, we will do a, a document where we write our findings as well as our recommendation and then we'll take that document and submit to the controller on site uh, where we'll normally recommend that either the inmate must receive either 12 months remission of sentence or whatever that that document of DCS is giving to say for divulging information the inmate can receive either between one, th one month and three months or between three months and six months. Okay, I have only 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. There are names, you are, you, you are saying there are people who are suspended. They are seven. The three ones, they, they, they are seven, we don't know about the four, but are these, I, I, I should think, uh, is Mr. Tsuwane Tsunohe and Mr. Johnson, uh, Ms. Johnson Ma, Maboots, and also Mr. Mabuza among those people? Honorable Member, that's the three people that's already been dismissed. Sanoi, Janssen. Are the only people that uh, in, in all that happened uh, in this best saga that are being responsible or being found having committed wrong on this? Honorable Member, remember, as we said earlier today, those are the three members whose actions are not in a uh, in accordance with their duties and with the policies and procedures. So we therefore question their motives on that evening, and for that reason, we've dismissed them. It's also one of the reasons why SAPS uh, arrested one of them uh, in, in, in the last few days. Then we mentioned earlier today that 
pertaining to the the Sally Port incident where the vehicle passed into the facility back in in April 20 April 2022 um, seven members have to date been suspended whilst that investigation is is ongoing I, I hope uh, I've answered your question thank you very much I've got names here I want you to tell me who are these people and what is their uh, 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 duty at work and where were these people when all this was happening and uh, if possible why are these people not uh, suspended or fired one i have john i don't know is koklai or is c o a n g l a e who is this person that is number one tell this house number two i have somebody by the name of anike lekhranje who is this person? What is he doing? And and also I have this person, Aida. All of these people are part of your team uh, in the center. And the only people that has been suspended or fired or being found ro doing wrong, there are only three there. The one that you have uh, spoken about. So my question, which is the question before the last one, is that why is it uh, only, I'm going to be very controversial with this one, Chair, why are we only having those three blacks when we have these others who are not blacks, who are part of that? I'm sorry, Chair, to be controversial, but I'm, I just want to say it. Are you G4S racist? Honourable uh, member, the, no, we are not. You are not? No, we are not. Okay. Can I hear from you? Why only three people and blacks for that matter, when there are other people who are managers? I'm t I'll tell you because it seems as if you don't want to tell me who are those people. Number one, we have Aida, who is a security supervisor, and he must be knowing who said that uh, big the car must get inside, he must be having a report, but you don't have a report here about that secu a security a supervisor. We have this Lekhranche, who is an operational manager. I am telling you because you, are not, you, you don't want to tell me. And I want to know what is this Lekhranche as an operational manager? What is the report of that person? Because he's a manager, he must take accountability of what, is, what was happening there. And I've got this, uh, this, uh, this, this John, who was there on that day? Because this is the report that we got when we arrived in Bufontein, that this, this, this person was part of that. And these people are not, uh, 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 <laughs> the reason why I'm saying are you a racist is because they are white and they, they were responsible. They're supposed to be part of the uh, 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 people who have given the responsibility and accountable for all these things that we are talking about today. Uh, Chair, uh, for the last question, can they give us the answer on that one? Sorry. Okay. You are left with three minutes. Oh. Honourable Member, can I answer you quickly? Aida is the newly appointed supervisor after Sonoy was dismissed. It's a, a lady um, that's working for us. She was not working as the uh, supervisor at the date of the incident. Then Hong Hui was the person that worked in Broadway the night of the incident, and he reported all the information to us. The investigation did not prove any involvement, and therefore he was not suspended, nor was a disciplinary action against him. And the same with Anna Kalegrantsi, the operations uh, manager. This John, is this John who uh, left immediately before the, uh, uh, the incident happened. That's correct, Madam, but he didn't, um, Honorable Member, he didn't uh, leave. He was instructed by the supervisor, and that formed part of the supervisor's uh, disciplinary action, why he instructed this person to leave his position to attend to a medical emergency. The same supervisor who allowed the car to come in and removed the person who was refusing to give those people permission to get in? 
No, um, Honourable Member, that supervisor is the one that's currently being detained by the SAPS, who was involved in the situation on both occasions, on the 29th as well as on the 2nd and 3rd of May that night. This Aniki Lechrant, you are saying, is a new person? No, she's not a new person. She's been in a long, a long time in the position as operations manager. Ida is the new person. No, th uh, but uh, uh, this Lechrant, you're saying, is an is a operational manager? That's correct. So I'm remember. saying, where was she also? Because they are, once we're dealing with these operations, they... <coughs> She was not on duty during that incident. She, uh, the person that was on duty in the incident that was in charge was uh, Senoi. Why do you think is <laughs> a coincidence that these people, they decided to leave, uh, they, they, they not be in, in duty on that day, they left earlier before the whole thing, the real thing happened? Um, Madam Chair, um, oh, Mar uh, sorry, um, Honourable Member, uh, that person did not leave. There's a shift pattern according to which people work, and it, wa it wasn't those people that had to be on shift. The night shift people was on shift when this incident happened, which was 23 of them, under the supervision um, of Mr. Senoy, um, that's currently being dismissed. And because if you look at this thing, it was not, ha it, it did not happen uh, like a, it, it, was, it was planned, we all agree now, that it was a plan. It was a plan. Because of the shift that we have, you know, it takes me to the question of uh, Honorable, Honorable Yako, that uh, are you saying for example, you, 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 you are not supposed to have been Honourable investigated yourself as, as the people who are responsible for the centre. Chair, my last question is that, plus the one that I've asked. My last question is, it goes to Mr. Kobas. Mr. Kobas, after all that has been said in this house, are you still denying that you have failed DCS as your con a person who con you are contracted, contracted with, and also the government of this country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Honourable Member, I'm, I'm not denying, and I, I can't recall that I have denied that, that, we, have, that we have not failed. Uh, it's clear that this was a very, very carefully orchestrated uh, plan of BESTA to, to break out of, of MCC. Um, and it is clear that we have indicated to the police those members whose actions on that night we cannot reconcile. And we've given those, number, those names to the police. And I think for me, the fact that the police recently ac uh, invest, um, arrested one of them, based amongst others on information that we provided is testament to the fact that we have cooperated throughout. Um, it also proves that certain of our members may have been, well, we know at least one was involved in, in the incident that evening. I hope I've answered your question. You mean only no. those no. three black no. No. people? No. Thank no. you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Swart. Thank you very much. Um, just following on with my colleagues' questions, the, a lot has uh, gone around the role of Integrity Tron and the issue around the cameras. Have you received any feedback from them as to the, um, the involvement of their technician that night, um, where the technician indicated when he went off duty, everything was working. Um, I don't know who answered that question. Have you received uh, a uh, subcontract of duty? Honorable Swart, your yes. voice is too soft today. I don't know why. The voice is too soft. Yes. Did you hear me now? Yeah. I just want to find out whether you've received any information from them relating to their investigations as to their technician. 
Honourable Member, no. I, I, I did not receive any feedback from them as yet on any investigation conducted by them. I understand the, uh, the affidavit that there was a polygraph test done on one of their technicians, and I'm sure we will deal with that at a later stage, um, where that technician failed the polygraph test. Um, just to then move across what, what, what the, the notorious cell 35, we were there last week, and if you look at the corridor, besides the cameras that were not working, there's an official posted there in the middle of the corridor, there's an official. So what happened to that official that night? Was he there? Has he been investigated? Because besides the camera, which obviously you, you couldn't see, I looked myself, you couldn't see what was going on there. But there is an official there on night you do his in that position. Where was he that night? Honourable Member, um, that employee is the one that was requested by the previous committee member, Hong Huai. He was removed by the supervisor, Senoy, that night, and he has sent him to a medical emergency in one of the other living units in Waltz to attend to the, uh, the um, medical emergency there. That did form part of the disciplinary uh, procedure against Senoy, which led to his dismissal because he removed uh, employees from single positions, which he was not allowed to do within the policies and procedures. So the cell 35, which we know is at the right-hand side looking down, and the emergency exit is below that, which can only be controlled by the control room, who are watching with cameras, but they're also the only ones that can open the emergency and the cell door, is that correct? That's correct. So the control room, and those were the two control room uh, people that have been suspended and dismissed, is that correct? 100% correct. And they will be facing criminal action as well, one presumes? We've reported that to the SAP uh, as well, uh, their actions, and we've given them all the documentation and the records that was kept in the control room. Yes, Honourable Woman. When was Mr. Bester admitted to the facility? Roundabout, yeah? Uh, at, at, um, not 100% correct. I think it was 24 October 2014 or 13. I might, might be wrong with the year. 2013. Yes. I think 13, 14. Um, I might be incorrect with that. I can come back with an exact date. So he's been around the prison for a long time. People know him. Is that what you, wardens would know him in the facility? He's been around there for almost eight, nine years. That's correct. And yet he's able to allegedly conduct a business from prison. Is that not deeply concerning? Does the G4S, are you aware of all the allegations around him running a business and has any investigation been done into that? Uh, Honourable Member, maybe I can answer that one. We are aware of the allegations. We have no evidence available to us that that in fact took place. Sorry, Mr. Krinovot, there is more than enough evidence. If you go on Facebook, if you can see videos of Mr. Bester addressing a launch conference where he's supposed to be in prison, are you aware of that? I've, I've not seen that video. But that's highly and irresponsible, I put it to you, sir. And, and if, the, if the suggestion is that it's from New York, then I, I, I cannot no, fathom the how picture, that is possible. No, the picture, it's very easy to ascertain whether that person who purports to be someone from New York, one can ascertain and do an investigation into that. I'm, I'm perturbed that it, you seem to bear no knowledge of it or you're not concerned about it. In do you have any response to that? I am concerned about yeah. that. Uh, that no action has been taken at all in that regard. We've not been able to substantiate those facts. Have you taken no, any steps at all to substantiate that? Not to my knowledge. Well, that's inexcusable. So, the Honorable Swart, I mean, given your responses, why should the country vest its security in your hands? Given your responses, because it's either you are seriously incompetent or you do not care. 
Uh, Honourable Chair, it's not, the, it's not the case that we don't care. Um, I think... So if you don't care, we're incompetent. I think if you look back at our track record over the last almost 22 years, I think we have a very good track record. Now, leave the track record aside, but a company of your magnitude failing to answer this question asked by Honorable Swart, would anybody listening take that company seriously? Honorable Chair, the best I can answer that question is to say that there are many allegations in social media, and the substance of what one sees nowadays in social media is very difficult to determine. Uh, we, we cannot, we cannot um, investigate each and every social media allegation. Mr. So Krunovart. you leave some of them. Mr. Krunovart, given the outrage of the public about this incident, surely, surely, when you read media reports or whatever, you would have, and given the fact that you sit on the board and given the fact that you indicated earlier this would have international repercussions, Surely, it would have had some attention from you. This is very serious. It goes to the heart of the reputation of your company. But I can understand that you are unable to give a satisfactory explanation for that. But one can presume that it causes, an, well, it causes an uproar amongst the average South African and amongst us as well. I'm sure you'll agree with that. Can I just ask you then, back to the cell, and back to the fact that Mr. Bester was admitted in 2013. He's probably well known. He's been there almost eight years. How tall was Mr. Bester? Do you know, offhand? Was he tall? Would you know how tall he is? He's a tall person, is, would you say? I didn't work with Mr. Bester myself, so I cannot answer that question, but I can look into the records at the center where all this information is well, available. Apparently he's 1.7 meters tall. How long was the body that was found in the cell? Do you have any idea? I saw the length on the report that we what received. What was that? Uh, we, the report that we received from Jigs yes. on, on the 2nd of February, and uh, I think the length there, if I um, don't misinterpret it, is 1.49, 1.48. 1 1.45. There's a big difference between 1.7 meters and 1.45 meters. So at first glance, the warders that came to that cell would have known that the person that is burnt there was highly unlikely to have been Mr. Bester. Would you agree with that? Given the fact that Mr. Best is 1.7 meters, according to your own records, check them, and the body was 1.45 meters. Do you not agree, given the fact that he's been around, he's a tall person, here you have a very short body that is there. Surely it should have raised suspicions immediately. Can anyone explain that? Honourable Member, my understanding, and again, I did not see these, these photographs, but my understanding is that the body, uh, once the cell was opened, and until the pathologists arrived, was covered in um, fire extinguisher residue. So at that stage, when the police arrived and investigated the scene and eventually removed the body, uh, I don't think it's possible that our wardens, other than extinguishing the fire and then sealing the, the cell, was able to make that kind of assessment. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but it does raise questions as well, I'm sure. Um, had one, one doesn't know exactly the chain of events where the body was taken, but there's a big difference between 1.7, you're looking at a significant difference, but it does raise questions. Can I then just ask, um, Mr. Krunovot, you, you've painted, and in your report, you've painted a glowing picture of the facility, and we visited, and it is an impressive facility. But take us back to 2013, when the prison was placed under administration. You'll recall that. I don't know if you were there then. 
No, Honourable Member. But the prison was placed under yes. administration due to unrest. Uh, a warder was taken hostage. What are the implications of a prison being a pri of the private prison being placed under administration? My, my un uh, understanding, Honourable Member, is that in terms of Section 112 of the Correctional Services Act, um, the government can step in and take control of a prison if it believes that a, an operator has, has lost control of the prison. My understanding of the facts at the time was that there was an illegal strike. Um, we, my understanding is we, we, the prison went into lockdown mode. We were still able to staff the prison based on minimum staff levels. However, it was felt that we were not in control of the, the prison and section 112 was invoked. Now, there's an assertion that that section has been or may be invoked again. Obviously, that has dramatic implications on the companies involved as well. Would you agree? Yes, I do. And I can confirm that Section 112 has again been invoked. And you're busy with litigation in that regard, I presume, as well? We have written, our legal advisors, uh, Honourable Member, have written to the Department to say that we do not agree with the fact that we have lost uh, control of the prison. We can only assume that the, the actions in, in, in March of this year to suggest that we lost control of the prison goes back to the events of May last year. But would you not agree, given everything that you've said and all the concessions you've made about uh, this was a very carefully orchestrated plan for someone to escape, that it does indicate that that decision was warranted? Honourable Member, that's, that's to be debated. I think if one had to draw, and, and I don't want to make this comparison, but I think it's important to look at the numbers. If one had to look at the number of escapes from, from MCC over the last 20 years, 21 years, in, in July almost 22 years, and one were to apply that ratio to the total inmate population, uh, it, 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 correction, if you had to apply that to the DCS statistics, then by now we should have suffered around 20 to 21 escapes. And I don't want to draw that anal uh, analogy, but I think on that basis, the very few escapes we've had is a record to be, to be proud of. Having said that, each and every escape is a serious matter. Can I just ask you, uh, Mr. Krunovot, given the f complicity of so many wardens in this matter, and as it's ongoing, it seems to be more and more that would seem to me to vindicate a decision that the company has lost control of the, of the facility. This is not just an isolated escape. This is a carefully planned escape with a lot of money being paid off, which seems to vindicate that. But can I just ask you, for every escape, is, is, is the company penalized? Is there a financial penalty? Yes, there is a penalty. What um, is the financial penalty? There is a penalty. penalty. I think Mr. Bailefeld can help me on the, on the amount. Currently, the penalty is just under one million rand. One million, one million rand, rand per escape. So obviously, it's in your best interests that an incident like this should rather be seen as a suicide as opposed to an escape, because there's a financial benefit. Do you not agree? If I can answer, honorable uh, member, it, there's no difference in between the penalty for a suicide if negligence is proved nor is the, uh, on the escape, the penalty stays exactly the same. But I find it astounding that the, that the company has continued to hold the view that this was a suicide, despite the meetings with various state organizations. By the way, can I just ask you, when did you um, first hear of the High Court application that was brought for the obtaining of the body in Gauteng, the June 2022 application? that contained the post-mortem report? You meet in with police on a regular basis. Surely someone would have mentioned that to you? Did you were you aware of that court case, any of you? It and if so, when? It was not mentioned to me during my discussions with the ECB, sir. Were any of you aware of that court case? No, Honorable Chair, I remember. Because I noticed that you had meetings with SAPs, with JICs, subsequent to that court case, and I find it uh, I take your word for it, amazing that that was not raised, because that was in June 2022 already, where the 
affidavit was available, the post-mortem was available, which clearly indicated it could not have been Mr. Bester. It could not have been Mr. Bester. Firstly, there was no smoke in the lungs. The other issues that are raised there as well in that post-mortem report that he was killed by a blunt instrument. There were other issues there, and I would think that that is very important. So at what stage was the first time that you were, became aware of the High Court, um, the High Court application? Honourable Chair, I can't recall the exact date, but it was it, it was recently that I that I became aware of that of that application. I just want to get back to the section one one two because obviously um, there are financial implications. We appreciate. I, I've been around a long time. I was here in 1999 when all those contracts were signed and everyone supported it. They thought it's a good idea, but it's obviously for profit. Let's face it; it's about making a profit. So the section 112 in 2013, it cost the company, is that correct? There's litigation ongoing at the moment about that. That's correct. How uh, much is involved in that litigation? I believe the number is around 110 million rand. 110 million rand. Correct, yes. So to have another section 112 imposed on you now could have severe financial implications. You'd agree with that? I do. And so in, from your side, would it be incorrect to assume that you'd do everything to cover up as possible up to now well, from a, an objective outsider? Because there's a financial incentive here to protect and make sure that you don't have a section 112 imposed. Uh, cover up what exactly, honorable member, if I may ask? To cover up what happened in the prison. Honorable member, if we had the intention to cover up what happened in the prison, we would not, on the morning of the 3rd of May, immediately have uh, called the police to the, to the facility, and we would not... But that was a suicide, a fire in a cell, a very innocent explanation that you continued with for many, many months, and it's only in the recent past that it's now come out when you say that we've now... Uh, it's been brought to your attention that it is now a murder, and not a suicide in only in the last when last few months in March only is yes, that correct? And, I, and, I, and I believe I, I addressed that earlier on when I said that initially there was a suicide and SAPS agreed with us on the 25th of May last year they told us that they're now investigating based on the pathology report um, uh, a murder we asked for the pathology report as I said in on the 1st of July 2022 that was not provided to us we continue to engage with the authorities, and only, I believe, um, in, the, in the, the SAPS report dated the 4th of April to this committee did we become, did we become aware that a case of escape had, had been opened. Prior to that, Jix did mention to us, I believe it was during the meeting of the 2nd of February, that they were investigating a possible um, escape. But we received no evidence of that. The wardens and officials that are at the private facility uh, uh, are paid well in, when compared to their compatriots across the road. Would you agree with that? I think Mr. Uh, Monyante or Bailefeld would be better what, to answer Are that. they paid more than their colleagues? Or would you say the same, or does it vary? Honourable member, I will say it vary, but it's more or less the same on certain levels, but there could be one of the other levels that's a little bit higher. Um, while I'm on, 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 on uh, the opportunity to uh, address you quickly is, I remember that on the 5th of May, we requested SAPS to come back. So if we wanted to hide something, when the accelerant was found, we wouldn't have informed the SAP to come back if there was a possibility of hiding information. Well, at that stage, you were certain that it was a suicide. If you look at all the circumstances around, the, all the coincidences, and at, what, at whatever level, where even our, the Honourable Minister indicates that the, at least the night staff seem to have a very close conspiracy, but as you are investigating, it's, it's getting broader and broader and broader. The conspiracy 
to achieve this remarkable escape, not only an escape, but the person is then declared and thought to be dead. It's a, quite a remarkable achievement from his perspective. Nobody would be looking for him at all. And you don't have to report an escape with, I can understand the financial penalties might be the same between a suicide and an escape, but an escape is far worse for your reputation. I'm sure you'll agree with that, Mr. Krunovat. I will agree with that. Uh, you have 10 remember. minutes. I'm just starting. In <laughs> 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 uh, 10 minutes is starting. 10 minutes is starting. <laughs> I, Mr. Krunovat, um, you indicated that you've cooperated co comprehensively with all the institutions involved. The DCS is concerned because according to them, the outcome of your investigation was not provided to DCS until 31st of March, despite their formal requests to obtain it. So there doesn't seem to be that close cooperation. How would you comment ab about that? And why was the, your report only given to them? The 31st of March and this last week seems to be a, a, a great hive of activity for everyone. Uh, Honourable Member, the, the investigation that we conducted, all the relevant information was shared with DCS. It's the report that was only given to them on the 31st of March, correction, 31st of January. The reason why we delayed the report itself, notwithstanding the, DS, the DCS having access to all the information, was we wanted the DCS to conduct an independent investigation and arrive at their own conclusions. Secondly, we were busy with um, labor matters. We were busy taking action against members of our staff who, had we, who we had dismissed, uh, as it was reported earlier today. Those dismissals have been taken or have been filed with the CCMA, and we did not want to prejudice those processes. I'm trying to understand the relationship between you and you, you the, in terms of the contracts, and we, we are aware that the DCS alleges a, a broad number of contract breaches, which has led to the Section 112, which you would obviously uh, dispute. But according to DCS, they requested these reports, and it was not forthcoming. And are you saying it was purely for these reasons of disciplinary actions? To my knowledge, that was the reason. Um, but but those, as I say, sorry, those disciplinary actions you've indicated are ongoing. The CCMA matters, so that doesn't quite make sense to me because um, they, you know, they could go on for years. How, how would we, that impact? We were obliged to give the report to JIX as well at the start of February 2022, which was two days after the date we gave the report from memory to to DCS, and for that reason we decided to disclose the report at, uh, to DCS at that stage, although ideally we would not have wanted to do, that, to do, do, to do so. Do you mind if I just ask you the, the uh, approval, and I'm sorry I'm jumping around, I've got such limited time, um, the approval of Mr. Bester to go to Broadway. Now, DCS says there was no approval given for that. You indicated and I noticed the wording that was used carefully. You kept on saying he applied, then he withdrew his application, he applied on the 15th of April, he withdrew the application, he applied again, and then he was moved. But was approval granted by the CSC at the time of him being moved, or do you do it where it, what, what is the explanation for that? Mr. Bailefeld can answer that uh, yes. question. Um, Honorable member, he was, uh, that it was at the night of the 30th, and that approval was sent via WhatsApp to the controller um, that was responsible that night as a um, person on, on, on standby, and he replied back on WhatsApp to the duty director that he can uh, go ahead. So that's a point of dispute between you and DCS, I presume. I'm just trying to understand the perimeter security at the night, because now somehow Bester got out. Was that fully operational? What type of security? Do you have cameras? Could, how, how would, and I understand for uh, many months you thought that Best had passed away, but he escaped somehow. 
Now, was the perimeter security operating fully that night that you were aware, besides the cameras that went down, the perimeter? Uh, there's no reports that could have been obtained during the investigation that prove otherwise, as only those cameras. Um, and that's uh, the reason why we acted against the three employees that was in, uh, responsible for the uh, perimeter, which is Sanoi, uh, and the two people in the CCR on a number. I'm trying to understand, besides the cameras, but surely you have other perimeter security as well, besides just the cameras. Because one of the allegations of DCS is that the contractor failed to monitor perimeter security, which led to the aided escape. Um, we've got other um, systems in place um, on the, the perimeters, but that, that was not reported and it didn't come out in our, in our own investigation. Was that it that was all operating that evening? That was fully operating that evening, according to all the investigation information that we could have obtained. So there are a number of allegations, and I do appreciate that these are from the DCS's perspective. But what I find difficult to understand as well is how a cell 35, the fire, could have started in that cell. And we asked this question earlier, and we were advised that there's no smoke detectors and that you rely on human warning for smoke, for fire, surely that is a great deficiency. Um, is there any explanation as to how an accelerant arrived in that cell, 35? Unfortunately, that could not have been determined. Um, without, uh, currently, one can say in hindsight, without the information of Bester, where this came from, um, the person that was that night on duty, Sanoi, is already being dismissed. Um, and uh, in that investigation, it could not be obtained specifically how that accelerant came into the center. And then, uh, just lastly, I know I'm running out of time, but that issue about the, 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 the desk, or the TV cabinet. Maria uh, Bailefeld, you spoke about it. Was it a TV cabinet? It's a, a TV cabinet, a standing TV cabinet with uh, drawers here. That has been standing there, that came in and has been standing there since the incident, and it is now in the possession of the police. Is that correct? That's correct. It was in our position up until the weekend when the SAPS came uh, to do a forensic investigation. And in accordance, I wasn't at the center, but I was informed that the um, cabinet has been um, taken away by the SAP. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I just concluding, uh, and I think you've, you've made a number of concessions during our questioning that this was a very carefully planned, very carefully planned operation with the cooperation of a number of wardens that has been um, further investigated. But I think had GCS taken greater care from the word go, or maybe a month or two subsequently, this whole incident would have come to light a lot earlier and that it was damaging to your reputation and damaging to your finances that one could conclude resulted in you maybe not being as forthcoming with the information as you could have been. And it is only as a result of journalists that have investigated this that it has now come to light. And we owe them a great debt of gratitude so we, 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 we just wanted to express that, Chair. So that will be all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Swart. Um, Honorable Horn, you have 15 minutes. The other 15 minutes was taken by, yes. Oh, no, I thought, I thought you did not raise your hand. Uh, Honor Honorable, 
wir mal noch äh, äh, drücken. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm not, um, well, good afternoon, first of all, to everyone. I'm not going to go back to my own questions, but I do have some follow-ups of what other members have asked, which I wanted clarity to understand better. Firstly, I wanted to know who is the current controller there right now? Is it the same controller that was there during the time of the fire? Honourable Member, um, the controller that is currently on site is not the controller that was there during the incident. So the one that was there during the time of the incident, where is the controller, that controller right now? Honourable Member, from the discussion or the information that was shared with me and the national commissioner is that they will be suspended uh, from from mcc i'm not sure currently where they are okay so they will be you said they will be right okay then secondly you said 17 you've got single 17 single cells now, I just want to understand why was cell 35 specifically allocated to BESTA during that time? And are the 17 that you have normally full? Um, Honorable Member, can I just rectify that it's not 17, it's 70. Seven zero. Okay, seventy. Yes, and are all of them normally filled, um, singly? Um, I can't confirm that out of um, my head. If everyone was filled at that night, there is sometimes that it's filled, and there's sometimes that it's not filled. Okay. The reason why I'm specifically asking that is because Bester was specifically taken to a cell close to an emergency ex exit. So that is why I'm asking if during that time all of them were full. But uh, be that as it may, then um, just with regards to jigs, this is an unnatural death. So whether it was a suicide or whether it was by fire, whatever the case might be, be, it was unnatural. But Jiggs was only informed six days later. Now I'd like to know why it took some time before Jiggs was notified specifically that this was an unnatural death that occurred. Honorable Member, um, to answer that question is that we report to the controller the controller on site is the reporting line to the National Commissioner's Office as well as to the JIG's office. And therefore, I cannot say why it was only reported six days later. It was immediately on the same day reported to the controller's office. So you yourself do not know why it wasn't immediately reported to JIGS, even though, as you said all the while, that you have a good ongoing relationship with JIGS themselves? We do have a good relationship with JIGS, um, but I can unfortunately not say why it was only reported on the 6. Okay. Um, Honourable Swart asked the question of when Bester first entered the prison, and you said it was around 2013. Now, does that mean that the customary wife was already there in 2013, noted as the next of kin? Because you said that his personal possessions, when he entered, was given to the next of kin when he was, you know, the things that he handed over when he was entered into the center. So was the customary wife already there noted as the next of kin? Honorable member, just a correction, I've indicated that the uncle was the next of kin on his reporting, but 
we could not obtain uh, contact with the uncle, so that's why we've obtained contact with uh, this, uh, Dr. Ndipa. But was it was it in two, when when was it that you couldn't find the uncle? That was to inform the person of. Um, as at that point in time, they reported uh, by the death certificate the death of inmate Bester. Okay, no, no, no. So I'm not talking about the time of his death, right? Because okay, so I'm talking about the time that he came in 2013. You said that the things he brought into prison, was that then already given to the next of kin at that time? So I'm asking, that's why I'm asking if the customary wife was recorded as the next of kin. Now, um, a, a correction again, the um, stuff that was handed over to the next of kin was after the um, so-called inmate death of Bester, and that was, I remember my colleague indicated that there was two sets, the one set that came from the cell, that all was handed to the SAPS, and then the rest that was kept in the, in, in, uh, in the admission store, where inmate uh, belongings are kept, uh, which is not allowed with them, that was handed to the doctor in depot. Okay, one more last question, Chair, or last thing. I wanted to get back to the laptop, because like I think it was Honorable uh, Jelly who said, you know, we, we saw on TV, for example, last week, that, he was chasing women on Facebook, and he lured women on Facebook. So, which then means that he's a social media expert, obviously. Doesn't matter what you say, that he was registered to study, I'm still, I still cannot see the connection or, or get the understanding how a person who lured women to become his victims on Facebook using a cell phone or a laptop, why was he given a device that enabled him to, I mean, have meetings, have international meetings, maybe to lure a woman while he was in prison, for all we know, because you do not know what he did with that laptop. So I just wanted to understand why he was given a device that could enable him to still lure women on Facebook. Yes, you said there's a court case, etc., etc. but I mean, if he used Facebook to lure women, and women have been hurt, families of the victims have been hurt, you still give him a device. Authorized, unauthorized, it doesn't matter, both. You know, I just wanna know why that was done. Honorable member, when we um, approved the issue of the laptop, our objective was to ensure that the inmate is also being rehabilitated. And I also want to indicate that we don't treat inmates differently based on the crimes that they have committed at MCC. All inmates that are incarcerated in that center, we see them as human beings and we try our level best to treat them uh, according to what they are entitled to. Our objective has never been to promote whatever wrong things that Bester has done with the, the woman when, when he was committing the crime. Our sole objective was to ensure that he, he do get rehabilitation and uh, we, we, we committed ourselves to provide whatever tools that he was entitled to as per the court ruling that we have referred to. I hope that you understand and uh, you are aware that the people of South Africa is watching this hearing meeting or you know that we are having and the women of South Africa who are affected by him are hearing what you're saying that it doesn't matter what his crime was we gave him a device to continue doing what he was doing I think you as G4S uh, you as G4S I I would have expected that you you know, it doesn't matter what the crime was. It doesn't matter how the crime was committed. Making sure that if a person is in prison, the people outside are safe. But I think, 
I can see that this has failed. And I'm very sorry to say this, Chair, because they haven't investigated, or if they're still going to investigate, I think there's a lot of things that people have been telling us up to now. I think the risk and audit here really failed the women of South Africa. Thank you, that's all, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Nevoort Tuchen. Honorable Hon, 15 minutes, not 30, 50. Yes, no, thank you, Chair. I'm well aware of the expropriation that took place. Um, without compensation, and, and not even from an ANC member. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to pick up on, on the, the uh, answer to the No, that's fine. Sorry. Um, uh, I just want to pick up on, on a question or an answer to a question asked by the Honorable Nivo Drachen just now. Is it your, um, uh, your uh, do you confirm that as we sit here today, you're not aware whether all 70 of the single cells was in use on the night of the incident? I will be gossiping if I agree to that. Yeah. Um, so, so the question is then, I mean, a lot has been said about your own investigation focusing on systems and possible failure of, of, of your personnel and uh, the possible involvement of your, of your staff in this grand scheme. Wouldn't you agree that it's critical, given the strategic situation of cell 35, to determine as part of an investigation whether cell 35 was the only option left or was chosen? That was addressed and it was confirmed by the uh, person in charge of Broadway on the specific day of the 30th that there was no reason that was the empty cell and that's why he placed um, inmate bestie in that cell. Yeah, but I would think for the investigation to be complete, one must uh, ascertain whether that was the only empty cell. But, but let me move on. Was it then, as, as the inv investigation intensified, was it from your side double-checked with the inmate who cancelled these requests to be kept in isolation, whether that was indeed done voluntarily? No, it was not ascertained. Mm. So even though you say, um, as things unfolded and as SAPs uh, uh, leveled this up from suicide to murder and uh, as other entities ramped up their investigations, there's clearly st still big loopholes in terms of your focus, which you say is only on looking into your own systems. We, we had a look at the documentation available mm. um, on the inmate that requested to leave the cell and there was no indications that he was forced or that he was indicated to um, for one other reason, to complete the document to say he wants to leave that cell. If he was removed within the center, it would have, in the unit itself, it would have most probably raised alarms, but the fact that he requested to go back to normal population did not raise any alarms. So how would you see coercion or intimidation based on a document? You say from the document itself, there was no indication that it was not voluntary. In hindsight, one can uh, look at this and ask a number of questions. During the investigation, when it was conducted to look at the actions of the employees that was involved, that be didn't become evident and didn't need at that point in time to me as the investigator any further action on that sp uh, specific power. Okay. Let me move on to, to the approval of applications to be pro, uh, placed in isolation. Uh, is there a, a document that must be filled in in order for this to be finalized? That's correct, Honorable Member. And how often does it happen th that this document is not used but yet somebody is placed in isolation? Honourable Member, according to my knowledge, I haven't experienced such because after the inmate has applied, we take that documentation, we give it to the controller's office, 
where they will capture the information on their computer system and then the printout that we get and put it on the door. So I haven't come across a case where the inmate was kept in the single cell without paperwork. So they Honorable Member, if you allow me just to um, yeah. explain a little bit further, uh, one should consider that the centre is on a daily monitoring by the Department of Correctional Services Controller and Deputy Controller and these two uh, people from JICS ICCV visitors on a daily basis at the centre du uh, over during weeks and they are regularly monitoring the Broadway section to ensure that it's not misused. Okay. But on your own version then, there, there was no consent from DCS to move Tabu Bester to isolation. Oh, now remember our version is that there was, a, there was an approval that is the approval we are referring to when you talk about the the um, the WhatsApp message that was there between the the, the 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 duty director as well as the controller that was on standby that evening. But you just now said that there is a form involved, and according to your uh, your understanding of how processes are adhered to within the centre, the form is always used. That's correct, Honourable Member, because before the duty director contacts the controller that is on standby, he or she will have been informed by the application from the inmate. That's why the duty director will call the controller that is on standby and say, I'm sitting here with the form where the inmate is requesting to be kept in single cells. Okay, and, and uh, WhatsApp is, of course, something that's backed up and which one then can extract from uh, to a text level from cellular phones and databases have you as part of your investigation verified the existence of that whatsapp yes it's correct it's available will you then provide that to us we will provide it thank you um, i move on to the role of the controller and the deputy controller um, in a typical annual year, how many uh, observation no notices, or I think as DCS uh, calls it, citations, are issued by the controllers in the uh, the controlling of the controller office at MCC? Uh, since the incident, we've received three um, notices from the office of the controller. The one was with regard to a psychologist that has resigned and the document did not reach the controller within 72 hours according to his interpretation. The second one was an escape um, from the hospital on the outside, uh, which was discussed earlier. And then the last one was the vehicle that went in with a gate pass. That's the three that was received. And be, uh, let's say before the, the incident, how many typically in a year? Um, the previous year there was also three uh, issued. Mm. Okay. And is it so that towards the end of the tenure of the previous National Commissioner of Correctional Services, uh, G4S complained to the previous National Commissioner that they were um, inundated with violation notices by the then deputy controller who acted as the controller. I've got no knowledge of that. I can't comment on that. Were you, th were you there at the time? I'm at the center for 22 years. Yes, on the morning. So, um, can you confirm whether the previous national commissioner visited the center just before his contract came to an end? Honourable Member, if, if I understand your question, you, you, are you referring to um, uh, Mr. Fraser? Yes. Yes, I can confirm that on his last day, because I'm the one that welcomed him with the team. He did visit the, the centre. So on his very last day in office, he visited the centre? That's correct, Honourable Member. Mm. And is it correct to say that the Deputy Controller, because I understand there was at that stage not a controller, was subsequently then moved by DCS in a lateral manner without a disciplinary hearing. 
Honourable Member, I really cannot confirm on that. On that. But you were there. Surely you know whether the controller was replaced, the Deputy Controller, after Mr. Fraser's visit? Yes, I do know, uh, Honourable Member, but the reasons that informed that decision okay. were not shared with but me. But you confirm they, they, uh, after that visit there was a new controller and Deputy Controller in place? That's correct, Honourable okay. Member, because I know that the former controller has um, gone on pension and the post was advertised because I saw the advert. Okay. And I took it for that the newly appointed uh, controller went through this application process, but I can really not commit myself to that. That's my assumption. And was it that deputy controller and new deputy, well, new uh, controller and the deputy controller who came there after the visit of Mr. Fraser was still in office at the time of the incident? That's correct, Honourable Member. Okay. Um, let me move on to um, the hospital. I understand, uh, I'm from Bloemfontein, and many people say the private hospital there is better than the private hospitals. Those who can afford private medical health care can visit within the city. So is it correct that it is, in fact, a state-of-the-art facility? That is correct, Honourable. Okay. And is there s sometimes an eventuality where inmates, despite the state of the art facility, is taken to other hospitals, private or public, within the city for, for, for treatment? That's correct, Honourable Member. Okay. And Tabu Beste, was he one who was afforded visits to other hospitals? During the investigation, it was something that I've had a specific look at. In 2015, he went five times to outside specialists in hospital, and 2016, one time. Okay, five minutes. and five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, you see, I should really not have been expropriated. Um, and in, in, as part of your investigation, then, did you look into what, did, what, what was the type of treatment? Did it necessitate visits to private hospitals? No, because I didn't link it to the incident at that point in time. Okay. Um, Dr. Nandipa, um, in terms of your investigation, how often did she visit? She visited regularly, regularly t until November last year. Oh, the year before, sorry. The incident is more than a year ago. And if you say regularly, how often was that? I don't want to commit. I will rather send the document to the committee as well where all the visits have been recorded. Okay. And, and when did she start visiting? I don't want to commit myself, but I think it was in 2017. 2017. Um, so I would assume, and then I, I know I'm going into terrain which will, will ev most probably end in a, in, a, in, a, in a wall, that as part of your, your uh, intelligence activities at G4S, you have a careful look at visits to inmates. Frequency, new visitors, specifically also visits that do stop. Is that correct? Um, I need to, uh, to answer that on behalf of um, the people at the center. I'm not directly responsible for that, but according to my knowledge, um, yes, visits are monitored carefully and stopped whenever there is um, uh, um, reasons to stop it, which is legal, and not just stop because of the, the nature of stop. Hmm. Um, my, my inmates be favoured with, let's say, um, gifts or provisions or items they, they may need, which fall within the protocol by visitors? Honourable Member, we, we during the training of employees, 
we've got a module that we call the improper dealing. In that module, we have listed all instances that can lead to irregularities by the employees. And one of those things is that we do not approve that employees must have wrong dealings with the inmates. So it, it, we, we did not approve that if it happened. Okay. Um, then lastly, Chair, um, in terms of your, your protocols, and, and I'm not talking human beings, I'm talking your systems, which you, I think, were at pains today to say that that was the primary focus of your investigation. What has been amended and specifically strengthened based on your investigation? Honourable Member, um, there was um, the door that's giving access to the um, system at the back where uh, the, the areas are, are now being restricted. It's only now for the um, personnel of Integriton. No employee of G4 is allowed in there, and the key is also now being managed in accordance with that, so that nobody else has access to that. We've requested um, the service provider to install an intelligent lock on the door, so that you've got biometric readers available when if whoever enters that, so that you have that available to ensure that there is not a uh, possibility of tampering with the um, security system in future. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Horn, uh, Honorable Chanche. Uh, no, thank, thank you, Chair. The advantage of uh, being uh, last or so is that you would have been covered by everybody uh, and so it gives me a free license to just do follow-ups uh, chair and and maybe the first thing to to, to do is just to make a, a brief comment uh, chair so that you know where my headspace is I think for us the one is not interested in Tabo Besta or G4S for that matter. Our interest has to be about how we fix the system that we have in our institutions. If you take a, a mental patient to Falkenberg, your interest is not about uh, uh, differentiating these uh, patients, it's about when you take them there, is that system going to take care of that patient? That, for me, is the issue. And so, Mr. Grunewald, this is a law that has rules. This is a country that has rules. Uh, I want to take you back to page two of your input. Because part of what we want to do here, we want to use the opportunity that we get out of this crisis to be able to see what are the operation failures and lapses, Chair, as well as what are those policy failures so that we're able to fix. It is about us fixing our country and these institutions. Um, and so we, we expect you, since you have taken an oath, to help us do that by telling the truth. And, and, and I want to make this point, Chair, that I you are an G4S is an international company. Am I right? You also operate in the UK and other areas. Do you, and you've had these challenges in the UK. So when you go and uh, appear in parliament there, do you ask for summons when you go to that parliament? You don't. Do you, Honourable Chair? I don't know what the uh, you know what the system is for appearing in fo in in front of this type of uh, committee. In yeah, the UK. we've made that research. You don't look for summons. You appear because that's a parliament of that country, that everybody goes there. This is a portfolio committee of the parliament of this country. You you come here because this statement, Chair says if you, you continued last year, it would have been unlawful because we, we don't operate on summons. 
someone is the last thing that you attend to. And I think it's important that we make that point. Uh, because tomorrow we're going to ask somebody else to come and account to this body. This is a legislature of this country. I want us to, to bury that issue, Chair, because it does not sit well with me. Uh, I still don't understand why you wanted a summon. And, and, and then the, the, the next point, Chair, that I want to go into, Mr. Bailerfeld, you, you are responsible for audit and risk as a director. Correct, Honorable Member. You also mentioned that contract is one of the issues that you are responsible for. Is that correct? Correct. So I, I want to go straight into um, the contract that you have with DCS. You do have a contract with DCS, this 20-something years contract. There's a contract with the Department of Correctional oh, Services. Thank you. So just tell me um, who's the consortium and who are the shareholders of, of 4GS? G4 Fontaine Correctional Contracts, the contract is the main contractor. The shareholders is 20% as held by Old Mutual, 20% by G4S, 20% by Fakili Projects, 20% by Ten Alliance. Okay. In, in, your, in your own view, because the three of you are, are holding different positions, those two sitting there are more operational and yours is away from the operations. But I was very curious how you were answering operational matters. I've been watching that space. Uh, and when answers are thrown, they start looking at you when it is operational matter, and you venture into it, and, and I'll bring some of those. Still with you, Mr. Bailefeld. So with everything else that has happened, because from where I'm sitting, Chair, the escape of uh, Mr. Bester uh, is not the start of the rot in that prison. The problem don't start with the escape. It does seem that there have been problems throughout. The escape is just a culmination of issues. And maybe just before I forget, that's the only thing I'm going to ask one or two about Mr. Bester. And I'll ask all three of you, Mr. Kronewald, where is Mr. Bester? Where is Tabo Bester? Uh, Honourable Member, I learn from the news that he was arrested by the authorities in uh, near Arusha in Tar es Salaam. Uh, other than that, I have no f further information. In your presentation here today under oath, you told us Tabo Pesta has died. So I'm repeating the question to you. Where is Tabo Pesta, Mr. Kronewald? Honourable Member, I think the presentation needs to be put into context. What, what, we, what we did say was on the 3rd of May, a body was discovered in cell 35. We received a notice of death and a death certificate for Tabu Besta relating to that body. Yeah, it's only, so, so that's the information we had at, at hand. I, I appreciate that today we're looking back with 2020 vision. That's the information we had up to that point. On the 25th of May, we were informed by SAPS that it is not a suicide. This person died from blunt force trauma, and there was no smoke in the track here, if I recall. That was the yeah, you, you can pause there, because part of your report you, you have not believed what you have been told by the other stakeholders. Mr. Bailefeld, where is Tabo Pesta? I think my colleague has indicated that according to the information that we have, he's now arrested. And today, this morning, you said Tabo Pesta has died. So which one must I take? My colleague has explained. I'm asking Mr. Bailefeld, not your colleague. I've indicated that my colleague has explained that the way that the presentation was done is on the information that we had during the investigation and that the escape was only reported to us later um, in, in the beginning of this year. Mr. Mignat, two questions to you. The first one is, when all of this happened, who was the Manga Home Correctional Center director? Was it you? Yes, Honourable Member, it was still me. 
everything happened under you. That's correct. You are still the director there. Not current as we talk. Have you been uh, dismissed? No. Why? No, I did not commit any misconduct. When everything else happened under you? Yes. Wow. Okay. Let me proceed, Chair. Just, just to be quick, uh, so that we, 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 don't, we don't assume things here. These reports are not secret reports. So I just want you to indicate both the, the Bloomfontein High Court judge and the Constitutional Court judge. Who are these two judges? They are not named here. Because these judges do this work. They share their, their, their work with us. We follow it as portfolio committee. I don't know why they are not mentioned. Who are these two judges? Because you are, you are mentioning these judges in order to, to lift up what they would have, have seen, not the totality of things. Because this is not the report of the judges. You're taking out a code which seems to be suiting you, this code by these judges. We're not going to end here. We're going to follow these things. So who are these two judges? Quick. The Conco judge is Judge Tron. And the judges that visited the centre was, was Judge Von Rein and Denisu. Thank you. It should have been in the report uh, and not to be asked. My next point, Chair, I would have spoken about the systems, that this is what we're interested in. And I've, been, I've, I've listened almost the entire day. So here's the issue. And Honorable Horn has come very close to that. In, in this center, and this is a heads up to DC, uh, DCS, because we're going to have to deal with this thing with them as well. Do you have a risk assessment that you do of the inmates when they raise these issues? Let me start there first. Do you do risk assessments? When, when an inmate says, um, I don't feel safe here, is there a process where somebody assesses what this inmate says, or you just do what the inmate says as you did what Tabo Besta said to you, and I'll come to that point about him being transferred. That's the first question. Do you do assessment? Imagine a situation, maybe let me not proceed, let me answer that question first. And I'm, 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 I'm referring to both of you about operations, not Mr. Hunewald. He would not know these things. Honourable oh, Member, we, we don't do a recorded assessment because if you were to ask me the records, I will not be able to give you Okay, any what assessment do you do? It, so it's not a recorded, what assessment do you do? If, for an example, the inmate has disclosed in his application and then our security department will have followed that information. But because I, why well, I'm quoting this, because some of the application, the inmate will say, no, I don't want to disclose. So if, if you have a situation, Chair, in St. Albans, 20 inmates come to you, all of them say we are at risk in that cell, or in the Mangaung Correctional Center, how do you move on that? Because you seem to be agreeing once an inmate says that, it must be done. Honourable Member, and any of you, you, you are free to, to anyone re to respond. Don't even look at each other. The uh, Correctional Services Act, Section 30, determines that an inmate may apply to be kept in own safety, and that's what we apply. No, but the Act would not go into how you, you, you design that system. It's, it's about operations. The act is not an operational matter. You, 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 based on that act, you need to then build a system as to how you are going to effect what the act says. You don't have to, to, to generate it if it doesn't exist. All you can say is that you don't do this risk assessment. You, you, you hear what the inmate says, and then you proceed along those way, and, 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 and as you did with Tabo Best. Am I correct in that understanding? You are correct, Honourable Member. Okay. Now, here's the thing. In the Mangaum Correctional Center, before Tabo Pesta, how many inmates would have asked for this transfer? 
Honestly, yeah. Honourable Member, I will not have it in my mind to say exactly no, how. No, I don't want it to be in your mind. Do you have it on record? Yes, we will definitely have a register in, in that uh, single cell uh, building. Can, I, can we get it tomorrow, because there's information available? Yeah, I will contact the centre and check whether can they send it. Okay, tomorrow. we'll be here tomorrow. And the colleagues have also followed that up to understand, because with Tabo Besta, it looks like it was on the day. Uh, that inmate asked for this, it happened. Uh, immediately and is that is that the trend how you if you do it even though you're going to send that information that's how it, it, it happens there that's correct on remember okay wow maybe just also summarize on record what are these actual threats that Tabo Pesta said he he, 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 he is afraid of His document that he completed indicated, Honourable Member, that he is scared for his life because of the 26 gang uh, and that um, he did not have money to pay them off. Okay, thank you. Before I go to the next short issue, on, in your documents, and Honourable Velma raised this issue, you and I saw the inspecting judge not really agreeing. In, in this document, you say you informed Chicks six days later. On the 9th of May, that's when you said in your presentation, from the 3rd of May. Is that the standard? When, when, when there's, a, there's an inmate that would have died, so Chicks can be, it gets informed a, a, a week later, that's almost a week. Is that the standard? Mr. Bailefeld and Mr. Munyati. Honourable Member, I think... Um, you, are, you, are, you are in competition of being silent. That's fine. Honourable Member, uh, my colleagues have indicated that um, the responsibility to report, um, for an example, this particular incident is with the controller controller's office, not necessarily with our office. Our duty is to report to the controller on site. Okay. Back to systems, Chair. Do you keep a, a visitor's register and a footage in the Mangaung Correctional Center? Honorable well, Member, the, 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 the records of people that came to visit the inmate are kept because we are using electronic system, but for the footage, we don't keep the footage. Okay. C can we get the records of visitors that would have been there from the 14th of April to the 29th of April last year, tomorrow morning, uh, when we start process information available? It will not be possible. Uh, Why? Information is only kept for seven days, and if there's an incident, a backup is made of all the information regarding the incident. There's no record of, of every day being kept for the whole period of time, Honourable Member. There's no record. Honourable, me Honourable Member, if I might just help my colleague with your... Go, go ahead, Mr. Kronenwald. Um, the Honourable Member's question is not regarding the video footage that we retain only for seven days. The question is around physical evidence of, of visitation to inmate Besta. That is available. I, I was talking about the video footage that was referred to. Can we get that tomorrow? You can give it, get it tomorrow. And thank you. Does it happen that you would have this register, say for example, for a month, and that in this register there would have been a visitor who was not in the register? Has that ever happened? in the Mangaong Correctional Center? That was never reported to me that if somebody was there that not, was not um, registered in the register. Uh, there's actually different controls. The people that's doing the bookings for the visits is not the same people that's accepting the visitors and conducting the visit on a daily basis. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Mr. Krumewald and Mr. Bailerfeld. It's about the contract itself. Have you picked up any red, red flags about this contract that you have between the DCS and yourself? 
Um, Honourable Member, if you refer to red flags, can you be a bit more specific, please? Okay, let, let me do it this way. If this committee asks DCS to terminate a contract with you, would that be a problem? Based, based on what has been presented to us, based on issues of performance, competence, maybe not this committee, the, those that are signing the contract. Honorable Member, I think the, the correct thing would be for the performance to be judged against the obligations in the contract and for a determination then to be made as to w whether there are grounds for, for early termination or not. What, what we, have, we have witnessed throughout the day today, not just listening to TV, not social media, from your own presentation, the questions posed to you is that as I'm sitting here, my first inclination when we get to DCS, they have got to tell us why they cannot terminate the contract. So can you assist us to indicate why would you have a difficulty with the contract being terminated when there's no performance on that contract? I this issue, before you respond, it's a serious reputational risk, not to, to DCS, to the country South Africa. That's how serious we take it. Because these institutions will take people to those places who have wrong society. And they've got to be kept and looked after in a particular way. And what we've been hearing here is that you can have an inmate that really, and others are confirming, that really can, can, can have a party and, 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 and a big thing uh, while he's still in prison in the cell, in the correctional center. You have indicated to Mr. Swart that you don't know about that. And I, I'm, it's, it's mind boggling. Don't want to go there. And so I'm going back to the issue of the contract. Why must we keep this contract? Honorable member, that's up to the, the parties to the, to the contract to, to decide whether there are merits to this, to this contract. Um, we are discussing one event here, a major event, and I don't take anything away from that. But I think this event needs to be seen um, in, uh, in, in perspective of, of 22 years of operation. Th that's not my decision, uh, Honourable Member, to make. Th okay. That is for the parties to the contract to make. W would you all three of you agree that uh, this contract does not deserve any further day? to continue. I would disagree with that. On Why? Paper. Because I think our performance, we're discussing a single event here, and as I said, I'm not taking anything away from the gravity of the event. Our track record over 22 years is a good track record, given if compared to other uh, private and public uh, facilities. Okay, let me leave that, Chair. <laughs> Back to both of you, Tabo Besta and his studies. What did he study? What did he register for? Forget now about the computer laptop, because the laptop was linked to his studies. What did he, what did he study for? Graphic design, uh, honorable member. Uh, incomplete principles of graphic design. That's correct. How long was that course? You can't, you can't say you don't know. How long was that graphic design course that Tabo Pesta in, as an inmate registered for? That, that allowed him to have a laptop. Because the laptop has been explained here that Tabo Pesta was studying. Now we've discovered now what you are studying. Principles of graphic design. How long was that? Honourable member, honestly, I don't know, but what I can do, I can find out uh, from the institution the, the term of that uh, course. And that's your inmate? That's correct, honourable member. Now, here's information, so I want you to deny or confirm this, that these principles of graphic design, 
in terms of the schedule, he would have ended this in January 2021. January 2021. I don't know whether he passed or whatever, but that was the end of the course. So why would he have still had a lap laptop, okay, to do all of these kind of things? Please assist me. I'm already also assisting you to fill the gaps. Assist me too. Honourable Member, from my side, I cannot answer that question. Once again, we will have to go back to the principal who deals with this to give us a proper answer on that. Um, I don't want to guess uh, and bring uh, the, the committee on their wrong uh, perception of what, what might be the, the case. Okay, thank you. We are going to interact with SAPS. And maybe before I make that point, Mr. Kronewald, do you blame SAPS? And let me, let me explain this, the tone of your presentation here today and everything else you have said, there's a grief about SAPS. Five minutes. Thank you. Do you blame SAPS? Honorable Chair, there's no grief uh, about SAPS and I certainly don't, don't blame SAPS. My, my presentation and the facts that we've tabled to this committee is to factually record what happened and to explain to the committee that there were three concurrent investigations running. SAPS was dealing with a forensic investigation, as I've explained, and SAPS set the pace of that investigation. At certain times, they didn't want to make certain information available to us. I'm not sure why that decision was taken. When they asked for information from us, 1st of June 2022, we submitted all information to them. And as you heard from my colleague, Mr. Bailefeld, earlier today, there was, has been, and still exists, I believe, a very good working relationship regarding this matter between ourselves and SAPS. I certainly don't blame them. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank you. The, the crime scene at, at the cell where uh, the body will soon know where that person was bent, because we now know it was not double pasta. Did you clean that scene before the police arrive? According to the information at my pers uh, pers um, that I've got, that cell was cleaned after the SAP has released the cell after the body of the person that was in there was removed. Okay, well, we, we will find that out because just l listening in on the court proceedings, the charges are quite serious, aiding, abetting, but more seriously, defeating the ends of justice is one other charge that is there, but we'll hear that. We're not there yet. Um, I want you to confirm this. You've, you've made this point quite early and very emphatically. Um, the issue of smoke detectors. And, and, and I want to walk slowly with me. Are you saying there are no smoke detectors there? Or are you saying they don't work? Honorable well, member, there are no smoke detectors in, in Broadway. They, are not, they don't exist. They don't exist. And if we do find that there are smoke detectors, Honourable Member, it will really be a shock for me because I have never seen this uh, smoke detectors in single cells. Okay. Wow. Chair, thank you for now. Thank you very much, Honourable Chancha. Just a few things. Uh, one, since you gave us your presentation today, we did not have an opportunity to go through your presentation. Can you assist us? Which parts of your presentations are a contravention of the law or contract? Can you just repeat the question? Um, 
please, Honorable Chair. I'm saying that uh, which part of your presentations are a contravention of the law or contract? Because you said one of the reasons you wanted to be summons is because uh, there are things that you would, uh, you would not want to violate contractual obligation or legal obligation. So now, based on what you have presented, which parts are a, are, are a contravention of the law or contract? Honorable Chair, if I may, if I may answer that, and, and it's, a, it's a very important point that I made this morning, we did not seek privilege to get immunity. We did not seek privilege because we were, we were fearful that we would come here. Can you come close to the mic? We, we were not fearful that we would come here and say anything that would incriminate ourselves and for that reason we wanted in immunity. That was not the case. In terms of the Correctional Services Act, we are prevented from speaking to any third party without consent. And for that reason, we could not come here without a summons that allows us to speak freely here without that consent, knowing that what we say here will go into the public domain. Secondly, in terms of the contract between MCC and BCC, and between BCC and the department, we are precluded contractually from speaking to third parties. All information pertaining to the operations of the, of the, of the Mangong facility has to be communicated through the Department of Correctional Services. And we would have breached that legal mm -hmm. obligation on us had we appeared here without the summons. And for that reason, and, and, and I believe it should be seen in a positive way, we, we sought to get a summons so that we could appear here without breaking the law. It, it's a very important point I, I need to make. Had we, had we appeared without that summons, we would have contravened the Correctional Services Act. We would have contravened the, uh, the, the contract that we have with the department. No, we will come back to that maybe even tomorrow um, because we will, you will not be excused until uh, this process is over. We will come back to that. And then would you agree with me that uh, a financial crime was committed in a prison that is under your control? Honorable Chair, I have no... Um I have no evidence of a financial crime. Um, w w what we know today, with the benefit of hindsight, is that inmate Besta escaped from Mangung Correctional Centre. But I have no evidence of a financial crime having been committed. It's even possible that uh, with the lapses in our system, that people could easily commit or uh, plan a terrorist attacks because your systems cannot detect those things? Honorable Chair, I, th I think it would be <laughs> irresponsible of me to, to speculate on what is possible. Uh, I can only go on the facts that are available to me of what actually happened and the actions that we that we actually took. Moving beyond that would be speculation on my part. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are done for now. Uh, I think we are done. I think it's important that we must hear the, the next presentation. They will not be excused. Should there be a need to come back to them, we will do that. Babu Koza, Sertela. Sertela, yes. Um, so uh, we will release you for now from sitting there, but you are not released from these proceedings, you are not excused. Um, it's highly possible that in the course of our interact uh, interaction with other people, we might want one or two things to be clarified, so you must uh, be around. Uh, 
can we have, um, is T ready? Yes, can we have a 10 minutes break and then Intac return, then we'll take the seat.
Now we will be receiving a presentation from Intergreton, but before they do that, I will hand over to the legal advisor to administer oath. <laughs> um, you have been invited, subject to the provisions of Section 16 of the Powers, Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act 44 of 2004, to appear before this committee as a witness and to answer questions in respect of the committee's oversight meeting into the circumstances relating to the escape of Mr. Tabobesta from the Mangaung Correctional Centre and related matters. Please be informed that by law you are required to answer fully and satisfactorily all the questions lawfully put to you, or to produce any document that you are required to produce in connection with the subject matter of the inquiry, notwithstanding the fact that the answer or the document could incriminate you or expose you to criminal or civil proceedings or damages. You are, however, protected in that evidence given under oath or affirmation before a house or committee may not be used against you in any court or place outside parliament, except in criminal proceedings concerning a charge of perjury or a charge relating to the evidence or documents required in these proceedings. Please be aware that in terms of Section 17.2 of the Powers, Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act, a person who willfully furnishes a house or committee with information or makes a statement before it which is false or misleading commits an offence and is liable to a fine or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding two years. Could you kindly state your full name and designation for the record, please? Leticia Pedro, a director of Integratron. Thanks, Ms. Leticia Pedro. You're required to take an oath or affirm that the evidence you're about to give is truthful. You may choose to take the oath or the affirmation. Which do you prefer? An oath, please. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear that the evidence I shall give. I swear that the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Chair, the witness is duly sworn in. Sir, please state your full name and designation, please, for the record. Dylan Williams, Internal Legal Advisor for Integritron. Thanks, Mr. Dylan Williams. You're required to take an oath or affirm that the evidence you're about to give is truthful. You may choose to take the oath or the affirmation. Which do you prefer? The oath, please. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear that the evidence I shall give. I swear that the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Chair, the witness is duly sworn in. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, you can now make your presentation. Honourable Chair, Honourable Committee Members, good afternoon. We have not specifically done a presentation which will be posted. However, we have... Sorry, can you guys hear me? Is that better? All right. We have, however, furnished um, the Honourable Committee and the, the Committee Secretariat with affidavits, which I believe you are in possession of. Um, if we may briefly run you through that, we know that time is, you know, uh, of, of the utmost importance. So without detracting from the severity of the matter, we would like to run you through the contents of our affidavit, which my colleague has deposed to. So, seen in light of the recent developments uh, and, and media publicity which has come to light, we were or we received a notice from the Department of Correctional Services on the 22nd of March 2023 requesting certain information which could aid the Department of Correctional Services and, of course, the committee in the investigations. 
Um, I wish to place on record or at the outset that it should be noted that Integritron was merely contracted by G4S to provide qualified technical resources in order to maintain the security installation for G4S at the Mongo Correctional Services. With that being said, the management of the system is done by G4S. Integriton is not uh, is not contracted to uh, to manage the system, rather maintain the system. My apologies. Further to that, excluded from our scope of works is the maintenance of the security installation which excludes ICT infrastructure, which is the information and community technology infrastructure, and the power or electrical installations, including backup power. In accordance with the notice received, as alluded to earlier, on the 22nd of March 2023, as mentioned, certain information was requested from our officers. Amongst that information was information regarding the cell call buttons, the cameras, the respective DVR recordings, and the SCADA logs for cell calls, as will be noted from the affidavit. It should also be noted that it is a daily function that the Integritron Integrated Solution Technician on duty uh, for maintenance is required to check the equipment in the equipment room prior to leaving site. With that being said, footage available confirms that the respective technician on the morning, or, or rather on the 2nd of, of, uh, the, the 2nd of May 2022, entered the equipment room expected at close of shift on the evening of the 2nd, on or about 19.38. Recordings on the DVR see shortly after according to the DVR logs and time displayed on footage. In light of the recent news headlines regarding the incident, what was thought to be a suicide is now being investigated as a murder. Based on this new information, we undertook to initiate our internal investigations and subjected this said individual to a said polygraph test. As alluded to by the Honourable Committee Member, Mr. Swartz, earlier, the results of the said polygraph test came back negative. We have recently, or we have today, received information that this individual has subsequently handed himself over to the SAPS. And I believe that they are conducting their further investigations. Further to this, there were four individuals from Integriton Integrated Solutions who arrived on site on the 4th of May 2022 to conduct their respective investigations into what had transpired and the, the subsequent escape of Tabu Besta. These individuals who were on site on the day conducted their respective investigations and it was found that all the systems were operational and everything was in working order. With that being said, when the system, when the DVR systems went off at 19.38, they only appeared the following morning at 4.11. During that period is when the incident occurred. And that is all I wish to state. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, any questions? Uh, Ms. Ramulubeng, <coughs> uh, Ms. Chele, uh, Ms. Yako, Honorable Yako, Honorable Ngola, Honorable Nivot Trochen, Honorable Swart, Honorable Engelberg, Honorable um, 
Yes, no, it's glitch. <laughs> Honorable Clinus in that order. Oh, Honorable Horn, then Honorable um, Himatot. Honorable Chanch. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's long in the night. Over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, and we welcome the presentation, even though it's not flagged. <coughs> Chair, um, who, who has resigned from the Integriton? Is it, is it Van Donder, or maybe I got the name wrong? It's correct. It is. What, what was the reasons for him to resign? He had other opportunities um, lined up for him as per his resignation. Could you um, speak a bit he, louder? We can't hear you. My apologies. Okay. Um, he had other opportunities lined up for him as per his resignation. When was so the resignation? He, in August uh, last year, 22, 3rd of August. When did you start conducting investigations? We started the investigations on the 4th of May, so he was part of the investigation team. 4th of May 2022? That's correct. And then he resigns in August. There's nothing on him? Well, we can't really look into him. At the time, um, we didn't have any reason to. Did you to try to look into him? Um, at the time, we did not have any reason to. In this time, did you try to look into him? He's out of our employ, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the guy that uh, did the polygraphy test, it's cited in one of your, there are a lot of affidavits um, here. In one of the affidavits or the person that was conducting the polygraphy test, that some way his, his answers were evasive or not conclusive. Um, and you got that report. What is it that you have done? Since I've, I've, I've recently read that you still kept him, regardless of that. Even though he, the polygraphy test would have said negative, but there is a remark on it. So what we subsequently undertaken to Daniels, or to do rather, sorry, we have subjected him to disciplinary hearings. We have suspended him. As earlier mentioned, he has now, um, he has now handed himself over to When staff. did you suspend him? Sorry, speaking under, uh, under correction, but in light of the recent public holidays, it would have been the following Tuesday. So we found this information out on the 31st of, of March. We undertook our, our internal meetings and we subjected him to disciplinary action on the 31st. So he was suspended um, effectively 3rd of April. 31st of March, 2023. When did you do the polygraphy test? So the polygraph test was done on the 31st. Let me, so let me clarify. So that following Tuesday, mm -hmm. upon receipt of this and taking into consideration the respective public holidays, his disciplinary was held on that Tuesday and he was suspended immediately. Okay. On the basis of the, the missing footage <clears throat> between 1938 on the set day of the 3rd of May, or early hours of the 3rd of May, there's a missing footage between 1938 to 11 past 4 a.m. when it resumed um, recording. Um, and you make an indication that it's on a basis of power cuts and so forth. You even mention dates and so forth. Is it possible that it might have emanated from um, being played with, and in this sense, and someone tampering with it. What, what I can say is the only logical conclusion that one can can deduce, um, based on this individual who was there during that time, is that it may have been possible that he tampered with the system, or with the cables, the DVR cables. And are those uh, the server of that system behind the? Um, is it Broadway? Um, it's basically um, in the control Before room. What is it? Is it Broadway where the, the segregation, the, the isolation? It is Broadway. Um, uh, is it behind Broadway? 
the, the, the serve of that system, where can you temper with it? I'm not able to answer that. I have no idea. You are not aware of I'm it? I'm not aware of that. And on the said official that was there, you make mention in page two um, that the daily technician who is responsible must make sure that before leaving on the said day, must make sure that all maintenance um, with regards to equipment prior leaving the site are correctly checked and functional and so forth. Did the said official do exactly as what you would have stated here? I cannot with certainty say, I cannot with certainty say that he acted, you know, with the utmost Did you try to find out? What we can very well say is that the video footage which is available that we are not in possession of, given the, the serious nature thereof. Um, however, it is in possession of the respective uh, uh, individuals at the Mongo and Correctional Service, as well as the investigating officers. The footage will show that an individual walks in at approximately 1938 towards the so-called room that I, I, I would take it, or the server room, the control room which you are alluding to. Minutes after that, the system ceases to, to display any footage. Okay. Between me and all of us in this room, we can safely say it was tempered with. I can't with certainty say it was, but if that's the deduction one wants to make, then yes. One of the affidavits that was written um, it makes an indication that the official eventually opened up on the set event and made an indication that um, <clears throat> eventually there was a plan from G4S officials that resulted in the escape of Bester and so forth and so on to an extent that he was asked to play a role in switching off the, the cameras. Did we find out that eventually did he switch off the cameras? Like I've mentioned earlier, he is now subsequently in light of what has transpired and this information coming to light, handed himself over to SAPS. Did we give this information to SAPS? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I have provided this information to the respective individuals at the Mongo and Correctional Centre as well as the Lieutenant Colonel, who we received the notice from. So you have been cooperating with SARS? We have been cooperating with SARS over and above the information that has been requested from us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, Chairperson. My first question is that um, upon uh, getting that contract, were you aware that there is a blind spot uh, around in that area? Um, I cannot confirm. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the technicians, well, the guys with the technical knowledge, um, we can do ever ask the question and just get revert back on that. Now that you know, how do you think you can assist the, 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 the G4S to fix that? We haven't gotten that far, but we, we are considering the, um, the events. We were not able to get to site and looking at the action plan to prevent um, any of this um, going forward happening. So, Did the G4S uh, inform you about the occurrence of the switch often? Sorry, just repeat the question. Did the G G4S contacted you or informed you, uh, when did they inform you about the, 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 the occurrence? I, I can't with certainty say when we were informed, I'm speaking under correction, but we came there the day after the incident to conduct our investigations uh, into the specific cameras, the DVR recordings, the SCADA logs and the cell call buttons. So no one informed you, you just came as no. a routine? So we were informed, it, and I speak under correction, it's either the third or the fourth that we were um, informed, but we were on site on the fourth. So it could have been the, the third. How many days? If we were informed the third, we were on site the next day. Okay. Um, my other question is that 
Would you say it's strange that uh, that incident okay, okay? It's strange, according to your own judgment, knowing that uh, divisive because it's yours. You are the owner of that thing. Which incident are you referring to? I'm talking about the switching off and this within that time frame because you are saying you went there a uh, few uh, those days and then you, the whole thing was in order. Nothing was wrong with the the machines. So I'm saying, would you say it's strange? I'm I'm repeating the same question that was asked bef before because I didn't get the clear answer. So certainly it's strange. One would one would presume that it isn't within standard protocol that that system would be switched off. So would you say it was deliberate? Like I said, it's definitely not within standard protocol. Will you say it is deliberate according to your own observation? I cannot say that it was deliberate. What I can say is that this respective individual has handed himself over to SAPS, who was involved on the day. Were you informed, or maybe this question is, will be, won't be right for you, because according to the observation that we did, that place where is self C is, it's, it's not clear. It's, it's not clear, you know, when you are in control, in, in, in the control room, when you, uh, uh, the cameras, uh, uh, when the person who is there watching there, it is not clear. Hence, you can see that there is that blind spot and also it's not clear. Uh, were you aware? Because I think when you're inserting those things, you, you would have maybe uh, did some work before and see if maybe this will be, uh, 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 it will help the situation as you are supposed to do for security. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding the question. I'm Can saying, you please repeat it, Honorable? We said it is the, the place where C35, it's not clear. It's, it's, when, when, when you are looking at that place, when you are in the control room, control room, it is not clear, and there is a blind spot. And you were the one who inserted those cameras and, and, and the security in terms of it. But I'm saying, uh, did you notice that uh, advice? Because that place is very important, especially because it is next to the emergency door. Um, as I mentioned, um, I cannot confirm um, that, w that that was the fact, but I will revert, um, speak to the technicians on site, and they will be the best people to, to give a response on that. So we will um, revert tomorrow with the response on that specific question. I saw your reaction on the issue of Mr. Fenter uh, when, when you were asked that Mr. Fenter is, uh, 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 can we get information from him? And then you said he's released. And then I saw you when uh, Honorable uh, Ramalubedi was asking you that uh, can we get information, something like that. And then you said, what was that meaning? It means you don't have any control. You, you will never assist in, in terms of that, in making sure that we get information from Mr. Fenter, who is gone, who is released by you. Oh, you mean Mr. Van Donder? Van Donder, yes, yes. not Van Der. <laughs> no, My apologies will, for that. By all means, I will try and get information, but as I mentioned, he's not under our employ. So um, hence, we've, we've mentioned him in the report um, for SAPS to take this further if they see fit. Um, but I do, I do not mind um, if, if I'm in the means to request information or well to question him. We will do that by all means to try and with this, uh, assist with this uh, investigation as we are doing. Lastly, I want to, to confirm that the, the officials that are working there, you said you have nothing to do with them. Are, uh, uh, are you confirming that those officials who are operating your, 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 your that uh, uh, a system are hired by G4S. You have nothing to do with them. So we have our technicians, Integratron technicians, 
the officials working in the control room, that is DCS, and I speak on the correction, DCS or G4S employees. Thank so you. we can only um, report on our staff, which is the Integratron technicians. Sorry, Honourable Member. If I may just add to your previous, your previous question with regards to Mr. Van Tonde. At the time of the incident, Mr. Van Tonde did depose to affidavits which were provided to G4S. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honourable Chair, Honourable Yako. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, Integratron says that its responsibility is maintenance and um, G4S is responsible for managing um, the equipment. Um, so upon your investigation on the 4th of May, um, did you then compile a report um, and have further talks with G4S um, prior to the involvement that you're in now this year with SAPS? Yes, we have. We've compiled the report after the, the investigation and it was submitted uh, to G4S. Um, it's one of the appendices. May I ask when it was that. submitted? It was submitted on the 12th of May, 2022. The same month. Sure. Um, and what responsibility did you take um, to, uh, of, the, of the lack of functioning of the equipment? So, as per our report, we made certain recommendations and, and conclusions based on the findings we found on, on the 4th with, uh, you know, like I say, certain recommendations to improve, enhance the system and to ensure that a similar situation may not happen again. Okay, and how many times has the system been off before? I can't with certainty say. Um, as my colleague alluded to earlier, the technical team may be able to shed more light on that. Okay. Um, upon your um, discussions with G4S, on, you, 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 you compiled the report at the same time. What was the reaction from G4S with regards to your report um, on that t 24th of May? Maybe my colleague will be able to to touch base on that. Just re repeat your question, please. I'm asking what was the response from G4S upon your, um, your compiled report to them as to how this system manuf manufactured and what was your role in it? Well, after submitting the report um, to Mr. Johan at the time, we did not receive a response. But along with the, the report we've, and, and along with the recommendations, we've submitted quotations to get the system where it should be. Um, with the, the desired um, um, working condition. But um, as I've uh, just said, we have not re received a response. Some of the, the recommendations and the quotations we've submitted, we've received purchase orders and we went ahead. Um, but yet, we, we're still waiting for some of the main um, um, implementations to be made. So G4S never responded positively to your recommendations? Or op upon submitting this uh, report, no. Okay, thank you very much. We, we did, did, however, um, my colleague, um, which is not currently here, um, had a um, telephone call um, with uh, um, Mr. Johan um, afterwards, but there was no um, further discussions around that. Just one last question, Chair, with your indulgence. Um, after that incident, um, and you recommended those um, protocol measures with, with G4S, and they didn't respond to you, have you ever been called again to come and do uh, maintenance of the same systems? Yes. Um, For the same thing? Yeah. So and we, you we made recommendations? Every day, so we just do preventative maintenance um, on those pieces of equipment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Yako. Honorable Ngola. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson, I've got only one question. Uh, but before that, allow me to submit that the country is taken into a right year. Honorable Janji is correct that the last 
learning program and the date of Mr. Pastor is the 20th of January 2021. Then uh, we are told here in this committee that uh, on the 4th of April 2022, a laptop was found which was authorized to Mr. Pastor for purposes of studying. A year later, after the end date of his studies, so the country is taken for a ride. Let, 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 let me, in, in the affidavit you deposed, you give a scenario of what happened between 7 p.m. on the 2nd of April and 4, p, and 4 a.m. on the 3rd of, I mean, on the 2nd of May, and 4 a.m. on the 3rd of May. You give a scenario of a man who enters a room where the operating uh, arrangement is kept. That the man enters the room at uh, 7.38 p.m. But in your investigation, you pick that some DVRs stopped functioning at that particular time until 11 minutes past 4 on the 3rd of May 2022 which is immediately after the incident. But you equally explain to us, people who, are, who know less on the ICT profession, that usually when such malfunctions happen in the system, they directly report to uh, the operators in the operating room. But none is said about that. Now, can you explain to us just briefly what are these DVRs we are talking about for a layman like me? And what is their role on record keeping purposes? Thank you. Um, Leticia? Um, as I mentioned, um, I will just touch on this, but as I mentioned, I would need to get um, a technical response um, to this. So uh, on the DVR, that is basically, um, it does the recording. So as, as we mentioned in the report, the DVR was still recording. The recording was available because the footage was available afterwards for that period of time. And immediately as he entered the um, the control room, so the server room, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> the recording was offline. And then the recording went back online the next morning after four. Understand? <laughs> sure, that is enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Nugut Drohan. Thank you, Chair. Some questions for myself for clarity. I want to know, you were talking about your technicians. You said four of them. Do they take turns within a 24-hour service? So, as I understand it, and speaking under correction, there was a a technician there on the 2nd of May 2022. The remaining technicians that I speak of were dispatched uh, upon, upon the incident happening. I am not entirely sure how many individuals are there on the said day. Um, so just clarification, the, the four technicians referred to in the report they were um, assisting with the investigation. So three of them, well, two of them were uh, dispatched from head office, um, and one of, one of the, the senior techs assisted telephonically. Um, normally we have three guys on site, and um, they do take turns uh, on the 24-hour standby. Okay, so on 24-hour standby, right? So you have that. So when there is a switch off of your system, does nobody notified, or didn't, didn't anybody know that the system was switched off? So if you 
referred to the recommendations. Um, unfortunately, there was no heads up um, or indication that the system was offline or well, did not record. That was one of our recommendations um, for the system to alert the officials that the recording has stopped. So I'm not talking about the recommendations, I'm talking about the day of the fire, day that the fire happened. We are told the system was switched off, so I want to know from those of you well, who are not in the control room, but outside, does, is nobody, I mean, if you are the director of the company, nobody, none of your staff picked up that the system was off? Nobody? No. So he was the only one. Um, he was about to knock off um, after seven that evening. And as I mentioned, and again, in the, the report that was submitted to, to G4S, we made the rec recommendation um, that we should implement this in order for the, the superiors or the officials to be alert um, or notified when the system is not recording or the system is offline or the cameras of, are offline, etc. Okay, so that, that's only in the recommendation. So on that day, nothing like that happened. So now, when, when was this report given with the recommendation? When was it given? On the 12th of May, 2022. So 12th of May 2022, and you said there was no response except the telephonic response. When was the telephonic response? Um, I, I cannot recall. Um, my apologies, but I, I, I cannot. But it was still in 2022? Yes, it was. So I'm asking because May 2022 up until today, 2023, you've had no response on the recommendations that you gave. I'm assuming you still have a contract with G4S? Yes, we do have a contract. Um, we are in talks with them, so there are emails, um, a correspondence in terms of updating the quotes. So they are looking into upgrading the system or getting the necessary measures in place um, to avoid what happened. So they are looking into um, getting or well, following their recommendations. Okay, but there wasn't response for something to be implemented one year later or up until now, nothing to be implemented, no response with regards to something that needs to be implemented? Well, there was, like I just mentioned, there was a telephone calls and the quotations were submitted, but uh, nothing was finalized at the time. Okay, so now with uh, all of the load shedding, a lot of load shedding that's been happening and G4 is telling us that the electricity for that uh, box failed, your investigation into why the electricity failed on that box, what, what does your investigation say about that? Well, at the time, as per the report, it was a, um, a power failure, but that has been resolved up until now, as I'm aware that uh, the UPSs are, um, has been installed. Okay. I wanted to add to what my colleague said about the blind spot. I do not know when you first signed your contract with the G4S. So, um, you know, whether you've seen that area that there's no camera, was there, you know, obviously you didn't see it before. Sorry, interpreter needed clarification. Uh, the blind spot there in that area at the cell. Did you not see prior to the fire happening or the incident that there's a blind spot there to, so that you can put the camera there? Because like it was said, I mean, it was near an emergency exit. Did you not see that, that there was a need for a camera prior to the fire happening? I will have to um, come back and con um on that one specifically. I will lies with um, our technicians and revert. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Nivort uh, Trochen, Honorable Swart. Very much. I'm just trying to 
understand the affidavit which we only received today and some of the processes. So your job is the maintenance of security installation which in excludes the ICT infrastructure and the power but you've got to make sure the cameras are operating, the, DC, the, the recorder is operating, is that correct? And Sorry, that's correct. At this time, we've spent the whole morning looking at this exact time when the, both the cameras were turned off from 1938 on the 2nd of May to 0411 on the 3rd of May. All the cameras were offline plus the DVRs. That's correct. And you've got a screening of someone coming into the server room and turning off the camera, uh, turning off the recorder. Is that correct? That's correct. So, so I've summarized that correctly. All the cameras are off? No, the cameras was not off. The, the cameras was in working order. The only thing, um, it was only the DVR for that period that was not recording. The DVRs were not recording at that? Only for that. Well, that's... Um, between okay, that but time we know frame? that the cameras for that specific cell 35 were too far in, in the distance. So that is the, the critical part is, is the DVRs. But I, I'm trying to understand this whole thing about your letter, um, which is first in May last year, where you indicate your initial report. I, I mean, we are living in 2022, and we're still dealing with cassette recorders and VHS tapes, it's beyond comprehension. Can you explain as a company how you make use of VHS tapes that are re-recorded and reused multiple times in this day and age of modern storage of information? I'm referring to 17 May 2022. You've got the duration of the recording system at G4S. The system uses video cassette recorders with VHS tapes. Two tapes were used per day, 12 hours each, and reused multiple times. The tapes were removed from the CCR. What I'm trying to ascertain, firstly, the antiquity of the system, but secondly, the fact that six months later, we've got a challenge trying to get hold of tapes if they are reused, obviously. That's correct. Uh, you'll note from our initial report on the 12th of May that those are those form part of the recommendations to improve and enhance the, the system. Yes, and Mr. Dianti correctly pointed out that one wants to enhance the system, but it's just a combination of coincidences and issues and that played into the hands of this escape. I'm trying to also understand this issue related to the cell call and door, which was also not operating. That is in your letter of the 12th of May, 2022. You've got a lot of very technical, explain to me what is the cell call and door? What is that process? And it's, under, it's on page two of your letter to GCS. And there's another error, there's, a, there's another error with that, with the SQL database. Can you follow that and just explain that to us? What is the cell call and door? Obviously that would presume there are logs for cell call logs where a person calls from a cell or doors open, it should be logged automatically. And there's a problem with that as well. So we can't ascertain at what time was that cell 45 door opened. Is that correct? So I will refer, to, um, and it's numbered on page 17, um, and it is part of the report that was submitted to G4S. Um, please allow me just to, to read that section. Cell call and door. When investigating the SCADA logs for cell call logs and door status changes, Integratron noted that the historic data was not available in the Android uh, SCADA database. Integratron contacted the third party service provider for assistance. It was noted that the audit agent was not running. This agent logs all device status changes. Can I just, uh, sorry to interrupt you. What do you mean by what, what device status changes? What does this mean? Is this doors opening and closing? 
So this report was compiled by, by our technicians. What it basically is saying is that the, the Adroit SCADA uh, system, which is this, the software, um, it needs to be, it's, it's, it's a very old version that's running, hence it's not um, doing what it's supposed to be doing. So, in, and hence we've recommended an upgrade of that system. What does Again, it record sorry. The, what data does it record? The opening and the closing um, of the doors. So it would, but the cell door, cell 45, so what is it, cell 45? Cell 35, I'm getting confused myself. Cell 35 plus the emergency door through which is just next to that. So that should be recorded and again was not recorded due to problems with the system. Is that correct? I would like to confirm that with our technicians. But you say it here. Displayed errors and as a result the connecting agent such as the audit has stopped, had stopped. That's on the 20, 12th of May 2022. So there's another problem here. So where we could have thought, oh, here's a system at least that's been in place at great cost. We can now find out what time was the doors opened and what time was the emergency door opened. We've been there, we've seen. That's the place the escape took place. So there's another challenge that you, you're faced with. So you, you, you make wonderful recommendations. The failure is due to an unexpected error in SQL resulting in the connection being suspended. And that means the data and the information relating to the opening of the cell door, the opening of the emergency door is not recorded. Is that correct? You, it's not rocket science. There you've said it. Is that correct? I can't with certainty say. Well, look, you don't have to say it with certainty. You've already said it in your letter. You're recommending an upgrade of the system. And here you say, it was noted, the database displayed errors. And as a result, the connecting agents, such as the audit agent, had stopped. This is afterwards. So you're looking now, you want to find out. And that's just the one part. That's the opening on the doors. That's a great system but it wasn't operating the same period another coincidence so we'll leave it there i'm trying to understand this issue of the power breaks now you also make great mention about that and i appreciate that's not your responsibility the power outages of course when your own technician goes and unplugs it then it is your responsibility wouldn't you concede that i mean assuming and all probabilities indicate does everyone, have, has, does everyone have access to the server room? Only your technicians have access to the server room, is that correct? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, that is correct, but um, the server room at this moment is not... I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about then. No, so they were not the only ones. So I'm sorry? The, con the controllers in the control room, they also would have access to the server room. So it's either the controllers who are supposed to be sitting at their control room, but where is the, do you know, it's not the same place, it's, as it's, I understand. No, it's like one room, and then you have the, the controllers yes. viewing the screens. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, there's a doorway, and that's the, the okay. control room. So one, on the assumption that your technician went in, you see that someone comes in and unplugs it. And that same person fails the polygraph test there's a high probability that it was your technician. Do you not agree? What we can say is that all evidence seems to suggest. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, my time is limited. But can I just ask on, on the power system? I'm, I'm intrigued about all the power breaks in your letter of 12th May, where the DVR logs, and this is your system operating. Power outages, 14 April. 15 April, 16 April, 19 April, 28 April, 29 April. That is when the power outages were for the recorder. Correct, that's on 12th of May, your letter 12th of May, second last paragraph. You say at those times the recording was out. And you say the UPSs that supported the equipment in the event of power loss and protect the equipment are not operational. So in other words, there's no backup for all those dates, all those, whatever happened on those dates, there was no backup system, the DVR system did not work. Now, but I find it astonishing 
that you as you, a technical group come in and you're supposed to maintain the information and you, yes, the power outages are not working, but all these dates, the power is out. So all your system is down. Do you not agree? Isn't that not astonishing? That's just for one month. Do you have data for the March, for, for um, January, February, March of that year? Can you provide that data for us as well? Because it would probably be the same thing. So not that I'm aware of, but I can request that. Surely, you as available. maintaining the system would have brought this to the attention and say, look, it's not my problem, but our systems are being affected by the fact that the power is down, mm -hmm. therefore our system is worth nothing. Do you not agree? Do you not agree? Like I say, I can't answer to what the technical team has, has... I'm sorry, what technical team are you referring to? Your own technical team? That's correct. But then who must... Uh, director, please, um, Ms. Pedro, you respond on behalf of your technical team. You're indicating here severe breaches of power for the previous, the month of April, April, April. We have this massive incident on the 2nd of May, and now we all wise after the event. But what happens if the whole place burnt down or something like that, a far worse situation? Surely there was something that should have been done to bring to the attention that these power outages and the backup systems are not working. And I find it very hard to believe that, that this wasn't brought to the attention of the authorities, of GCS, and I'm sure you did. It was indeed uh, brought to their attention. Um, and as my colleague mentioned, we are there to um, maintain the, the, the system, and that's what we did. And hence we re recommended our recommendations in our report, and we, we're managing the, those DVRs specifically, looking at it on a daily basis, just to ensure that this is not happening again. But uh, fortunately, with the UPS is uh, being up and running now, we haven't seen um, those um, recordings uh, failing. So it's another coincidence during this event that the power backups were not working. Uh, another coincidence which falls into, just plays into the conspiracy theory that this was carefully planned. And I'm not saying, I'm not accusing you of being involved, but there were people inside the prison that were aware of these deficiencies. And I put it to you that you, you, you contributed to this by not ensuring that the maintenance of the system was up to scratch in as much as there were power outages, which you say is out of your control, but you can't say all these dates and nothing has happened. Surely you don't just leave it. This is on the 12th of May you make this report. Do you, do you, I'm sure you must agree with me that it, that, that it points out an egregious negligence. Do you have anything to comment on that? No comment on okay. that. So I just want to, I, I don't quite understand the strange affidavit that you've added here by the, uh, maybe we can just quickly, quickly go to that. This affidavit by the interpreter who did the polygraph report. And this is part of an annexure that he has now provided on the 31st of, and by the way, it seems that a lot of attention has only been given now in, in the last month or week. Why has this incident took place last year? Now suddenly everyone's running around, polygraph tests, everything. They say in Afrikaans, Benoda Kata Mark Benoda Spronga. And in other words, in English, cats on a hot tin roof, everyone's jumping around. But this is an affidavit by the interpreter at the polygraph report who did the polygraph, and he indicates that there's some informal discussion that he took place after this. Can you explain why is this attached? Was this given to the police because... So, Honorable Chair, if I may shed some light on this, this matter, what happened is on, on the day of the polygraph test, when it was conducted, this individual whose affidavit you're referring to is indeed the translator. 
that we had arranged who accompanied the, the polygraph examinator on the day. Now, prior to the polygraph test, certain pertinent information was divulged to this translator, which was then relayed to us. We sought to have this individual to post to the affidavit. So it's headed best case versus Teboche Lipolo, and this is the interpreter, this guy. So I don't understand best case. Is this an affidavit that was given to the police? I see it was signed on the 31st of March. The where, what is this? Where is this? Is this a, 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 and this is a police, it seems, where is this affidavit now? Is it in a police docket? So that affidavit, I believe, was commissioned at, at uh, a SAPS branch and it has been furnished to the respective investigating officers. I'm not going to go through it all, but it just indicates that uh, there, there, there was a lot of discussion about a prison, a planning to uh, kidnap a person, and just this last paragraph. On February, the last week, Motsi and Sebach Set Labi involved Tebocha Lipolo, that is the person that did the polygraph, that underwent the polygraph test, that was the technician that went and possibly or probably unplugged the DCR asked that he must switch the camera off as he worked as the technician and he told them that he can make it a demo. So it seems that there was a discussion whilst the polygraph or before the polygraph where this information was divulged by the technician to the person interpreting the polygraph where he in effect admitted and obviously one's got to test the veracity of this, but he admitted that he worked as the technician and that he can make it happen. Would you agree with that? That is correct. In light of these new developments, he has subsequently handed himself over to SAPS. Again, it is highly regrettable that this information only comes out on the 31st of March, whilst as a result of the work of investigative journalists, otherwise we would never have had this, otherwise you wouldn't have even conducted this polygraph test, etc., etc., because it, it raises serious questions about what the level of maintenance that you did do. Chair, I, I am reaching a conclusion, but it seems to be so many coincidences, coincidences, coincidences. And it indicates, again, as we've heard time and again, careful involvement of not only the night staff there, but now also the involvement of your official. And obviously, one would be interested to find out whether there's been a lifestyle audit done on him whether there's suddenly been some cash in his bank account or not. I see he's worked for your company for 19 years. He's probably got a very good reputation. But what steps, what further steps did you say you've, he's been suspended? Yes, so off the back of the polygraph test, he was suspended and uh, subjected to further disciplinary action where he was going to be charged. The results of that, I'm, I'm not aware of at this stage. With that being said, however, we have been informed that he has subsequently handed himself over. Chair, I must say I find it highly unsatisfactory um, that this information has all come out at this very late stage whilst there were letters written already raising these issues way back on 12th of May 2022. This information was given to G4S. Was this information at that stage given to anybody else? Such as the investigating police, such as JIX? It was only issued to G4S. Sorry? The, only issued to G4S at the time. Well, maybe we should ask them to explain why this information wasn't provided to JIX and to other institutions. JIX, the inspector judge, is here. I'm sure you confirm he had no knowledge of this. It's shocking. Thank you, Chair. No more questions. Thank you very much, Honorable Swart, Honorable Engelberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, not going into who did what and when, um, 
I'm referring to your document Annex D, second paragraph, last sentence, where you said, it stated there, all equipment is working as expected. So for a layman, when it comes to these um, technical things, does this mean that on the 4th, the cameras and all other related equipment was functioning? Or what does working as expected mean? My understanding is that the system was operational, the cameras were working, they hadn't been uh, you know, tampered with, the DVR recordings were recording uh, as, as per expected, and uh, further than that, I can't comment. Okay, so the power fluctuations, the malfunctioning UPS was no longer an issue the morning after the incident okay that's correct so if i can just add to that my understanding is that the system will reboot and then everything would come back online and operate as expected uh -huh. okay so somehow crucial equipment did not function during the time that the incident occurred but worked again shortly after the incident occurred. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm. Um, when we visited uh, uh, the facility, I saw that there's a camera inside the control room at the door, just when you enter it from the little boardroom that's inside there. Now, as I, as I understand it, to gain access to the server room, you have to go through the control room. Did that, that camera, was that one also not functioning during that time? This is, that's 100% correct, and this is the, the footage we are referring to that depicts this individual. So there is footage of this individual? As I understand it, that's correct. Uh, can that individual be identified in the footage? Because it's uh, it's not very far away. The camera is not it's not a wide angle thing. It's it's very close by. Yes, he can be identified. Can, can, uh, where is that footage? We are not in possession of that footage. The footage lies with the respective investigating officers. Okay. Um, after you you gave a report to G4S on the morning after you investigated the malfunction. Uh, did you get a request from G4S to fix the system in any way or form? Because clearly there was a mal malfunction. Did you, did you have to fix anything after your investigation? Well, after our investigation, we did what we could at the time with the uh, resources, electronic resources that we had. Which was what? Um, and that, this is now the, um, the DVR. Uh -huh. So the DVR was online again and the cameras was um, online. Um, the only thing that we could have done at the time was, which is in our report, our recommendations and um, the quotations that we've submitted to GPS. Quotation? But did you, in the meantime, fix the system according to that? We could not. We not. could not fix uh, most of it due to um, the recommendations. So we had to to implement that before the system could be fully okay, now I get 100 percent functional. Okay. So from a technical perspective, speaking now, in your opinion, could this be pulled off successfully without help? with the technical aspects of this very complicated system. This whole escape, is it possible without technical assistance? I, I cannot comment on that. You cannot comment? Well, it's easy. I mean, you work for these guys. You are technical in the job that you perform. It's every day. In your opinion, is it possible or not for an individual to escape a maximum security prison with a very 
highly technical and complicated security system as the one that's installed here without being assisted with those technical aspects of exactly how this system works. I can't, I can't comment on that. Okay, you, can't, you don't know or don't you don't know. want to say? I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. You don't know. Okay. Um, so you also, uh, just to be clear then, um, sorry to belabor the point now, um, you don't think it's possible that someone with the necessary technical expertise in exactly how this system functions, where to switch what off and on, or what, whatever the case may be, uh, from your company, because I don't think that uh, employees that's uh, trained in correctional management would necessarily possess the skill set to know exactly what's going on here. Uh, someone from your company, which has the skills, assisted Mr. Bester and his accomplices that assist the team in getting away. Or do you think that's not in the realm of possibility over here? Um, as mentioned earlier, it seems to, or all evidence seems to suggest that, but once again, all assumptions and speculations. Then my very last question, um, just uh, from your own perspective, why did it take so long? to investigate everything that perspired on that specific day? So if from, from, from a technical point of view, in terms of the system failures, and the recommendations, and uh, all of a sudden, as uh, Honorable Swart mentioned, now, you know, polygraph tests and interviews with a whole variety of people, um, since obviously there was proof that you know something is amiss over here, but it was done a week ago or two weeks ago. So it's only recently come to light that this has now moved from suicide to murder. Since the recent media uproar, we've you know conducted our internal investigations, acted with due diligence. Like I've said from the outset, we've been open and transparent. We've provided all the documentation that we are in possession of to the relevant authorities and respective investigating uh, officers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Honorable Engelbrecht. Honorable Breitenbach. Uh, Mr. Williams, I just need to understand this. You're the legal advisor? That's correct, yes. And you have no personal knowledge of any of these incidents? I only have the personal knowledge of what's recently been in the media. Yeah, so you read it just like me. You don't have personal knowledge. That's correct. You're a lawyer. You know what personal knowledge is. That's Sought correct. yourself, touched it yourself, read it yourself. Yes. So, so you don't have that. And, and you, madam, also have no personal knowledge. Um, sorry, um, <laughs> what do you mean by personal knowledge? Did you conduct the investigation? No. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, I did not conduct the investigation. This is uh, reports uh, received from our technicians. So who did, the, who did conduct the investigation? That would be our senior technicians. And why haven't they deposed an affidavit? They do confirm. So the notice we received from the Department of Correctional Services specifically requested that Letitia depose to an affidavit. There are confirmatory affidavits of the technical team that were there on the day confirming. So the person who wasn't there deposes to the affidavit and the people who were there deposed to confirmatories. It's a little odd, don't you think? You're a lawyer. 
that's what was requested from us and that's what we have provided. No, no, that's not the question. The question is, don't you find it a little odd? You're a lawyer. Do you not normally use the best evidence and the best evidence is the person who conducted the investigation? Those individuals' report has been disclosed. Does okay. form part of the, the affidavit and they confirm that they were there on the day. Mm. So would they not have been the best people to be here today to tell us about what they did there, what they found there? Not to say by all accounts, by all reports, possibly, maybe, could be. In fairness to you, neither of you were there. You didn't do the investigation. You're sitting here answering questions that you actually can't answer because you weren't there. I suppose so. And where are these people who did the investigation? I can't answer to that. Yeah, well, perhaps you can, madam. Oh, they, they are in Johannesburg. They're in Johannesburg. Yeah. A small flip away from Cape Town. <laughs> so you could actually bring them here and they could come and give us first-hand evidence. You need to. The best you evidence. Can. You could do that. Okay. And will they be willing to come without being summonsed? They will. Oh, good. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, may I ask that we consider calling those people to get first-hand evidence as opposed to second-hand evidence or third-hand evidence or whatever this is. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, Integratron. Who is the holding company, mother company of Integratron? I can't with certainty answer that. I've only been in their employ since last year, June. The Harding Company, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, Leticia correct me, I think is Bona Ikamva. Is who? Bona Ikamva, if I'm not mistaken. I see. Are they involved at all with uh, SA Fence and Gate? Yes, they are. Or how? It's also the Harding. I think it's the holding company of SF and Sengate as well. I see. And uh, Africa Spec? Spec. So Spec Africa Holdings also falls under that branch. I see. Uh, and these are all companies that uh, are the largest shareholders of one Mr. Jeff Kreilin, correct? That's correct. Mm. And he's somebody who uh, the inimitable Angela Egrizzi had a lot to say about at the Zondo Commission. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Um, also a member of the uh, Progressive Business Forum of the ANC? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, no, well, I can, I can help you there, it is. And quite a big donor. So moving on swiftly. You said something that intrigued me, Mr. Williams. You said, um, The only it, it intrigued me because you're a lawyer and 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 it's a, an odd statement to make. You said the only logical conclusion that you could reach from the video footage of this person going into the room and then the footage the recording function being switched off is that it may have been possible for him to have been involved. Uh, the only logical conclusion is that it may have been possible. I mean, it either is or it isn't. It's not a maybe situation. So you have the footage. Have you seen the footage yourself? Have you watched it? I have seen the footage. Okay, yeah. so you can tell us about it. Uh, did anybody else walk into that room after him? No. Did anybody else walk into the room after him and before the somebody went to restore the function, I presume, from your office? I can't just certainly say. The, the video footage is approximately how long? It's only a, a, a snippet of that specific incident. Well, where's the rest of it? We are not in possession of that. Well, who is in possession of it? The investigating officers. Yes, but, but you were initially in possession of it. So we are only in possession of a snippet of the individual entering the room. Why? Sorry? Why? 
why are we in possession of that? Why are you only in possession of a snippet? So we were, we were instructed that we may not remove the footage because that is the, the possession of G4S as I understand it. Yeah. As such, the respective video footage is with the investigating officer of the Mongolian Correctional Center. So if we want to, we can watch the footage and we can see how many people entered the room between switch off time at 7 o'clock till come back time at 4 o'clock in the morning. I suppose that's possible. Good. Perhaps we should do that. You say that um, you supply qualified technical resources to maintain the security installation for G4S at the Mangoing facility. That's correct. Those are your words, not mine. Not your words. Uh. So. Sorry, sorry, Honorable Breitenbach. Mm. Uh, sir, you are told that you are too close to the mic. You must not speak directly to the mic. It's disturbing sound. My apologies, Honorable Chair. Thank you. So if you're supplying qualified technical resources to maintain the security installation for G4S at the Mangoing facility, um, how did this happen? How, how is it possible that there is no backup system, that this intervention by humans cannot be, is possible and isn't, is not able, why is the system not, not able to be overridden? How, how are you supplying qualified technical resources to maintain the security installation when this is, if somebody walks in and pulls the plug out? I, uh I don't have an answer. I cannot comment on that. Well, the answer is very simple. You're not supplying qualified technical resources to maintain the security installation. Because if you were, you wouldn't be able to walk in and pull the plug out. Because that's what happened, right? Somebody pulled the plug out. And it rebooted and came back online when somebody pulled, pushed the plug back in. I suppose that was one of your suitably qualified technical resources. You plugged it back in. I'm not a suitably qualified technical resource, and even I can push a plug back in. <laughs> so I, I don't know what job it is you're doing, and I don't know how much you're getting paid for it, but it sounds uh, un unbelievably dodgy to me. That somebody can walk into a room, have access to a room of that sensitivity, and whip the plug out the wall, and boom, no more recording. And there's no way to see that. Why, why, does, why is there not a, a function that warns you that the recording has stopped? Why can you not see on the screen, the screen that those people are sitting watching that the recording has stopped? Why isn't there a backup for that? What kind of qualified technical resources are maintaining the security installation? They're just not. You want to comment? No, didn't think so. So all of this happened in uh, May or last year. At least by October, no, well, at least by October, everybody should have known that uh, that Bester was no longer in prison. But you knew immediately after the the incident took place, whether you thought it was an escape or a suicide. You knew that somebody had unplugged the security system, the recording system, because you had a, a movie of it, and you knew who it was. Well, you should have known. You should have a very good idea. Yet you waited a year to, to start investigating it. Take a polygraph. Why? What was the reason for that delay? So th that footage doesn't necessarily show the individual pulling the plugs off. For argument's sake, the individual walks through the door, like you've mentioned, into the control uh -huh. room, and then it's there on the other side. Uh -huh. The footage. And then, sorry, sorry. Excuse me. The, the the footage just depicts the individual standing there. It uh -huh. doesn't necessarily show the individual entering past that point. What, what kind of a camera doesn't show you walking past it? How, do, how does it miss you walking past it? Picks you up standing over there but not coming there. I, I can't answer to that. Uh, you know, there, there's so many things that both of you can't answer. Uh, with respect, and I'm not blaming you because you were sent here by your company uh, to be the four guys for this, uh, 
for this um, inquiry. Um, I really think you need to bring your technical people who did the investigation. And so they can come and answer this. But they can't say, we can't answer that. They must answer it. Because if they can't answer it, then what you need to do is you need to repay um, GCS for every cent they've ever spent on you because you're not doing the job that you're supposed to do. So I think that you should really bring those people so that we can question them. Because in fairness to you, you don't have first-hand knowledge. And so you hear... Uh, looking a little silly, and it's not your fault. So nobody can blame you for that. It's your company. They shouldn't have sent you. They should have sent the real people. And to send their legal advisor and their director, who have no first-hand knowledge of this entire escapade, is quite frankly, um, well, I don't know what it is. I think, I think you should take it up with them. I'd consider other employment if I were you. In any event, so a year later, you um, why, why did you polygraph this particular individual? So we polygraphed this individual off the back of the footage. I see. So a year ago, you knew it was him, but nobody investigated. Nobody asked any questions. He walks into the room. He stands there looking like a banana, and the footage goes off, and nobody makes that connection. And lo and behold, as soon as the incident in the prison is over, the footage comes back on. Nobody investigates. Nobody asks him any questions. For a year, he was in your employ, doing whatever it is that he does. Lord alone knows what it is if I look at this mess. And, uh, and now you investigate a year later because Ground Up did an investigation and says he escaped on your watch. Am I correct? I suppose so, yes. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's really unfair for me to continue questioning you like this. You can't answer and it's not your fault. Um, so we need people, please, who can answer. And uh, Mr. Chair, I would request that we make time to, to talk to the people who did the investigation, and they must come and answer these questions. Um, it's, it's unfair for, for you to sit here like this. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Breedenbach, Honorable Horn. No expropriation now. Yes, thank you. I hope um, you will behave. <laughs> Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, since when have you provided this service to uh, G4S at the Mangaung Centre? Speaking under correction, but I believe it's from 2004. Okay. And uh, did you provide the systems that you now maintain? Um, no, um, um, I speak on a correction, but I don't think so. So the equipment, no, we're just um, maintaining the, the equipment in the system, yes. Okay. And um, picking up where the Honorable Breitenbach referred to uh, the, the fact that you do assist the maintenance of really, well, well it, it said here yes, security installation, but I would think it, it, it refers rather to uh, ensuring that as part of part of the security operations at this prison there is an uninterrupted as far as possible uh, video oversight of what's happening am I am I correct in saying that's ultimately the purpose of, of your service there you can say that Okay. So, in uh, initially, did you see the the interruption on the night of the incident different to the interruptions caused by what you call in your affidavit the power interruptions? Please repeat. So you refer to, uh, refer to your affidavit that in the month of April preceding the event, there was a number of power interruptions at the center. So uh, without now having the hindsight of knowing somebody walked into the control room and unplugged the DVR, 
How did you view the absence of recording at the time? Was it, was it, uh, in, uh, according to your systems, different to uh, an ordinary power interruption? Um, my apologies, but again, this will have to go back to the technical team. Okay. Um, was there previous incidences where the recording stopped for a period? Not that I'm aware of. That um, again for the team, and we can draw logs uh, to confirm that. So, your report of the 12th of May, in which you then make some recommendations about improving the systems, and I think in answer to what the Honorable Nivo Drachen asked at, right at, be at the beginning, say to to, to build in certain alerts for, for future uh, happenings. If this was the first incident of that, this nature, why did it necessitate this type of um, recommendation? My apologies, but again, I will have to revert. So on whose initiative was this report drafted? This was the, um, the based on the, the investigation the technicians did. So that's why we had to compile the report and submit it to G3. Okay. So this footage of the control room, why was that kept for longer than all other footage at the center. I can't answer to that. So, uh, Ms. Pedro, you're looking at me like um, I'm making no sense, but we've heard all day long that all footage are wiped out after two weeks of every camera at that institution. Um, I cannot um, respond to that. Uh, all I can say that the footage is the property of Chief is, um, and whether they still have the footage, I cannot comment on that. So when were you told not to wipe it out? I was not told not to wipe it out. Well, your company, so your representatives. <laughs> you can't say. Um, So in terms of the paragraph 7 time frame, you claim that um, only on the 27th of March was this, this discussion with Mr. Zander Snyder of G4S. And there it transpired that the cables had been unplugged. So once again, in terms of your report then, of the 12th of May 2022, how could you have then known that the cables was unplugged and that some sort of alert is now necessary to be built into the system? So paragraph um, seven, there is a technical explanation for that, and I will highlight that as well um, for the team to give a proper response on that one. Or under no, but this is not a, a, a technical uh, a question that needs a technical answer. On the one hand, you say, just after the incident on the 12th of May, you, you on your own initiative, did an investigation, and you you advised the client, you even quoted, I don't know whether it was unsolicited, that this system must now be improved to include an alert that the type of eventuality that leads to a, a stop in the recording uh, should, 
should be at, there should be a, at least an alert in the system to when that happens again. How could you uh, have deduced that this was the the cause of the lack of a recording if you only on the 27th of March heard that this was what actually happened? I, um, at this time, cannot respond to that. Sorry. Sure. I think uh, as, I don't know whether it is, Chair, because we're now past six, but, I mean, the response is that has dried up. Um, I, um, yeah, I'll then also wait for the technical team to ask those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Swart, Honorable Chancho. I suggest that you pause there for the day. Colleagues, before we adjourn a few issues, um, one, I will ask the committee secretary to read the documents or information that was asked during the course of the day that needs to be provided to the committee. I think certain members asked for certain information to be given in writing. Uh, just to remind everybody the information that is required, uh, I will ask him to take us through that. Yes, uh, Chair, from G4S, we've got uh, records of visitors to Mr. Bester. More information regarding uh, the person who was moved out of cell 35. When did he apply to move out and the reasons given? And then there was one about uh, how many... Uh, there was one about uh, relatives of officials uh, employed by DCS or working at the Mangam Correctional Center. And then there was... Uh, Mm. And then there was um, details on transfers and uh, I'm struggling to read this in writing. Um, oh, I think it's transfers and dismissals related to, to this matter. And then uh, we also wanted uh, all programs uh, offered at the centre and the contractors involved. Yeah, that is what we that I, we managed to capture for G4S. The details of contractors at the centre and the nature of, nature of services that they are rendering. Before you move from, from here. Uh, I we're concluding, but there's a very important reference to an affidavit in this affidavit, and I wondered where that could be. And this is the affidavit in paragraph 12 by Vikas van Tonda, because that seems to be a very critical one, whether you've got it or whether we can ask G4S, and it is provided here. It's a, it's a very important affidavit. Would that be remiss of me to ask for that as well, Chair? Can you repeat your... It's the affidavit of Mr. Vickers van Tonda, who was the senior technician and on-site maintenance manager. He resigned, but at the time of the incident, he 
provided a sworn affidavit to G4S for their records. This was provided to Rudy Matia, who presumably is the G4S investigator. Maybe we can try to get that affidavit if it is available from G4S or if it, if it is available. I don't know. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, and two, two more requests. I think it's uh, Dr. Nandipas' uh, record, visiting records to, to the centre. And then there was one about uh, the duration of Mr. Bester's studies at uh, Hazard Damelino. Yes. Honourable um, Yako. Sorry, Chair, I'm just a little confused with the process that we're on now. Are we then um, asking any other questions we would have wanted to ask so that he can note that if we want documentation on certain things? Or are we concluding now on what we've already discussed? Because tomorrow is another, is another day for us to actually have more questions posed to G4S and other entities. I just want to have clarity. Are we going to keep adding to what is on that list? Or tomorrow are we carrying on? with the new day, having new questions to ask? No, we are making a summary of documents that were requested today. Yes. Is that all? Yeah. Uh, any addition, members? Not something that we're going to ask tomorrow. The issues that you asked today that were not captured by the Secretary? Uh, let's start uh, with Honorable Newport, and I'll come to you. Sorry, Chair, maybe I didn't catch that, but the integrator, integrators, the, the recommendations that they made in their report to G4S, I would like to see the recommendations made, please. I don't know if it was mentioned, but yeah. Okay. Um, Honorable Ramulube. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for correctly pronouncing my surname. Uh, I'm having I'm having difficulties with people referring me to Ramulube. Uh, it's Ramulube. Chair, I wanted to say a similar thing from Honorable Velma, but the second one, Chair, on what would have noted um, the request for G4S. Uh, part of my follow-up. Uh, that I wanted to make was on the basis of the image that, that was moved from cell 35 on the actual day that Bester was put in. The name of the inmate is Mukulu Sibatan <clears throat> and was actually moved on the, on the 31st, on the 30th March 2022, and he was quite unhappy with that move, removal from the cell to a point that he cancelled um, he was angry. He cancelled his own safety because if he went in on, on the basis of safety, he cancelled it and he was moved to Port Phillip. If G4S can confirm all of this for us on the basis of that report. Thank you. Okay. Um, Honorable Mwana. Chair, the important learning program of Mr. Pester from the beginning to the end, a record on that. But you did not ask, did you ask that? We did. We did. Well, I don't know, did. I did as well. Okay. It was only myself alone. I did numbers when I did that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> that one? <laughs> did, did you get that? Okay. Honorable Maseko Chele. I, I, I did uh, give some names of those uh, officials with the surnames that I could not pronounce. I said, Chair, those people were uh, there before the, 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 the day of the incident. And we don't have, we don't get their report. We don't hear exactly what do they know before, because from the look of the things, this was planned, these, uh, the, the occurrences happened even before the day. So maybe if they are from their report, we can also hear a little bit of exactly what did they notice? Because they, they are the manager, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a manager for security, operation security, am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, 
which is uh, Ida. No, Ida is a supervisor. Security okay. Supervisor. There's a manager there. There's also somebody for security something, operations. Is that Ida? No, Ida is yeah, the can you, can okay, you speak to Okay, but the those mic? names, she, 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 I think he, he got me. So if we can get those reports or let them tell us what is it that they know. It can't be one person who came to work on that day and he is the one who is also responsible. So, so the, I think I'm done, Che. He, he understood me, the report of those managers, the ones that I mentioned their names. Did you get that? Okay. No, I think we are done. I think we are done. Tomorrow we are starting at half past nine. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a good suggestion. Maybe we just start at nine. Yes, let's start at nine. We are starting with chicks. I, I, I think we are done here with the proviso that was uh, made, in fact, the request that was made by Honorable Pretenbach, supported by Honorable Horn, maybe we'll take it out of this meeting as to what we do with that. Uh, maybe we might need to recall the company again, but that will be discussed. So tomorrow we're starting with jigs, followed by SAPS, followed by DCS. Hmm? Agreed, Chair. Chicks. No. And then, if members would want to recall any company, uh, we will discuss it. Yeah. Uh, the, the meeting is adjourned for, to, for today.